This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Gordon Mackenzie. Scaramouche A Romance of the French Revolution by Raphael Sabatini. Book One, Chapter One The Republican. He was born with a gift of laughter, and a sense that the world was mad, and that was all his patrimony. His very paternity was obscure, although the village of Gavriac had long since dispelled the cloud of mystery that hung about it. Those simple Brittany folk were not so simple as to be deceived by the pretended relationship which did not even possess the virtue of originality. When a nobleman, for no apparent reason, announces himself the godfather of an infant fetched no man knew whence, and thereafter cares for the lad's rearing and education, the most unsophisticated of country folk perfectly understand the situation. And so the good people of Gavriac permitted themselves no illusions on the score of the real relationship between André Louis Moreau, as the lad had been named, and Quintin de Quercadio, Lord of Gavriac, who dwelt in the big grey house that dominated from its eminence the village clustering below. André Louis had learnt his letters at the village school, lodged the while with old Rabouillet, the attorney, who in the capacity of fiscal intendant looked after the affairs of Monsieur de Quercadio. Thereafter, at the age of fifteen, he had been packed off to Paris, to the Lycée of Louis le Grand, to study the law which he was now returned to practice in conjunction with Rabouillet. All this at the charges of his godfather, Monsieur de Quercadio, who, by placing him once more under the tutelage of Rabouillet, would seem thereby quite clearly to be making provision for his future. André Louis, on his side, had made the most of his opportunities. You behold him at the age of four and twenty, stuffed with learning enough to produce an intellectual indigestion in any ordinary mind. Out of his zestful study of man, from Thucydides to the Encyclopedists, from Seneca to Rousseau, he had confirmed into an unassailable conviction his earliest conscious impressions of the general insanity of his own species. Nor can I discover that anything in his eventful life ever afterwards caused him to waver in that opinion. In body he was a slight wisp of a fellow, scarcely above middle height, with a lean, astute countenance, prominent of nose and cheekbones, and with lank black hair that reached almost to his shoulders. His mouth was long, thin-lipped, and humorous. He was only just redeemed from ugliness by the splendor of a pair of ever-questing, luminous eyes, so dark as to be almost black. Of the whimsical quality of his mind, and his rare gift of graceful expression, his writings, unfortunately but too scanty, and particularly his confessions, afford us very ample evidence. Of his gift of oratory, he was hardly conscious yet, although he had already achieved a certain fame for it, in the literary chamber of Rennes, one of those clubs by now ubiquitous in the land, in which the intellectual youth of France foregathered to study and discuss the new philosophies that were permeating social life. But the fame he had acquired there was hardly enviable. He was too impish, too caustic, too much disposed, so thought his colleagues, to ridicule their sublime theories for the regeneration of mankind. Himself, he protested that he merely held them up to the mirror of truth, and that it was not his fault if when reflected there they looked ridiculous. All that he achieved by this was to exasperate, 
and his expulsion from a society grown mistrustful of him must already have followed, but for his friend, Philippe de Villemorin, a divinity student of Rennes, who himself was one of the most popular members of the literary chamber. Coming to Gavriac on a November morning, laden with news of the political storms which were then gathering over France, Philippe found in that sleepy Breton village matter to quicken his already lively indignation. A peasant of Gavriac, named Maybe, had been shot dead that morning in the woods of Moupon across the river by a gamekeeper of the Marquis de la Tour d'Azir. The unfortunate fellow had been caught in the act of taking a pheasant from a snare, and the gamekeeper had acted under explicit orders from his master. Infuriated by an act of tyranny so absolute and merciless, M. de Villemarin proposed to lay the matter before M. de Kercadio. Mabi was a vassal of Gavriac, and Villemarin hoped to move the lord of Gavriac to demand at least some measure of reparation for the widow and the three orphans which that brutal deed had made. But because Andrew Louis was Philippe's dearest friend, indeed his almost brother, the young seminarist sought him out in the first instance. He found him at breakfast, alone in the long, low-ceilinged, white-panelled dining-room at Rabouillet's, the only home that Andrew Louis had ever known, and after embracing him, deafened him with his denunciation of Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir. I have heard of it already, said André Louis. You speak as if the thing had not surprised you, his friend reproached him. Nothing beastly can surprise me when done by a beast, and La Tour d'Azir is a beast, as all the world knows. The more fool Mabby for stealing his pheasants, he should have stolen somebody else's. Is that all you have to say about it? What more is there to say? I've a practical mind, I hope. What more there is to say, I propose to say to your godfather, Monsieur de Kercadio. I shall appeal to him for justice. Against Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir? André Louis raised his eyebrows. Why not? My dear ingenious Philippe, dog doesn't eat dog. You are unjust to your godfather. He is a humane man. Oh, as humane as you please. But this isn't a question of humanity. It's a question of game laws. Monsieur de Villemarin tossed his long arms to heaven in disgust. He was a tall, slender young gentleman, a year or two younger than André Louis. He was very soberly dressed in black, as became a seminarist with white bands at his wrists and throat and silver buckles to his shoes. His neatly clubbed brown hair was innocent of powder. "'You talk like a lawyer!' he exploded. "'Naturally. But don't waste anger on me on that account. Tell me what you want me to do. I want you to come to Monsieur de Kercadio with me, and to use your influence to obtain justice.' I suppose I am asking too much. My dear Philippe, I exist to serve you. I warn you that it is a futile quest. But give me leave to finish my breakfast, and I am at your orders. Monsieur de Villemarin dropped into a winged armchair by the well-swept hearth, on which a piled-up fire of pine logs was burning cheerily and whilst he waited now he gave his friend the latest news of the events in Rennes. Young, ardent, enthusiastic, and inspired by utopian ideals, he passionately denounced the rebellious attitude of the privileged. André Louis, already fully aware of the trend of feeling in the ranks of an order in whose deliberations he took part as the representative of a nobleman, was not at all surprised by what he heard. Monsieur de Villemarin 
found it exasperating that his friend should apparently decline to share his own indignation. "'Don't you see what it means?' he cried. "'The nobles, by disobeying the king, are striking at the very foundations of the throne. Don't they perceive that their existence depends upon it, that if the throne falls over it is they who stand nearest to it who will be crushed? Don't they see that?' Evidently not. They are just governing classes, and I never heard of governing classes that had eyes for anything but their own profit. That is our grievance. That is what we are going to change. You are going to abolish governing classes? An interesting experiment. I believe it was the original plan of creation, and it might have succeeded but for Cain. "'What we are going to do,' said M. de Villemarin, curbing his exasperation, "'is to transfer the government to other hands.' "'And you think that will make a difference?' "'I know it will. "'Ah, I take it that, being now in minor orders, "'you already possess the confidence of the Almighty. "'He will have confided to you his intention of changing the pattern of mankind.' Ville de Morin's fine, ascetic face grew overcast. "'You are profane, André,' he reproved his friend. "'I assure you that I am quite serious. "'To do what you imply would require nothing short of divine intervention. "'You must change man, not systems. "'Can you and our vaporing friends of the literary chamber of Rennes or any other learned society of France, devise a system of government that has never yet been tried? Surely not. And can they say of any system tried that it proved other than a failure in the end? My dear Philippe, the future is to be read with certainty only in the past. Abactu ad posse vale consecutio. Man never changes. He is always greedy always acquisitive, always vile. I am speaking of man in the bowl. Do you pretend that it is impossible to ameliorate the lot of the people? Monsieur de Villemarin challenged him. When you say the people, you mean, of course, the populace. Will you abolish it? That is the only way to ameliorate its lot. For as long as it remains populous, its lot will be damnation. You argue, of course, for the side that employs you. That is natural, I suppose. M. de Villemarin spoke between sorrow and indignation. On the contrary, I seek to argue with absolute detachment. Let us test these ideas of yours. To what form of government do you aspire? A republic, it is to be inferred from what you have said. Well, you have it already. France, in reality, is a republic today. Philippe stared at him. You are being paradoxical, I think. What of the king? The king? All the world knows there has been no king in France since Louis the Fourteenth. There is an obese gentleman at Versailles who wears the crown, but the very news you bring shows for how little he really counts. It is the nobles and clergy who sit in the high places, with the people of France harnessed under their feet, who are the real rulers. That is why I say that France is a republic. She is a republic built on the best pattern, the Roman pattern. Then, as now, there were great patrician families living in luxury, preserving for themselves power and wealth, and whatever else is accounted worth possessing. And there was the populace, crushed and groaning, sweating, bleeding, starving, and perishing in the Roman kennels. That was a republic, the mightiest we have seen. Philippe strove with his impatience. At least you will admit, you, you have, in fact, admitted it, that we could not be worse governed than we are. That is not the point. The point is... Should we be better governed if we replaced the present ruling class by another? 
without some guarantee of that, I should be the last to lift a finger to effect a change. And what guarantees can you give? What is the class that aims at government? I will tell you. The bourgeoisie. What? That startles you, eh? Truth is so often disconcerting. You hadn't thought of it? Well, think of it now. Look well into this Nantes manifesto. Who are the authors of it? I can tell you who it was constrained the municipality of Nantes to send it to the king. Some ten thousand workmen, shipwrights, weavers, laborers, and artisans of every kind. Stimulated to it, driven to it, by their employers, the wealthy traders and shipowners of that city, Andre Louis replied. I have a habit of observing things at close quarters, which is why our colleagues at the literary chamber dislike me so cordially in debate. Where I delve, they but skim, behind those laborers and artisans of Nantes, counseling them, urging on these poor, stupid, ignorant toilers to shed their blood in pursuit of the will of the wisp of freedom, are the sail-makers, the spinners, the ship-owners, and the slave-traders. The slave-traders. The slave-traders. The men who live and grow rich by a traffic in human flesh and blood in the colonies are conducting at home a campaign in the sacred name of liberty. Don't you see that the whole movement is a movement of hucksters and traders and peddling vassals swollen by wealth into envy of the power that lies in birth alone? The money-changers in Paris who hold the bonds in the national debt, seeing the parlous financial condition of the state, tremble at the thought that it may lie in the power of a single man to cancel the debt by bankruptcy. To secure themselves they are burrowing underground, to overthrow a state and build upon its ruins a new one in which they shall be the masters. And to accomplish this, they inflame the people. Already in Dauphiny we have seen blood run like water, the blood of the populace. Always the blood of the populace. Now in Brittany we may see the like. And if in the end the new ideas prevail, if the seigneurial rule is overthrown, what then? You will have exchanged an aristocracy for a plutocracy. Is that worth while? Do you think that under money-changers and slave-traders and men who have waxed rich in other ways by the innoble arts of buying and selling, the lot of the people will be any better than under their priests and nobles? Has it ever occurred to you, Philippe, what it is that makes the rule of the nobles so intolerable? Acquisitiveness. Acquisitiveness is the curse of mankind. And shall you expect less acquisitiveness in men who have built themselves up by acquisitiveness? Oh, I am ready to admit that the present government is execrable unjust, tyrannical, what you will. But I beg you to look ahead, and to see that the government for which it is aimed at exchanging it may be infinitely worse. Philippe sat thoughtful a moment. Then he returned to the attack. You do not speak of the abuses, the horrible, intolerable abuses of power under which we labor at present. Where there is power there will always be the abuse of it. Not if the tenure of power is dependent upon its equitable administration. The tenure of power is power. We cannot dictate to those who hold it. The people can. The people in its might. Again I ask you, when you say the people, do you mean the populace? You do. What power can the populace wield? It can run wild. It can burn and slay for a time. But enduring power it cannot wield, because power 
demands qualities which the populace does not possess, or it would not be populace. The inevitable tragic corollary of civilization is populace. For the rest, abuses can be corrected by equity, and equity, if it is not found in the enlightened, is not to be found at all. Monsieur Necker is set about correcting abuses and limiting privileges. That is decided. To that end, the states-general are to assemble. And a promising beginning we have made in Brittany, as heaven hears me, cried Philippe. Pooh, that is nothing. Naturally, the nobles will not yield without a struggle. It is a futile and ridiculous struggle. But then, it is human nature, I suppose, to be futile and ridiculous. Monsieur de Villemarin became witheringly sarcastic. Probably you will also qualify the shooting of maybe as futile and ridiculous. I should even be prepared to hear you argue in defense of the Marquis de la Tour d'Azir that his gamekeeper was merciful in shooting Mabby, since the alternative would have been a life sentence to the galleys. André Louis drank the remainder of his chocolate, set down his cup, and pushed back his chair, his breakfast done. I confess that I have not your big charity, my dear Philippe. I am touched by Mabby's fate, but, having conquered the shock of this news to my emotions, I do not forget that, after all, Mabby was thieving when he met his death. M. de Vermarin heaved himself up in his indignation. That is the point of view to be expected in one who is the assistant fiscal intendant of a nobleman, and the delegate of a nobleman to the states of Brittany. Philippe, is that just? You are angry with me, he cried in real solicitude. I am hurt, Vilmarin admitted. I am deeply hurt by your attitude and I am not alone in resenting your reactionary tendencies. Do you know that the literary chamber is seriously considering your expulsion?" André Louis shrugged. That neither surprises nor troubles me. Vilmarin swept on passionately. Sometimes I think that you have no heart. With you it is always the law, never equity. It occurs to me, André, and I was mistaken in coming to you. You are not likely to be of assistance to me in my interview with Monsieur de Kercadio. He took up his hat, clearly with the intention of departing. André Louis sprang up and caught him by the arm. I vow, said he, that this is the last time ever I shall consent to talk law or politics with you, Philippe. I love you too well to quarrel with you over other men's affairs. But I make them my own, Philippe insisted vehemently. Of course you do, and I love you for it. It is right that you should. You are to be a priest, and everybody's business is a priest's business. Whereas, I am a lawyer, the fiscal intendant of a nobleman, as you say, and a lawyer's business is the business of his client. That is the difference between us. Nevertheless, you are not going to shake me off. But I tell you frankly, now that I come to think of it, that I should prefer you did not see M. de Kercadiot with me. Your duty to your client cannot be a help to me. His wrath had passed, but his determination remained firm, based upon the reason he gave. Very well, said André Louis. It shall be as you please, but nothing shall prevent me at least from walking you as far as the chateau, and waiting for you while you make your appeal to M. de Kercadio. And so they left the house good friends, for the sweetness of M. de Villemarin's nature did not admit of rancor, and together they took their way up the steep main street of Gavriac. End of chapter 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit 
LibriVox.org. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Scaramouche. Book One. Chapter Two. The Aristocrat. The sleepy village of Gavriac, a half league removed from the main road to Rennes, and therefore undisturbed by the world's traffic, lay in a curve of the river Mieux, at the foot and straggling halfway up the slope of the shallow hill that was crowned by the squat manor. By the time Gavriac had paid tribute to its seigneur, partly in money and partly in service, tithes to the church and imposts to the king, it was hard put to it to keep body and soul together with what remained. Yet, hard as conditions were in Gavriac, they were not so hard as in many other parts of France, not half so hard, for instance, as with the wretched feudatories of the great lord of La Tour d'Azir, whose vast possessions were at one point separated from this little village by the waters of the Mieux. The Chateau de Gavriac owed such seigneurial airs as might be claimed for it to its dominant position above the village, rather than to any feature of its own. Built of granite, like all the rest of Gavriac, though mellowed by some three centuries of existence, it was a squat, flat-fronted edifice of two stories, each lighted by four windows with external wooden shutters and flanked at either end by two square towers or pavilions under extinguisher roofs. Standing well back in a garden, denuded now but very pleasant in summer, and immediately fronted by a fine sweep of balustraded terrace, it looked what indeed it was, and always had been, the residence of unpretentious folk who found more interest in husbandry than in adventure. Quintin de Kercadio, Lord of Gavriac, Seigneur de Gavriac, was all the vague title that he bore, as his forefathers had borne before him, derived no man knew whence or how, confirmed the impression that his house conveyed. Rude as the granite itself, he had never sought the experience of courts, had not even taken service in the armies of his king. He left it to his younger brother, Etienne, to represent the family in those exalted spheres. His own interests from earlier years had been centred in his woods and pastures. He hunted, and he cultivated his acres, and superficially he appeared to be little better than any of his rustic metayers. He kept no state, or at least no state commensurate with his position or with the tastes of his niece, Aline de Kercadio. Aline having spent some two years in the court atmosphere of Versailles under the aegis of her uncle Etienne, had ideas very different from those of her uncle Quintin of what was befitting seigneurial dignity. But though this only child of a third Kercadio had exercised, ever since she was left an orphan at the early age of four, a tyrannical rule over the lord of Gavriac, who had been father and mother to her, she had never yet succeeded in beating down his stubbornness on that score. She did not yet despair, persistence being a dominant note in her character, although she had been assiduously and fruitlessly at work since her return from the great world of Versailles some three months ago. She was walking on the terrace when André Louis and Monsieur de Villemarin arrived. Her slight body was wrapped against the chill air in a white pelisse. Her head was encased in a close-fitting bonnet edged with white fur. It was caught tight in a knot of pale blue ribbon under the right of her chin. On the left a long ringlet of corn-colored hair had been permitted to escape. The keen air had whipped so much of her cheeks as was presented to it, and seemed to have added sparkle to eyes that were of the darkest blue. André Louis and Monsieur de Vermarin had been known to her from childhood. The three had been playmates once, and André Louis, in view of his spiritual relationship with her uncle, she called her cousin. 
The cousinly relations had persisted between these two long after Philippe de Villemarin had outgrown the earlier intimacy and had become to her Monsieur de Villemarin. She waved her hand to them in greeting as they advanced, and stood, an entrancing picture, and fully conscious of it, to await them at the end of the terrace nearest the short avenue by which they approached. "'If you come to see Monsieur, my uncle, you come inopportunely, Messieurs,' she told them. A certain feverishness in her air. He is closely, oh, so very closely, engaged." "'We will wait, mademoiselle,' said Monsieur de Villemarin, bowing gallantly over the hand she extended to him. "'Indeed. Who would haste to the uncle that may tarry a moment with the niece?' "'Monsieur l'abbé,' she teased him, "'when you are in orders I shall take you for my confessor. You have so ready and sympathetic an understanding.' "'But no curiosity,' said André Louis. You haven't thought of that. I wonder what you mean, cousin André. Well, you may, laughed Philippe, for no one ever knows. And then his glance straying across the terrace settled upon a carriage that was drawn up before the door of the chateau. It was a vehicle such as was often to be seen in the streets of a great city, but rarely in the country. It was a beautifully sprung two-horse cabriolet of walnut, with a varnish upon it like a sheet of glass, and little pastoral scenes exquisitely painted on the panels of the door. It was built to carry two persons, with a box in front for the coachman, and a stand behind for the footman. This stand was empty, but the footman paced before the door and as he emerged now from behind the vehicle into the range of Monsieur de Villemarin's vision, he displayed the resplendent blue and gold livery of the Marquis de la Tour d'Azir. Why, he exclaimed, is it Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir who is with your uncle? It is, Monsieur, said she, a world of mystery in voice and eyes, of which Monsieur de Villemarin observed nothing. Ah, pardon, he bowed low, hat in hand. Serviteur, mademoiselle. And he turned to depart towards the house. Shall I come with you, Philippe? André Louis called after him. It would be ungallant to assume that you would prefer it, said Monsieur de Villemarin, with a glance at mademoiselle. Nor do I think it would serve. If you will wait. Monsieur de Villemarin strode off. Mademoiselle, after a moment's blank pause, laughed ripplingly. Now, where is he going in such a hurry? To see Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir, as well as your uncle, I should say. But he cannot. They cannot see him. Did I not say that they are very closely engaged? You don't ask me why, André. There was an arch mysteriousness about her a latent something that may have been elation, or amusement, or perhaps both. André Louis could not determine it. Since obviously you are all eagerness to tell, why should I ask? quoth he. If you are caustic, I shall not tell you even if you ask. Oh, yes, I will. It will teach you to treat me with the respect that is my due. I hope I shall never fail in that less than ever, when you learn that I am very closely concerned in the visit of Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir. I am the object of this visit." And she looked at him with sparkling eyes and lips parted in laughter. The rest you would seem to imply is obvious. But I am adult, if you please, for it is not obvious to me. Why? Stupid! He comes to ask my hand in marriage. Good God! said André Louis, and stared at her, chap fallen. She drew back from him a little with a frown and an upward tilt of her chin. It surprises you? It disgusts me, said he bluntly. In fact, I don't believe it. 
you are amusing yourself with me. For a moment she put aside her visible annoyance to remove his doubts. I am quite serious, monsieur. There came a formal letter to my uncle this morning from Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir, announcing the visit and its object. I will not say that it did not surprise us a little. Oh, I see, cried André Louis, in relief. I understand. For a moment I had almost feared. He broke off, looked at her, and shrugged. Why do you stop? You had almost feared that Versailles had been wasted upon me, that I should permit the courtship of me to be conducted like that of any village wench. It was stupid of you. I am being sought in proper form at my uncle's hands. Is his consent, then, all that matters according to Versailles? What else? There is your own. She laughed. I am a dutiful niece, when it suits me. And will it suit you to be dutiful if your uncle accepts this monstrous proposal? Monstrous? she bridled. And why monstrous, if you please? For a score of reasons, he answered irritably. Give me one, she challenged him. He is twice your age. Hardly so much, said she. He is forty-five at least. But he looks no more than thirty. He is very handsome. So much you will admit. Nor will you deny that he is very wealthy and very powerful. The greatest nobleman in Brittany. He will make me a great lady. God made you that, Aline. Hmm, <laughs> come, that's better. Sometimes you can almost be polite. And she moved along the terrace, André Louis pacing beside her. I can be more than that, to show reason why you should not let this beast befoul the beautiful thing that God has made. She frowned, and her lips tightened. You are speaking of my future husband, she reproved him. His lips tightened, too. His pale face grew paler. And is it so? It is settled, then? Your uncle is to agree? You are to be sold thus, lovelessly, into bondage to a man you do not know? I had dreamed of better things for you, Aline. Better than to be Marquise de la Tour d'Azir? He made a gesture of exasperation. Are men and women nothing more than names? Do the souls of them count for nothing? Is there no joy in life, no happiness, that wealth and pleasure and empty high-sounding titles are to be its only aims? I had set you high. So high, Aline, a thing scarce earthly. There is joy in your heart, intelligence in your mind. And, as I thought, the vision that pierces husks and shams to claim the core of reality for its own. Yet you will surrender all for a parcel of make-believe. You will sell your soul and your body to be Marquise de la Tour d'Azir. You are indelicate, said she, and though she frowned, her eyes laughed. And you go headlong to conclusions. My uncle will not consent to more than to allow my consent to be sought. We understand each other, my uncle and I. I am not to be bartered like a turnip. He stood still to face her, his eyes glowing, a flush creeping into his pale cheeks. You have been torturing me to amuse yourself, he cried. Ah, well... I will forgive you out of my relief. Again you go too fast? Cousin André, I have permitted my uncle to consent that Monsieur le Marquis shall make his court to me. I like the look of the gentleman. I am flattered by his preference when I consider his eminence. It is an eminence that I may find it desirable to share. Monsieur le Marquis does not look as if he were a dullard. 
It should be interesting to be wooed by him. It may be more interesting still to marry him, and I think, when all is considered, that I shall probably, very probably, decide to do so. He looked at her, looked at the sweet, challenging loveliness of that childlike face so tightly framed in the oval of white fur, and all the life seemed to go out of his own countenance. "'God help you, Aline,' he groaned. She stamped her foot. He was really very exasperating, and something presumptuous, too, she thought. "'You are insolent, monsieur.' "'It is never insolent to pray, Aline, and I did no more than pray, as I shall continue to do. "'You'll need my prayers, I think.' "'You are insufferable.' She was growing angry, as he saw by the deepening frown, the heightened color. That is because I suffer. Oh, a lean little cousin, think well of what you do. Think well of the realities you will be bartering for these shams, the realities that you will never know, because these cursed shams will block your way to them. When M. de la Tour d'Azir comes to make his court, study him well, consult your fine instincts, leave your own noble nature free to judge this animal by its intuitions. Consider that I consider, monsieur, that you presume upon the kindness I have always shown you. You abuse the position of toleration in which you stand. Who are you? What are you, that you should have the insolence to take this tone with me? He bowed, instantly his cold detached self again, and resumed the mockery that was his natural habit. My congratulations, mademoiselle, upon the readiness with which you begin to adapt yourself to the great role you are to play. Do you adapt yourself also, monsieur? She retorted angrily, and turned her shoulder to him. To be as the dust beneath the haughty feet of Madame la Marquise. I hope I shall know my place in future. The phrase arrested her. She turned to him again, and he perceived that her eyes were shining now suspiciously. In an instant the mockery in him was quenched in contrition. Lord, what a beast I am, Aline, he cried as he advanced. Forgive me if you can. Almost had she turned to sue forgiveness from him, but his contrition removed the need. I'll try, said she, provided that you undertake not to offend again. But I shall, said he. I am like that. I will fight to save you from yourself, if need be, whether you forgive me or not. They were standing so, confronting each other a little breathlessly, a little defiantly, when the others issued from the porch. First came the Marquis of La Tour d'Azir, Count of Souls, Knight of the Orders of the Holy Ghost and St. Louis, and Brigadier in the armies of the King. He was a tall, graceful man, upright and soldierly of carriage, with his head disdainfully set upon his shoulders. He was magnificently dressed in a full-skirted coat of mulberry velvet that was laced with gold. His waistcoat, of velvet too, was of a golden apricot color. His breeches and stockings were of black silk, and his lacquered, red-heeled shoes were buckled in diamonds. His powdered hair was tied behind in a broad ribbon of watered silk. He carried a little three-cornered hat under his arm, and a gold-hilted slender dress-sword hung at his side. Considering him now in complete detachment, observing the magnificence of him, the elegance of his movements, the great air, blending in so extraordinary a manner disdain and graciousness, André-Louis 
trembled for Aline. Here was a practised, irresistible wooer, whose bonne fortune were become a byword, a man who had hitherto been the despair of dowagers with marriageable daughters, and the desolation of husbands with attractive wives. He was immediately followed by Monsieur de Kercadiot, in completest contrast. On legs of the shortest, the lord of Gavriac carried a body that at forty-five was beginning to incline to corpulence, and an enormous head containing an indifferent allotment of intelligence. His countenance was pink and blotchy, liberally branded by the smallpox which had almost extinguished him in youth. In dress he was careless to the point of untidiness, and to this and to the fact that he had never married, disregarding the first duty of a gentleman to provide himself with an heir, he owed the character of a misogynist, attributed to him by the countryside. After M. de Kercadiot came M. de Villemarin, very pale and self-contained, with tight lips and an overcast brow. To meet them there stepped from the carriage a very elegant young gentleman, the Chevalier de Chabrillaine, M. de la Tour d'Azir's cousin, who whilst awaiting his return had watched with considerable interest, his own presence unsuspected, the perambulations of André Louis and Mademoiselle. Perceiving Aline, M. de la Tour d'Azir detached himself from the others, and lengthening his stride came straight across the terrace to her. To André Louis the Marquis inclined his head with that mixture of courtliness and condescension which he used. Socially the young lawyer stood in a curious position. By virtue of the theory of his birth, he ranked neither as noble nor as simple, but stood somewhere between the two classes, and whilst claimed by neither, he was used familiarly by both. Coldly now he returned M. de la Tour d'Azir's greeting, and discreetly removed himself to go and join his friend. The Marquis took the hand that Mademoiselle extended to him, and bowing over it, bore it to his lips. Mademoiselle, he said, looking into the blue depths of her eyes that met his gaze smiling and untroubled. Monsieur your uncle does me the honour to permit that I pay my homage to you. Will you, Mademoiselle, do me the honour to receive me when I come to-morrow. I shall have something of great importance for your ear. Of importance, Monsieur le Marquis? You almost frighten me. But there was no fear on the serene little face in its furred hood. It was not for nothing that she had graduated in the Versailles School of Artificialities. That, said he, is very far from my design. But of importance to yourself, monsieur, or to me? To us both, I hope, he answered her, a world of meaning in his fine, ardent eyes. You wet my curiosity, monsieur, and of course I am a dutiful niece. It follows that I shall be honoured to receive you. Not honoured, mademoiselle. You will confer the honour. Tomorrow at this hour, then, I shall have the felicity to wait upon you. He bowed again, and again he bore her fingers to his lips. What time she curtsied. Thereupon, with no more than this formal breaking of the ice, they parted. She was a little breathless now, a little dazzled by the beauty of the man, his princely air, and the confidence of power he seemed to radiate. Involuntarily, almost, she contrasted him with his critic, the lean and impudent André Louis, in his plain brown coat and steel-buckled shoes, and she felt guilty of an unpardonable offence in having permitted even one word of that presumptuous criticism. Tomorrow, Monsieur le Marquis would come to offer her a great position, a great rank, and already she had derogated from the increase 
of dignity accruing to her from his very intention to translate her to so great an eminence. Not again would she suffer it. Not again would she be so weak and childish as to permit André Louis to utter his ribald comments upon a man by comparison with whom he was no better than a lackey. Thus argued vanity and ambition with her better self, and to her vast annoyance, her better self would not admit entire conviction. Meanwhile, M. de la Tour d'Azir was climbing into his carriage. He had spoken a word of farewell to M. de Kercadio, and he had also had a word for M. de Villemarin, in reply to which M. de Villemarin had bowed in assenting silence. The carriage rolled away, the powdered footman in blue and gold very stiff behind it, M. de la Tour d'Azir bowing to Mademoiselle, who waved to him in answer. Then M. de Villemarin put his arm through that of André Louis, and said to him, Come, André. But you'll stay to dine, both of you, cried the hospitable lord of Gavriac. We'll drink a certain toast, he added, winking an eye that strayed towards Mademoiselle, who was approaching. He had no subtleties, good soul that he was. M. de Villemarin deplored an appointment that prevented him doing himself the honour. He was very stiff and formal. And you, André? I? Oh, I share the appointment, Godfather, he lied. And I have a superstition against toasts. He had no wish to remain. He was angry with Aline for her smiling reception of M. de la Tour d'Azir, and the sordid bargain he saw her set on making. He was suffering from the loss of an illusion. End of chapter 2 This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Scaramouche by Raphael Sabatini Book One Chapter Three The Eloquence of Monsieur de Villemarin As they walked down the hill together, it was now Monsieur de Villemarin who was silent and preoccupied, Andre Louis who was talkative. He had chosen woman as a subject for his present discourse, he claimed, quite unjustifiably, to have discovered woman that morning, and the things he had to say of the sex were unflattering, and occasionally almost gross. M. de Villemarin, having ascertained the subject, did not listen. Singular though it may seem in a young French abbé of his day, M. de Villemarin was not interested in woman. Poor Philippe was in several ways exceptional. Opposite the Breton Arm, the inn and posting-house at the entrance of the village of Gavriac, M. de Villemarin interrupted his companion just as he was soaring to the dizziest heights of caustic invective, and André Louis, restored thereby to actualities, observed the carriage of M. de la Tour d'Azir standing before the door of the hostelry. "'I don't believe you've been listening to me,' said he. Had you been less interested in what you were saying, you might have observed it sooner and spared your breath. The fact is, you disappoint me, André. You seem to have forgotten what we went for. I have an appointment here with Monsieur le Marquis. He desires to hear me further in the matter. Up there at Gavriac I could accomplish nothing. The time was ill-chosen as it happened. But I have hopes of Monsieur le Marquis. Hopes of what? 
that he will make what reparation lies in his power, provide for the widow and the orphans. Why else should he desire to hear me further? Unusual condescension, said André Louis, and quoted, Timio de neos e dona ferentes. Why? asked Philippe. Let us go and discover, unless you consider that I shall be in the way. Into a room on the right, rendered private to Monsieur le Marquis for so long as he should elect to honour it, the young men were ushered by the host. A fire of logs was burning brightly at the room's far end, and by this sat now Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir and his cousin, the Chevalier de Chabrienne. Both rose as Monsieur de Villemarin came in. André Louis, following, paused to close the door. "'You oblige me by your prompt courtesy, Monsieur de Villemarin," said the Marquis, but in a tone so cold as to belie the politeness of his words. "'A chair, I beg.' "'Ah, Moreau,' the note was frigidly interrogative. "'He accompanies you, monsieur?' he asked. "'If you please, monsieur le Marquis.' "'Why not?' Find yourself a seat, Moreau. He spoke over his shoulder as to a lackey. It is good of you, monsieur, said Philippe, to have offered me this opportunity of continuing the subject that took me so fruitlessly as it happens to Gavriac. The Marquis crossed his legs and held out one of his fine hands to the blaze. He replied without troubling to turn to the young man, who was slightly behind him. The goodness of my request we will leave out of question for the moment, said he darkly, and Monsieur de Chabrienne laughed. André Louis thought him easily moved to mirth, and almost envied him the faculty. But I am grateful, Philippe insisted, that you should condescend to hear me plead their cause. The Marquis stared at him over his shoulder. "'Whose cause?' quoth he. "'Why, the cause of the widow and orphans of this unfortunate, Mabby.' The Marquis looked from Villemarin to the Chevalier, and again the Chevalier laughed, slapping his leg this time. "'I think,' said Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir, slowly, "'that we are at cross-purposes.' I asked you to come here because the Chateau de Gavriac was hardly a suitable place in which to carry our discussion further, and because I hesitated to incommode you by suggesting that you should come all the way to Azir. But my object is connected with certain expressions that you let fall up there. It is on the subject of those expressions, monsieur, that I would hear you further if you will honour me." André Louis began to apprehend that there was something sinister in the air. He was a man of quick intuitions, quicker far than those of M. de Villemarin, who evinced no more than a mild surprise. "'I am at a loss, monsieur,' said he. "'To what expressions does monsieur allude?' "'It seems, monsieur that I must refresh your memory." The Marquis crossed his legs and swung sideways on his chair, so that at last he directly faced M. de Villemarin. "'You spoke, monsieur, and however mistaken you may have been, you spoke very eloquently. Too eloquently, almost, it seemed to me, of the infamy of such a deed as the act of summary justice upon this thieving fellow, Mabby, or whatever his name may be. Infamy was the precise word you used. You did not retract that word when I had the honour to inform you that it was by my orders that my gamekeeper Benet proceeded as he did. 
If, said M. de Vilmorin, the deed was infamous, its infamy is not modified by the rank, however exalted, of the person responsible. Rather, it is aggravated. Ah, said M. le Marquis, and drew a gold snuff-box from his pocket. You say, if the deed was infamous, monsieur, am I to understand that you are no longer as convinced as you appear to be of its infamy? Monsieur de Villemarin's fine face wore a look of perplexity. He did not understand the drift of this. It occurs to me, monsieur le marquis, in view of your readiness to assume responsibility, that you must believe justification for the deed which is not apparent to myself. That is better. That is distinctly better. The Marquis took snuff delicately, dusting the fragments from the fine lace at his throat. You realize that with an imperfect understanding of these matters, not being yourself a landowner, you may have rushed to unjustifiable conclusions. That is indeed the case. May it be a warning to you, monsieur, when I tell you that for months past I have been annoyed by similar depredations, you will perhaps understand that it had become necessary to employ a deterrent sufficiently strong to put an end to them. Now that the risk is known, I do not think there will be any more prowling in my coverts, and there is more in it than that, Monsieur de Villemorin. It is not the poaching that annoys me, so much as the contempt for my absolute and inviolable rights. There is, Monsieur, as you cannot fail to have observed, an evil spirit of insubordination in the air, and there is one only way in which to meet it. To tolerate it in however slight a degree, to show leniency however leniently disposed, would entail having recourse to still harsher measures to-morrow. You understand me, I am sure, and you will also, I am sure, appreciate the condescension of what amounts to an explanation from me, where I cannot admit that any explanations were due. If anything, in what I have said is still obscure to you, I refer you to the game laws which your lawyer friend there will expound for you at need. With that the gentleman swung round again to face the fire. It appeared to convey the intimation that the interview was at an end. And yet this was not by any means the intimation that it conveyed to the watchful, puzzled, vaguely uneasy André Louis. It was, thought he, a very curious, a very suspicious oration. It affected to explain with a politeness of terms and a calculated insolence of tone whilst in fact it could only serve to stimulate and goad a man of M. de Villemarin's opinions. And that is precisely what it did. He rose. "'Are there in the world no laws, but game laws?' he demanded, angrily. "'Have you never by any chance heard of the laws of humanity?' The Marquis sighed wearily. What have I to do with the laws of humanity? he wondered. M. de Villemarin looked at him a moment in speechless amazement. Nothing, M. le Marquis. That is, alas, too obvious. I hope you will remember it in the hour when you may wish to appeal to those laws which you now deride. M. de La Tour d'Azir threw back his head sharply, his high-bred face imperious. Now what precisely shall that mean? It is not the first time to-day that you have made use of dark sayings that I could almost believe to veil the presumption of a threat. 
Not a threat, Monsieur le Marquis. A warning. A warning that such deeds as these against God's creatures... Oh, you may sneer, Monsieur, but they are God's creatures, even as you or I, neither more nor less. Deeply though the reflection may wound your pride in his eyes... Of your charity, spare me a sermon, Monsieur l'Abbé. You mock, Monsieur. You laugh. Will you laugh, I wonder, when God presents his reckoning to you for the blood and plunder with which your hands are full? Monsieur! The word, sharp as the crack of a whip, was from Monsieur de Chabrienne, who bounded to his feet. But instantly the Marquis repressed him. Sit down, Chevalier. You are interrupting Monsieur l'Abbé. And I should like to hear him further. He interests me profoundly. In the background André Louis, too, had risen, brought to his feet by alarm by the evil that he saw written on the handsome face of Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir. He approached and touched his friend upon the arm. Better be going, Philippe said he. But M. de Villemarin, caught in the relentless grip of passions long repressed, was being hurried by them recklessly along. "'Oh, monsieur,' said he, "'consider what you are and what you will be. Consider how you and your kind live by abuses, and consider the harvest that abuses must ultimately bring.' "'Revolutionist!' said Monsieur le Marquis contemptuously. You have the effrontery to stand before my face and offer me this stinking cant of your modern so-called intellectuals. Is it cant, Monsieur? Do you think, do you believe in your soul that it is cant, is it cant that the feudal grip is on all things that live, crushing them like grapes in the press to its own profit? Does it not exercise its right upon the waters of the river, the fire that bakes the poor man's bread of grass and barley, on the wind that turns the mill? The peasant cannot take a step upon the road, cross a crazy bridge over a river, by an L of cloth and the village market, without meeting feudal rapacity, without being taxed in feudal dues. Is not that enough, Monsieur le Marquis? Must you also demand his wretched life in payment for the least infringement of your sacred privileges, careless of what widows or orphans you dedicate to woe? will not content you but that your shadow must lie like a curse upon the land. And do you think in your pride that France, this Job among the nations, will suffer it for ever? He paused as if for a reply, but none came. The Marquis considered him strangely silent, a half smile of disdain at the corners of his lips, an ominous hardness in his eyes. Again André Louis tugged at his friend's sleeve. Philippe! Philippe shook him off and plunged on, fanatically. Do you see nothing of the gathering clouds that herald the coming of the storm? You imagine, perhaps, that these states-general summoned by M. Necker and promised for next year are to do nothing but devise fresh means of extortion to liquidate the bankruptcy of the state, you delude yourselves as you shall find. The third estate, which you despise, will prove itself the preponderating force, and it will find a way to make an end of this canker of privilege that is devouring the vitals of this unfortunate country." M. le Marquis shifted in his chair, and spoke at last. "'You have, monsieur,' said he, "'a very dangerous gift of eloquence. 
and it is of yourself rather than of your subject. For, after all, what do you offer me? A rechauffe of the dishes served to out-at-elbow enthusiasts in the provincial literary chambers, compounded of the effusions of your Voltaires and Jean-Jacques and such dirty-fingered scribblers. You have not among all your philosophers one with the wit to understand that we are an order consecrated by antiquity, that for our rights and privileges we have behind us the authority of centuries. Humanity, monsieur, Philippe replied, is more ancient than nobility. Human rights are contemporary with man. The Marquis laughed and shrugged. Hm, that is the answer I might have expected. It has the right note of Kant that distinguishes the philosophers. And then Monsieur de Chabrienne spoke. You go a long way round, he criticized his cousin on a note of impatience. But I am getting there, he was answered. I desired to make quite certain first. Faith, you should have no doubt by now. I have none. The Marquis rose, and turned again to Monsieur de Villemarin, who had understood nothing of that brief exchange. Monsieur l'abbé, said he once more, you have a very dangerous gift of eloquence. I can conceive of men being swayed by it. Had you been born a gentleman, you would not so easily have acquired these false views that you express. M. de Villemorin stared blankly, uncomprehending. Had I been born a gentleman, do you say? quoth he in a slow, bewildered voice. But I was born a gentleman. My race is as old, my blood as good as yours, monsieur. From M. le Marquis there was a slight play of eyebrows, a vague, indulgent smile. His dark, liquid eyes looked squarely into the face of M. de Villemarin. You have been deceived in that, I fear. Deceived? Your sentiments betray the indiscretion of which, madam, your mother must have been guilty. The brutally affronting words were sped beyond recall, and the lips that had uttered them coldly, as if they had been the merest commonplace, remained calm and faintly sneering. A dead silence followed. André Louis's wits were numbed. He stood aghast, all thought suspended in him, what time M. de Villemarin's eyes continued fixed upon M. de La Tour d'Azir's as if searching there for a meaning that eluded him. Quite suddenly he understood the vile affront. The blood leapt to his face, fire blazed in his gentle eyes. A convulsive quiver shook him. Then, with an inarticulate cry, he leaned forward and with his open hand struck M. le Marquis full and hard upon his sneering face. In a flash, M. de Chabrienne was on his feet between the two men. Too late, André Louis had seen the trap. Le Tour d'Azir's words were but as a move in a game of chess, calculated to exasperate his opponent into some such counter-move as this, a counter-move that left him entirely at the other's mercy. M. le Marquis looked down very white, save where M. de Villemarin's fingerprints began slowly to color his face. But he said nothing more. Instead it was M. de Chabrienne who now did the talking, taking up his preconcerted part in this vile game. "'You realize, monsieur, what you have done,' said he coldly to Philippe, "'and you realize, of course, what must inevitably follow.' M. de Villemarin had realized nothing. 
the poor young man had acted upon impulse, upon the instinct of decency and honor, never counting the consequences. But he realized them now at the sinister invitation of Monsieur de Chabrienne, and if he desired to avoid these consequences, it was out of respect for his priestly vocation, which strictly forbade such adjustments of disputes as Monsieur de Chabrienne was clearly thrusting upon him. He drew back. Let one affront wipe out the other, said he, in a dull voice. The balance is still in Monsieur le Marquis's favour. Let that content him. Impossible. The Chevalier's lips came together tightly. Thereafter he was suavity itself, but very firm. A blow has been struck, Monsieur. I think I am correct in saying that such a thing has never happened before to Monsieur le Marquis in all his life. If you felt yourself affronted, you had but to ask the satisfaction due from one gentleman to another. Your action would seem to confirm the assumption that you found so offensive, but it does not on that account render you immune from the consequences. It was, you see, Monsieur de Chabrienne's part to heap coals upon this fire, to make quite sure that their victim should not escape them. I desire no immunity, flashed back the young seminarist, stung by this fresh goad. After all, he was nobly born, and the traditions of his class were strong upon him, stronger far than the seminarist schooling in humility. He owed it to himself, to his honour, to be killed, rather than avoid the consequences of the thing he had done. But he does not wear a sword, messieurs cried André-Louis, aghast. "'That is easily amended. He may have the loan of mine.' "'I mean, messieurs,' André-Louis insisted, between fear for his friend and indignation, "'that it is not his habit to wear a sword, that he has never worn one, that he is untutored in its uses. He is a seminarist, a postulant for holy orders, already half a priest.' and so forbidden from such an engagement as you propose. All that he should have remembered before he struck a blow, said M. de Chabrienne politely. The blow was deliberately provoked, raged André-Louis. Then he recovered himself, though the other's haughty stare had no part in that recovery. Oh, my God, I talk in vain! How is one to argue against a purpose formed? Come away, Philippe, don't you see the trap? Monsieur de Filmorin cut him short and flung him off. Be quiet, André. Monsieur le Marquis is entirely in the right. Monsieur le Marquis is in the right? André Louis let his arms fall helplessly. This man he loved above all other living men was caught in the snare of the world's insanity. He was bearing his breast to the knife for the sake of a vague, distorted sense of the honour due to himself. It was not that he did not see the trap. It was that his honour compelled him to disdain consideration of it. To André Louis, in that moment, he seemed a singularly tragic figure. Noble, perhaps, but very pitiful. End of chapter 3 of Book 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Scaramouche by Raphael Sabatini Book One Chapter Four The Heritage It was Monsieur de Villemarin's desire that the matter should be settled out of hand, and this he was at once objective and subjective, a prey to emotions sadly at conflict with his priestly vocation, 
he was above all in haste to have it done, so that he might resume a frame of mind more proper to it. Also he feared himself a little, by which I mean that his honour feared his nature. The circumstances of his education, and the goal that for some years now he had kept in view, had robbed him of much of that spirited brutality that is the birthright of the male. He had grown timid and gentle as a woman. Aware of it, he feared that once the heat of his passion was spent, he might betray a dishonouring weakness in the ordeal. M. le Marquis, on his side, was no less eager for an immediate settlement, and since they had M. de Chabrien to act for his cousin, and André Louis to serve as witness for M. de Villemarin, there was nothing to delay them. And so, within a few minutes, all arrangements were concluded, and you behold that sinisterly intentioned little group of four, assembled in the afternoon sunshine on the bowling green behind the inn. They were entirely private, screened more or less from the windows of the house by a ramage of trees, which, if leafless now, was at least dense enough to provide an effective lattice. There were no formalities over measurements of blades or selection of ground. M. le Marquis removed his sword-belt and scabbard, but declined, not considering it worth while for the sake of so negligible an opponent, to divest himself either of his shoes or his coat. Tall, lithe, and athletic, he stood to face the no less tall, but very delicate and frail, M. de Villemarin. The latter also disdained to make any of the usual preparations, since he recognized that it could avail him nothing to strip. He came on guard fully dressed, two hectic spots above the cheekbones burning on his otherwise grey face. M. de Chabrienne, leaning upon a cane, for he had relinquished his sword to M. de Villemarin, looked on with quiet interest. Facing him on the other side of the combatants stood André Louis, the palest of the four, staring from fevered eyes, twisting and untwisting clammy hands. His every instinct was to fling himself between the antagonists, to protest against and frustrate this meeting. That sane impulse was curbed, however, by the consciousness of its futility. To calm him, he clung to the conviction that the issue could not really be very serious if the obligations of Philippe's honour compelled him to cross swords with the man he had struck. M. de la Tour d'Azur's birth compelled him no less to do no serious hurt to the unfledged lad he had so grievously provoked. M. le Marquis, after all, was a man of honour. He could intend no more than to administer a lesson— sharp, perhaps, but one by which his opponent must live to profit. André Louis clung obstinately to that for comfort. Steel beat on steel, and the men engaged. The Marquis presented to his opponent the narrow edge of his upright body, his knees slightly flexed and converted into living springs, whilst M. de Villemarin stood squarely, a full target, his knees wooden. Honour and the spirit of fair play alike cried out against such a match. The encounter was very short, of course. In youth Philippe had received the tutoring in sword-play that was given to every boy born into his station of life, and so he knew at least the rudiments of what was now expected of him. But what could rudiments avail him here? Three disengages completed the exchanges and then, without any haste, the Marquis slid his right foot along the moist turf, his long, graceful body extending itself in a lunge that went under M. de Villemarin's clumsy guard, and with the utmost deliberation he drove his blade through the young man's vitals. André-Louis sprang forward just in time to catch his friend's body under the armpits as it sank. 
then his own legs bending beneath the weight of it. He went down with his burden until he was kneeling on the damp turf. Philippe's limp head lay against André Louis's left shoulder. Philippe's relaxed arms trailed at his sides. The blood welled and bubbled from the ghastly wound to saturate the poor lad's garments. With white face and twitching lips, André Louis looked up at Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir, who stood surveying his work with a countenance of grave but remorseless interest. "'You have killed him!' cried André Louis. "'Of course.' The Marquis ran a lace handkerchief along his blade to wipe it. As he let the dainty fabric fall, he explained himself. He had, as I told him, a too dangerous gift of eloquence. And he turned away, leaving completest understanding with André Louis. Still supporting the limp, draining body, the young man called to him. Come back, you cowardly murderer, and make yourself quite safe by killing me, too. The Marquis half turned, his face dark with anger. Then Monsieur de Chabrienne set a restraining hand upon his arm. Although a party threw out to the deed, the Chevalier was a little appalled now that it was done. He had not the high stomach of Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir, and he was a good deal younger. "'Come away,' he said. "'The lad is raving. They were friends.' "'You heard what he said,' quoth the Marquis. "'Nor can he, or you, or any man deny it,' flung back André Louis. "'Yourself, monsieur, you made the confession when you gave me now the reason you killed him. You did it because you feared him.' If that were true, what then? asked the great gentleman. Do you ask? Do you understand of life and humanity nothing but how to wear a coat and dress your hair? Oh, yes. And to handle weapons against boys and priests. Have you no mind to think? no soul into which you could turn its vision? Would you be told that it is a coward's part to kill the thing he fears, and doubly a coward's part to kill in this way? Had you stabbed him in the back with a knife, you would have shown the courage of your vileness. It would have been a vileness undisguised, but you feared the consequences of that, powerful as you are, and so you shelter your cowardice under the pretext of a duel. The Marquis shook off his cousin's hand and took a step forward, holding his sword like a whip. But again the Chevalier caught and held him. No, no, Gervais, let be in God's name. Let him come, monsieur, raved André Louis, his voice thick and concentrated. Let him complete his coward's work on me, and thus make himself safe from a coward's wages. Monsieur de Chabrienne let his cousin go. He came white to the lips, his eyes glaring at the lad who so recklessly insulted him. And then he checked. It may be that he remembered suddenly the relationship in which this young man was popularly believed to stand to the seigneur de Gavriac, and the well-known affection in which the seigneur held him. And so he may have realized that if he pushed this matter further he might find himself upon the horns of a dilemma. He would be confronted with the alternatives of shedding more blood and so embroiling himself with the lord of Gavriac at a time when that gentleman's friendship was of the first importance to him, or else of withdrawing with such hurt to his dignity, 
as must impair his authority in the countryside hereafter. Be it so, or otherwise, the fact remains that he stopped short. Then, with an incoherent ejaculation between anger and contempt, he tossed his arms, turned on his heel, and strode off quickly with his cousin. When the landlord and his people came, they found André Louis, his arms about the body of his dead friend, murmuring passionately into the deaf ear that rested almost against his lips. Philippe! Speak to me, Philippe! Don't you hear me? Oh, God of heaven! Philippe! At a glance they saw that here neither priest nor doctor could avail. The cheek that lay against André Louise was leaden-hued. The half-open eyes were glazed, and there was a little froth of blood upon the vacuously parted lips. Half blinded by tears, André Louise stumbled after them when they bore the body into the inn. Upstairs in the little room to which they conveyed it, he knelt by the bed, and holding the dead man's hand in both his own, he swore to him, out of his impotent rage, that Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir should pay a bitter price for this. It was your eloquence he feared, Philippe, he said. And if I can get no justice for this deed, at least it shall be fruitless to him. The thing he feared in you he shall fear in me. He feared that men might be swayed by your eloquence to the undoing of such things as himself. Men shall be swayed by it still, for your eloquence and your arguments shall be my heritage from you. I will make them my own. It matters nothing that I do not believe in your gospel of freedom. I know it. Every word of it. That is all that matters to our purpose, yours and mine. If all else fails, your thoughts shall find expression in my living tongue. Thus at least we shall have frustrated his vile aim to still the voice he feared. It shall profit him nothing to have your blood upon his soul. That voice in you would never half so relentlessly have hounded him and his as it shall in me. If all else fails... It was an exulting thought. It calmed him. It soothed his grief. And he began, very softly, to pray. And then his heart trembled as he considered that Philippe, a man of peace, almost a priest, an apostle of Christianity had gone to his Maker with the sin of anger on his soul. It was horrible. Yet God would see the righteousness of that anger, and in no case be man's interpretation of divinity what it might, could that one sin outweigh the loving good that Philippe had ever practised, the noble purity of his great heart. God, after all, reflected André Louis, was not a grand seigneur. End of chapter 4 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. That's L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X dot O-R-G. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Scaramouche, a romance of the French Revolution, 
by Raphael Sabatini. Book One. Chapter Five. The Lord of Gavriac. For the second time that day, André Louis set out for the chateau, walking briskly, and heeding not at all the curious eyes that followed him through the village, and the whisperings that marked his passage through the people, all agog by now with that day's event in which he had been an actor. He was ushered by Benoit, the elderly body-servant, rather grandiloquently called the Seneschal, into the ground-floor room known traditionally as the library. It still contained several shelves of neglected volumes, from which it derived its title, but implements of the chase, fowling pieces, powder horns, hunting bags, sheath knives, obtruded far more prominently than those of study. The furniture was massive, of oak richly carved, and belonging to another age. Great massive oak beams crossed the rather lofty whitewashed ceiling. Here the squat seigneur de Gavriac was restlessly pacing when André Louis was introduced. He was already informed, as he announced at once, of what had taken place at the Breton Arm. Monsieur de Chabrienne had just left him, and he confessed himself deeply grieved and deeply perplexed. "'The pity of it,' he said. "'The pity of it!' He bowed his enormous head. "'So estimable a young man, and so full of promise. "'Ah, this Latour d'Azir is a hard man, "'and he feels very strongly in these matters. "'He may be right. I don't know. "'I have never killed a man for holding different views from mine. "'In fact, I have never killed a man at all. "'It isn't in my nature. "'I shouldn't sleep of nights if I did.' But men are differently made. The question, monsieur my godfather, said André Louis, is what is to be done. He was quite calm and self-possessed, but very white. Monsieur de Kercadio stared at him blankly out of his pale eyes. Why, what the devil is there to do? From what I am told, Vilmorin went so far as to strike monsieur le marquis under the grossest provocation, which he himself provoked by his revolutionary language. The poor lad's head was full of this encyclopedist trash. It comes of too much reading. I have never set much store by books, André. I have never known anything but trouble to come out of learning. It unsettles a man. It complicates his views of life, destroys the simplicity which makes for peace of mind and happiness. Let this miserable affair be a warning to you, André. You are yourself too prone to these new-fashioned speculations upon a different constitution of the social order. You see what comes of it. A fine, estimable young man, the only prop of his widowed mother, too forgets himself, his position, his duty to that mother, everything, and goes and gets himself killed like this. It is infernally sad. On my soul it is sad. He produced a handkerchief and blew his nose with vehemence. André Louis felt a tightening of his heart, a lessening of the hopes, never too sanguine, which he had founded upon his godfather. Your criticisms he said, are all for the conduct of the dead, and none for that of the murderer. It does not seem possible that you should be in sympathy with such a crime. Crime? shrilled M. de Kercadio. My God, boy, you are speaking of M. de la Tour d'Azir. I am, and of the abominable murder he has committed. Stop! M. de Kercadio was very emphatic. I cannot permit that you apply such terms to him. I cannot permit it. M. le Marquis is my friend, and is likely very soon to stand in a still closer relationship. Notwithstanding this? asked André Louis. M. de Kercadio was frankly impatient. 
Why, what has this to do with it? I may deplore it, but I have no right to condemn it. It is a common way of adjusting differences between gentlemen. You really believe that? What the devil do you imply, André? Should I say a thing that I don't believe? You begin to make me angry. Thou shalt not kill is the king's law as well as God's. You are determined to quarrel with me, I think. It was a duel, André Louis interrupted him. It is no more a duel than if it had been fought with pistols of which only Monsieur le Marquis was loaded. He invited Philippe to discuss the matter further with the deliberate intent of forcing a quarrel upon him and killing him. Be patient with me, monsieur, my godfather. I am not telling you of what I imagine, but what monsieur le marquis himself admitted to me. Dominated a little by the young man's earnestness, monsieur de Kercadiou's pale eyes fell away. He turned with a shrug and sauntered over to the window. It would need a court of honour to decide such an issue, and we have no courts of honour, he said. But we have courts of justice. With returning testiness, the seigneur swung round to face him again. And what court of justice do you think would listen to such a plea as you appear to have in mind? There is the court of the king's lieutenant at Rennes. And do you think the king's lieutenant would listen to you? Not to me, perhaps, monsieur. But if you were to bring the plaint... I bring the plaint? Monsieur de Kercadiou's pale eyes were wide with the horror of the suggestion. The thing happened here on your domain. I bring a plaint against Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir. You are out of your senses, I think. Oh, you are mad! As mad as that poor friend of yours who has come to this end through meddling in what did not concern him. The language he used here to Monsieur le Marquis on the score of Mabby was of the most offensive. Perhaps you didn't know that. It does not at all surprise me that the Marquis should have desired satisfaction. I see, said André Louis, on a note of hopelessness. You see? Well, what the devil do you see? That I shall have to depend upon myself alone. And what the devil do you propose to do, if you please? I shall go to Rennes, and lay the facts before the King's lieutenant. He'll be too busy to see you. M. de Kercadiou's mind swung a trifle inconsequently, as weak minds will. There is trouble enough in Rennes already on the score of these crazy states-general, with which the wonderful M. Necker is to repair the finances of the kingdom, as if a peddling Swiss bank clerk, who is also a damned Protestant, could succeed where such men as Calon and Brienne have failed. "'Good afternoon, monsieur, my godfather,' said André Louis. "'Where are you going?' was the querulous demand. "'Home at the present. To Rennes in the morning.' "'Wait, boy, wait!' The squat little man rolled forward, affectionate concern on his great ugly face, and he set one of his podgy hands on his godson's shoulder. Now, listen to me, André, he reasoned. This is sheer night errantry, moonshine, lunacy. You'll come to no good by it if you persist. You've read Don Quixote and what happens to him when he went tilting against windmills. It's what will happen to you, neither more nor less. Leave things as they are, my boy. I wouldn't have a mischief happen to you. André Louis looked at him, smiling wanly. I swore an oath today, 
which it would damn my soul to break. You mean that you'll go, in spite of anything that I may say? Impetuous as he was inconsequent, Monsieur de Kercadio was bristling again. Very well, then. Go. Go to the devil. I will begin with the king's lieutenant. And if you get into the trouble you are seeking, don't come whimpering to me for assistance, the seigneur stormed. He was very angry now. Since you choose to disobey me, you can break your empty head against the windmill and be damned to you. André Louis bowed with a touch of irony and reached the door. If the windmill should prove too formidable, said he, from the threshold, I may see what can be done with the wind. Good-bye, monsieur my godfather. He was gone, and monsieur de Kercadio was alone, purple in the face, puzzling out that last cryptic utterance, and not at all happy in his mind, either on the score of his godson or of Monsieur de la Tour d'Azur. He was disposed to be angry with them both. He found these headstrung, willful men who relentlessly followed their own impulses very disturbing and irritating. Himself, he loved his ease, and to be at peace with his neighbors, and that seemed to him so obviously the supreme good of life that he was disposed to brand them as fools who troubled to seek other things. End of chapter 5「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. That's L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X dot O-R-G. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Scaramouche, A Romance of the French Revolution by Raphael Sabatini. Book One. Chapter Six. The Windmill. There was between Nantes and Rennes an established service of three stage coaches weekly in each direction, which for a sum of twenty four livres, roughly the equivalent of an English guinea, would carry you the seventy and odd miles of the journey in some fourteen hours. Once a week one of the diligences, going in each direction, would swerve aside from the high road to call at Gavriac, to bring and take letters, newspapers, and sometimes passengers. It was usually by this coach that André Louis came and went when the occasion offered. At present, however, he was too much in haste to lose a day awaiting the passing of that diligence. So it was on a horse hired from the Breton arm that he set out next morning, and an hour's brisk ride under a grey wintry sky by a half-ruined road through ten miles of flat uninteresting country brought him to the city of Rennes. He rode across the main bridge over the Vilaine, and so into the upper and principal part of that important city of some thirty thousand souls, most of whom he opined from the seething, clamant crowds that everywhere blocked his way, must on this day have taken to the streets. Clearly Philippe had not overstated the excitement prevailing there. He pushed on as best he could, and so came at last to the Place Royale, where he found the crowd to be most dense. From the plinth of the equestrian statue of Louis the Fifteenth, a white-faced young man was excitedly addressing the multitude. His youth and dress proclaimed the student, and a group of his fellows, acting as a guard of honour to him, kept the immediate precincts of the statue. Over the heads of the crowd André Louis caught a few of the phrases flung forth by that eager voice. It was the promise of the king. It is the king's authority they flout. They abrogate to themselves the whole sovereignty in Brittany. The king has dissolved them. These insolent nobles defying their sovereign and the people. 
had he not known already, from what Philippe had told him, of the events which had brought the third estate to the point of active revolt, those few phrases would fully have informed him. This popular display of temper was most opportune to his need, he thought, and in the hope that it might serve his turn by disposing to reasonableness the mind of the king's lieutenant, he pushed on up the wide and well-paved Rue Royale, where the concourse of people began to diminish. He put up his hired horse at the Calm de Cerf, and set out again, on foot, to the Palais de Justice. There was a brawling mob by the framework of poles and scaffoldings about the building cathedral, upon which work had been commenced a year ago, but he did not pause to ascertain the particular cause of that gathering. He strode on, and thus came presently to the handsome Italianate palace that was one of the few public edifices that had survived a devastating fire of sixty years ago. He won through with difficulty to the great hall, known as the Salle des Pas Perdus, where he was left to cool his heels for a full half-hour after he had found an usher so condescending as to inform the god who presided over that shrine of justice that a lawyer from Gavriac humbly begged an audience on an affair of gravity. That the god condescended to see him at all was probably due to the grave complexion of the hour. At long length he was escorted up the broad stone staircase, and ushered into a spacious, meagerly furnished anteroom, to make one of a waiting crowd of clients, mostly men. There he spent another half-hour, and employed the time in considering exactly what he would say. This consideration made him realize the weakness of the case he proposed to set before a man whose views of law and morality were colored by his social rank. At last he was ushered through a narrow but very massive and richly decorated door into a fine, well-lighted room, furnished with enough gilt and satin to have supplied the boudoir of a lady of fashion. It was a trivial setting for a king's lieutenant, but about the king's lieutenant there was, at least to ordinary eyes, nothing trivial. At the far end of the chamber, to the right of one of the tall windows that looked out over the inner court, before a goat-legged writing-table with Watteau panels, heavily encrusted with ormolu, sat that exalted being. Above a scarlet coat, with an order flaming on its breast, and a billow of lace in which diamonds sparkled like drops of water, sprouted the massive powdered head of Monsieur de l'Edigueur. It was thrown back to scowl upon this visitor with an expectant arrogance that made André Louis wonder almost was a genuflection awaited from him. Perceiving a lean, lantern-jawed young man with straight, lank black hair in a caped riding-coat of brown cloth and yellow buckskin breeches, his knee-boots splashed with mud, the scowl upon that august visage deepened until it brought together the thick black eyebrows above the great hooked nose. "'You announce yourself as a lawyer of Gavriac, with an important communication,' he growled. It was a peremptory command to make this communication without wasting the valuable time of a king's lieutenant of whose immense importance it conveyed something more than a hint. M. de Lédiguier accounted himself an imposing personality, and he had every reason to do so, for in his time he had seen many a poor devil scared out of all his senses by the thunder of his voice. He waited now to see the same thing happen to this youthful lawyer from Gavriac, but he waited in vain. André Louis found him ridiculous. He knew pretentiousness for the mask of worthlessness and weakness, and here he beheld pretentiousness incarnate. It was to be read in that arrogant poise of the head, that scowling brow, that inflection of that reverberating voice. Even more difficult than it is for a man to be a hero to his valet, who has witnessed the dispersal of the parts that make up the imposing whole, is it for a man to be a hero to the student of man, who
who has witnessed the same in a different sense. André Louis stood forward boldly, impudently, thought M. de Lesdiguier. You are His Majesty's lieutenant here in Brittany, he said, and it almost seemed to the august lord of life and death that this fellow had the incredible effrontery to address him as one man speaking to another. You are the dispenser of the king's high justice in this province. Surprise spread on that handsome, sallow face under the heavily powdered wig. Is your business concerned with this infernal insubordination of the canaille? he asked. It is not, monsieur. The black eyebrows rose. Then what the devil do you mean by intruding upon me at a time when all my attention is being claimed by the obvious urgency of this disgraceful affair? The affair that brings me is no less disgraceful and no less urgent. It will have to wait, thundered the great man in a passion, and tossing back a cloud of lace from his hand, he reached for the little silver bell upon his table. A moment, monsieur. André Louis's tone was peremptory. Monsieur de Lesdiguier checked in sheer amazement at its impudence. I can state it very briefly. Haven't I said already? And when you have heard it, André Louis went on relentlessly, interrupting the interruption, you will agree with me as to its character. Monsieur de Lesdiguier considered him very sternly. "'What is your name?' he asked. "'André-Louis Moreau.' "'Well, André-Louis Moreau, if you can state your plea briefly, I will hear you. But I warn you that I shall be very angry if you fail to justify the impertinence of this insistence at so inopportune a moment.' "'You shall be the judge of that, monsieur,' said André-Louis and he proceeded at once to state his case, beginning with the shooting of Mabby, and passing thence to the killing of Monsieur de Villemorin. But he withheld until the end the name of the great gentleman against whom he demanded justice, persuaded that, did he introduce it earlier, he would not be allowed to proceed. He had a gift of oratory of whose full powers he was himself hardly conscious yet, though destined very soon to become so, he told his story well, without exaggeration, yet with a force of simple appeal that was irresistible. Gradually the great man's face relaxed from its forbidding severity. Interest, warming almost to sympathy, came to be reflected on it. And who, sir, is the man you charge with this? The Marquis de la Tour d'Azir. The effect of that formidable name was immediate. Dismayed anger and an arrogance more utter than before took the place of the sympathy he had been betrayed into displaying. Who? he shouted, and without waiting for an answer. Why, here's impudence, he stormed on, to come before me with such a charge against a gentleman of Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir's eminence. How dare you speak of him as a coward? I speak of him as a murderer, the young man corrected, and I demand justice against him. You demand it, do you? My God, what's next? That is for you to say, monsieur. It surprised the great gentleman into a more or less successful effort of self-control. Let me warn you, said he acidly, that it is not wise to make wild accusations against a nobleman. That in itself is a punishable offence, as you may learn. Now listen to me in this matter of Mabby, assuming your statement of it to be exact. The gamekeeper may have exceeded his duty but by so little that it is hardly worth comment. Consider, however, that in any case it is not a matter for the king's lieutenant, or for any court but the seigneurial court of Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir himself. 
It is before the magistrates of his own appointing that such a matter must be laid, since it is matter strictly concerning his own seigneurial jurisdiction. As a lawyer you should not need to be told so much. As a lawyer I am prepared to argue the point, but as a lawyer I also realize that if that case were prosecuted it could only end in the unjust punishment of a wretched gamekeeper, who did no more than carry out his orders, but who none the less would now be made a scapegoat, if scapegoat were necessary. I am not concerned to hang Bennett on the gallows earned by Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir. Monsieur de Lédiguier smote the table violently. My God! he cried out, to add more quietly on a note of menace. You are singularly insolent, my man. That is not my intention, sir. I assure you, I am a lawyer, pleading his case, the case of Monsieur de Villemarin. It is for his assassination that I have come to beg the King's justice. But you yourself have said that it was a duel, cried the lieutenant, between anger and bewilderment. I have said that it was made to appear a duel. There is a distinction, as I shall show, if you will condescend to hear me out. "'Take your time, sir,' said the ironical Monsieur de Lédiguier, whose tenure of office had never yet held anything that remotely resembled this experience. André Louis took him literally. "'I thank you, sir,' he answered solemnly, and submitted his argument." It can be shown that M. de Villemarin never practised fencing in all his life, and it is notorious that M. de la Tour d'Azir is an exceptional swordsman. Is it a duel, monsieur, where one of the combatants alone is armed? For it amounts to that on a comparison of their measures of respective skill. There has scarcely been a duel fought on which the same trumpery argument might not be advanced but not always with equal justice, and in one case at least it was advanced successfully. Successfully? When was that? Ten years ago in Dauphiny. I refer to the case of Monsieur de Gevray, a gentleman of that province, who forced a duel upon Monsieur de la Roche, Jeannine, and killed him. Monsieur de Jeannine was a member of a powerful family which exerted itself to obtain justice. It put forward just such arguments as now obtain against Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir. As you will remember, the judges held that the provocation had proceeded on intent from Monsieur de Gevray. They found him guilty of premeditated murder, and he was hanged. Monsieur de Lédiguer exploded yet again. "'Death of my life!' he cried. "'Have you the effrontery to suggest "'that Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir should be hanged? "'Have you?' "'But why not, monsieur, if it is the law, "'and there is precedent for it, as I have shown you, "'and if it can be established that what I state is the truth?' as established it can be without difficulty. Do you ask me why not? Have you temerity to ask me that? I have, monsieur. Can you answer me? If you cannot, monsieur, I shall understand that whilst it is possible for a powerful family like that of La Roche Janine to set the law in motion, the law must remain inert for the obscure and uninfluential, however brutally wronged by a great nobleman. M. de Lédiguier perceived that in argument he would accomplish nothing against this impassive, resolute young man. The menace of him grew more fierce. "'I should advise you to take yourself off at once, and to be thankful for the opportunity to depart unscathed.' I am then to understand, monsieur, that there will be no inquiry into this case, that nothing that I can say will move you? You are to understand that if you are still there in two minutes it will be very much the worse for you. 
and M. de Lesdiguieres tinkled the silver handbell upon his table. "'I have informed you, monsieur, that a duel, so called, has been fought, and a man killed. It seems that I must remind you, the administrator of the king's justice, that duels are against the law, and that it is your duty to hold an inquiry. I come as the legal representative of the bereaved mother of Monsieur de Villemarin to demand of you the inquiry that is due.' The door behind André Louis opened softly. M. de Lesdiguier, pale with anger, contained himself with difficulty. "'You seek to compel us, do you? You impudent rascal!' he growled. "'You think that the king's justice is to be driven headlong by the voice of any impudent roturier? I marvel at my own patience with you.' but I give you a last warning, master lawyer. Keep a closer guard over that insolent tongue of yours, or you will have cause very bitterly to regret its glibness. He waved a jewelled, contemptuous hand, and spoke to the usher standing behind André. To the door, he said shortly. André Louis hesitated a second. Then with a shrug he turned. This was the windmill, indeed, and he, a poor knight of rueful countenance, to attack it at close quarters would mean being dashed to pieces. Yet on the threshold he turned again. Monsieur de Lesdiguier, said he, may I recite to you an interesting fact in natural history? The tiger is a great lord in the jungle and was for centuries the terror of lesser beasts, including the wolf. The wolf, himself a hunter, wearied of being hunted. He took to associating with other wolves, and then the wolves, driven to form packs for self-protection, discovered the prowler of the pack, and took to hunting the tiger, with disastrous results to him. You should study Buffon, Monsieur de Lesdiguieres. I have studied a buffoon this morning, I think, was the punning sneer with which M. de Lesdiguier replied. But that he conceived himself witty, it is probable he would not have condescended to reply at all. I don't understand you, he added. But you will, M. de Lesdiguier. You will, said André Louis, and so departed. End of chapter 6「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Scaramouche. A Romance of the French Revolution. Book One, Chapter Seven. The Wind. He had broken his futile lance with the windmill. The image suggested by Monsieur de Kercadio persisted in his mind, and it was, he perceived, by sheer good fortune that he had escaped without hurt. There remained the wind itself, the whirlwind and the events in Rennes, reflex of the graver events in Nantes, had set that wind blowing in his favour. He set out briskly to retrace his steps toward the Place Royale, where the gathering of the populace was greatest, where, as he judged, lay the heart and brain of this commotion that was exciting the city. But the commotion that he had left there was as nothing to the commotion which he found on his return. Then there had been a comparative hush to listen to the voice of a speaker who denounced the first and second estates from the pedestal of the statue of Louis the Fifteenth. Now the air was vibrant, with the voice of the multitude itself raised in anger. Here and there men were fighting with canes and fists. Everywhere a fierce excitement raged, and the gendarme sent thither by the king's lieutenant 
to restore and maintain order, were so much helpless flotsam in that tempestuous human ocean. There were cries of, To the Palais! To the Palais! Down with the assassins! Down with the nobles! To the Palais! An artisan who stood shoulder to shoulder with him in the press enlightened André Louis on the score of the increased excitement. They've shot him dead. His body is lying there where it fell at the foot of the statue. And there was another student killed not an hour ago over there by the cathedral works. Pardy! If they can't prevail in one way, they'll prevail in another. The man was fiercely emphatic. They'll stop at nothing. If they can't overawe us, by God, they'll assassinate us. They are determined to conduct these states of Brittany in their own way. No interests but their own shall be considered. André Louis left him still talking, and clove himself away through that human press. At the statue's base he came upon a little cluster of students about the body of the murdered lad, all stricken with fear and helplessness. "'You here, Moreau?' said a voice. He looked round to find himself confronted by a slight, swarthy man, of little more than thirty, firm of mouth and impertinent of nose, who considered him with disapproval. It was Le Chapelier, a lawyer of Rennes, a prominent member of the literary chamber of that city, a forceful man, fertile in revolutionary ideas, and of an exceptional gift of eloquence." Ah, it's you, Chapelier. Why don't you speak to them? Why don't you tell them what to do? Up with you, man! And he pointed to the plinth. The Chapelier's dark, restless eyes searched the other's impassive face for some trace of the irony he suspected. They were as wide asunder as the poles, these two, in their political views. And mistrusted as André Louis was by all his colleagues of the literary chamber of Rennes, he was by none mistrusted so thoroughly as by this vigorous Republican. Indeed, had Le Chapelier been able to prevail against the influence of the seminarist Villemorin, André Louis would long since have found himself excluded from that assembly of the intellectual youth of Rennes, which he exasperated by his eternal mockery of their ideals. So now Le Chapelier suspected mockery in that invitation, suspected it even when he failed to find traces of it on André Louis's face. For he had learnt by experience that it was a face not often to be trusted for any indication of the real thoughts that moved behind it. "'Your notions and mine on that score can hardly coincide,' said he. "'Can there be two opinions?' quoth André Louis. There are usually two opinions whenever you and I are together, Moreau, more than ever now that you are the appointed delegate of a nobleman. You see what your friends have done. No doubt you approve their methods. He was coldly hostile. André Louis looked at him without surprise. So invariably opposed to each other in academic debates, how should Le Chapelier suspect his present intentions? "'If you won't tell them what is to be done, I will,' said he. "'Nom de Dieu! If you want to invite a bullet from the other side, I shall not hinder you. It may help to square the account.' Scarcely were the words out than he repented them, for as if in answer to that challenge André Louis sprang up on to the plinth. Alarmed now, for he could only suppose it to be André Louis's intention to speak on behalf of privilege, of which he was a publicly appointed representative. Le Chapelier clutched him by the leg to pull him down again. "'Ah, that, no!' he was shouting. "'Come down, you fool! Do you think we will let you ruin everything by your clowning? Come down!' André Louis maintaining his position by clutching one of the legs of the bronze horse, flung his voice like a bugle-note over the heads of the seething mob. "'Citizens of Rennes, the motherland is in danger!' The effect 
was electric. A stir ran like a ripple over water, across that froth of upturned human faces, and completest silence followed. In that great silence they looked at this slim young man, hatless, long wisps of his black hair fluttering in the breeze, his neck cloth in disorder, his face white, his eyes on fire. André Louis felt a sudden surge of exultation as he realized by instinct that at one grip he had seized that crowd and that he held it fast in the spell of his cry and his audacity. Even Le Chapelier, though still clinging to his ankle, had ceased to tug. The reformer, though unshaken in his assumption of André Louis' intentions, was for a moment bewildered by the first note of his appeal. And then, slowly, impressively, in a voice that travelled clear to the ends of the square, the young lawyer of Gavriac began to speak. Shuddering in horror of the vile deed here perpetrated, my voice demands to be heard by you. You have seen murder done under your eyes, the murder of one who nobly without any thought of self, gave voice to the wrongs by which we are all oppressed. Fearing that voice, shunning the truth as foul things shun the light, our oppressors sent their agents to silence him in death. Le Chapelier released at last his hold of André Louis' ankle staring up at him the while in sheer amazement. It seemed that the fellow was in earnest, serious for once, and for once on the right side. What had come to him? Of assassins what shall you look for but assassination? I have a tale to tell which will show that this is no new thing that you have witnessed here to-day. It will reveal to you the forces with which you have to deal. Yesterday there was an interruption. A voice in the crowd, some twenty paces perhaps, was raised to shout, Yet another of them! Immediately after the voice came a pistol shot, and a bullet flattened itself against the bronze figure just behind André Louis. Instantly there was turmoil in the crowd most intense about the spot whence the shot had been fired. The assailant was one of a considerable group of the opposition, a group that found itself at once beset on every side, and hard put to it to defend him. From the foot of the plinth rang the voice of the students making chorus to Le Chapelier, who is bidding André Louis to seek shelter. "'Come down! Come down at once!' They'll murder you as they murdered La Riviere. Let them! He flung wide his arms in a gesture supremely theatrical, and he laughed. <laughs> I stand here at their mercy. Let them, if they will, add mine to the blood that will presently rise up to choke them. Let them assassinate me. It is a trade they understand but until they do so they shall not prevent me from speaking to you, from telling you what is to be looked for in them. And again he laughed, not merely in exultation as they supposed who watched him from below, but also in amusement. And his amusement had two sources. One was to discover how glibly he uttered the phrases proper to whip up the emotions of a crowd. The other was in the remembrance of how the crafty Cardinal de Retz, for the purpose of inflaming popular sympathy on his behalf, had been in the habit of hiring fellows to fire upon his carriage. He was in just such a case as that arch-politician. True, he had not hired the fellow to fire that pistol shot, but he was none the less obliged to him, and ready to derive the fullest advantage from the act. 
The group that sought to protect that man was battling on, seeking to hew a way out of that angry, heaving press. "'Let them go!' Andre called down. "'What matters one assassin, more or less? "'Let them go, and listen to me, my countrymen!' And presently, when some measure of order was restored, he began his tale. In simple language now, yet with a vehemence and directness that drove home every point, he tore their hearts with the story of yesterday's happenings at Gavriac. He drew tears from them with the pathos of his picture of the bereaved widow Mabi and her three starving, destitute children. Orphaned to avenge the death of a pheasant, and the bereaved mother of that Monsieur de Villemarin, a student of Rennes, known here to many of them, who had met his death in a noble endeavour to champion the cause of an essurient member of their afflicted order. The Marquis de la Tour d'Azier said of him that he had too dangerous a gift of eloquence. It was to silence his brave voice that he killed him. But he has failed of his object. For I, poor Philippe de Villemarin's friend, have assumed the mantle of his apostleship, and I speak to you with his voice today. It was a statement that helped Le Chapelier at last to understand, at least in part, this bewildering change in André Louis, which rendered him faithless to the side that employed him. I am not here, continued André Louis merely to demand at your hands vengeance upon Philippe de Villemarin's murderers. I am here to tell you the things he would to-day have told you had he lived. So far, at least, he was frank. But he did not add that they were things he did not himself believe, things that he accounted the cant by which an ambitious bourgeoisie speaking through the mouths of the lawyers who were its articulate part, sought to overthrow to its own advantage the present state of things. He left his audience in the natural belief that the views he expressed were the views he held. And now, in a terrible voice, with an eloquence that amazed himself, he denounced the inertia of the royal justice, where the great are the offenders. It was with bitter sarcasm that he spoke of their king's lieutenant, Monsieur de Lesdiguières. Do you wonder, he asked them, that Monsieur de Lesdiguières should administer the law so that it shall ever be favourable to our great nobles? Would it be just, would it be reasonable, that he should otherwise administer it? He paused dramatically to let his sarcasm sink in. It had the effect of reawakening Le Chapelier's doubts, and checking his dawning conviction of André Louis' sincerity. Whither was he going now? He was not left long in doubt. Proceeding, André Louis spoke as he conceived that Philippe de Villemarin would have spoken. He had so often argued with him so often attended the discussions of the literary chamber that he had all the rant of the reformers. That was yet true in substance, at his fingers' ends. Consider, after all, the composition of this France of ours. A million of its inhabitants are members of the privileged classes. They compose France. They are France, for surely you cannot suppose the remainder to be anything that matters. It cannot be pretended that twenty-four million souls are of any account, that they can be representative of this great 
nation, or that they can exist for any purpose but that of servitude to the million elect. Bitter laughter shook them now as he desired it should. Seeing their privileges in danger of invasion by these twenty-four millions, mostly canai, possibly created by God, it is true, but clearly so created to be the slaves of privilege. Does it surprise you that the dispensing of royal justice should be placed in the stout hands of these les de Gueux, men without brains to think or hearts to be touched? Consider what it is that must be defended against the assault of us others, canaille, Consider a few of these feudal rights that are in danger of being swept away should the privileged yield even to the commands of their sovereign, and admit the third estate to an equal vote with themselves. What would become of the right of terrage on the land, of parsiere on the fruit trees, of carpeaux on the vines? What of the corvies? by which they command forced labor, of the band de vandage, which gives them the first vintage, the bain which enables them to control to their own advantage the sale of wine. What of their right of grinding the last liard of taxation out of the people to maintain their own opulent estate, the Seine, the Lord et Vin, which absorb a fifth of the value of the land, the Blairie, which must be paid before herds can feed on communal lands, the pulverage to indemnify them for the dust raised on their roads by the herds that go to market, the sextilage on everything offered for sale in the public markets, the etalonage, and all the rest. What of their rights over men? and animals for field labor, of ferries over rivers, and of bridges over streams, of sinking wells, of war, and of dovecot, and of fire, which last yields them a tax on every peasant hearth. What of their exclusive rights of fishing and of hunting, the violation of which is ranked as almost a capital offense? And what of other rights? unspeakable, abominable over the lives and bodies of their people, rights which, if rarely exercised, have never been rescinded. To this day, if a noble returning from the hunt were to slay two of his serfs to bathe and refresh his feet in their blood, he could still claim in his sufficient defence that it was his absolute feudal right to do so. Rough-shod, these million privileged ride over the souls and bodies of twenty-four million contemptible canai, existing but for their own pleasure. Woe betide him who so much as raises his voice in protest in the name of humanity against an excess of these already excessive abuses. I have told you of one remorselessly slain in cold blood for doing no more than that. Your own eyes have witnessed the assassination of another. Here, upon this plinth, of yet another over there, by the cathedral works, and the attempt upon my own life, and the attempt upon my own life. Between them and the justice due to them in such cases stand these les Diguirs, these king's lieutenants, not instruments of justice, but walls erected for the shelter of privilege and abuse 
whenever it exceeds its grotesquely excessive rights. Do you wonder that they will not yield an inch, that they will resist the election of a third estate with the voting power to sweep all these privileges away, to compel the privileged to submit themselves to a just equality in the eyes of the law, with the meanest of the canaille they trample under foot, to provide that the monies necessary to save this state from bankruptcy, into which they have all but plunged it, shall be raised by taxation, to be borne by themselves in the same proportion as by others? Sooner than yield to so much, they prefer to resist even the royal command. A phrase occurred to him used yesterday by Villemarin, a phrase to which he had refused to attach importance when uttered then. He used it now. In doing this, they are striking at the very foundations of the throne. These fools do not perceive that if that throne falls over, it is they who stand nearest to it who will be crushed. A terrific roar acclaimed that statement. Tense and quivering with the excitement that was flowing through him and from him out into that great audience, he stood a moment smiling ironically. Then he waved them into silence and he saw by their ready obedience how completely he possessed them. For in the voice with which he spoke, each now recognized the voice of himself, giving at last expression to the thoughts that for months and years had been inarticulately stirring in each simple mind. Presently he resumed, speaking more quietly, that ironic smile about the corner of his mouth growing more marked. In taking my leave of Monsieur de Lédiguier, I gave him warning out of a page of natural history. I told him that when the wolves, roaming singly through the jungle, were weary of being hunted by the tiger, they banded themselves into packs and went a-hunting the tiger in their turn. Monsieur de Lédiguier contemptuously answered that he did not understand me, but your wits are better than his. You understand me, I think, don't you? Again a great roar, mingled now with some approving laughter, was his answer. He had wrought them up to a pitch of dangerous passion, and they were ripe for any violence to which he urged them. If he had failed with the windmill, at least he was now master of the wind. "'To the palais!' they shouted, waving their hands, brandishing canes, and here and there even a sword. "'To the palais! Down with Monsieur de Lédiguier! Death to the king's lieutenant! He was master of the wind indeed. His dangerous gift of oratory, a gift nowhere more powerful than in France, since nowhere else are men's emotions so quick to respond to the appeal of eloquence, had given him this mastery. At his bidding now the gale would sweep away the windmill against which he had flung himself in vain. But that, as he straightforwardly revealed it, was no part of his intent. Ah, wait, he bade them. Is this miserable instrument of a corrupt system worth the attention of your noble indignation? He hoped his words would be reported to Monsieur de Lédiguerre. He thought it would be good for the soul of Monsieur de Lédiguerre to hear the undiluted truth about himself for once. It is the system itself you must attack and overthrow, not a mere instrument, 
a miserable painted lath such as this? And precipitancy will spoil everything. Above all my children, no violence. My children, could his godfather have heard him? You have seen often already the result of premature violence elsewhere in Brittany, and you have heard of it elsewhere in France. Violence on your part will call for violence on theirs. They welcome the chance to assert their mastery by a firmer grip than heretofore. The military will be sent for. You will be faced by the bayonets of mercenaries. Do not provoke that. I implore you. Do not put it into their power. Do not afford them the pretext they would welcome to crush you down into the mud of your own blood. Out of the silence into which they had fallen anew broke now the cry of, What else, then? What else? I will tell you, he answered them. The wealth and strength of Brittany lies in Nantes, a bourgeois city, one of the most prosperous in this realm, rendered so by the energy of the bourgeoisie and the toil of the people. It was in Nantes that this movement had its beginning, and as a result of it the king issued his order dissolving the states as now constituted an order which those who base their power on privilege and abuse do not hesitate to thwart. Let not be informed of the precise situation, and let nothing be done here until Nantes shall have given us the lead. She has the power, which we in Rennes have not, to make her will prevail, as we have seen already. Let her exert that power once more, and until she does so, do you keep the peace in Rennes. Thus shall you triumph, thus shall the outrages that are being perpetrated under your eyes be fully and finally avenged. As abruptly as he had leapt upon the plinth did he now leap down from it. He had finished. He had said all, perhaps more than all, that could have been said by the dead friend with whose voice he spoke. But it was not their will that he should thus extinguish himself. The thunder of their acclamations rose deafeningly upon the air. He had played upon their emotions, each in turn, as a skilful harpist plays upon the strings of his instrument and they were vibrant with the passions he had aroused, and the high note of hope on which he had brought his symphony to a close. A dozen students caught him as he leapt down, and swung him to their shoulders, where again he came within view of all the acclaiming crowd. The delicate La Chapelier pressed alongside of him with flushed face and shining eyes. "'My lad,' he said to him, you have kindled a fire to-day that will sweep the face of France in a blaze of liberty. And then to the students he issued a sharp command. To the literary chamber, at once. We must concert measures upon the instant. A delegate must be dispatched to Nantes forthwith to convey to our friends there the message of the people of Rennes. The crowd fell back, opening a lane through which the students bore the hero of the hour. Waving his hands to them, he called upon them to disperse to their homes, and await there in patience what must follow very soon. You have endured for centuries, with a fortitude that is a pattern to the world, he flattered them. Endure a little longer yet. The end, my friends, is well in sight at last. They carried him out of the square and up the Rue Royale to an old house, one of the few old houses surviving in that city that had risen from its ashes, where in an upper chamber 
lighted by diamond-shaped panes of yellow glass, the literary chamber usually held its meetings. Thither in his wake the members of that chamber came hurrying, summoned by the messages that Le Chapelier had issued during their progress. Behind closed doors a flushed and excited group of some fifty men, the majority of whom were young, ardent, and afire with the illusion of liberty, hailed André Louis as the strayed sheep who had returned to the fold, and smothered him in congratulations and thanks. Then they settled down to deliberate upon immediate measures. Whilst the doors below were kept by a guard of honour that had improvised itself from the masses, and very necessary was this, for no sooner had the chamber assembled than the house was assailed by the gendarmerie of Monsieur de Lesdiguieres, dispatched in haste to arrest the firebrand who was inciting the people of Rennes to sedition. The force consisted of fifty men. Five hundred would have been too few. The mob broke their carbines, broke some of their heads, and would indeed have torn them into pieces had they not beaten a timely and well-advised retreat before a form of horseplay to which they were not at all accustomed. And whilst that was taking place in the street below, in the room above stairs the eloquent Le Chapelier was addressing his colleagues of the literary chamber. Here, with no bullets to fear, and no one to report his words to the authorities, Le Chapelier could permit his oratory a full, unintimidated flow, and that considerable oratory was as direct and brutal as the man himself was delicate and elegant. He praised the vigour and the greatness of the speech they had heard from their colleague Moreau. Above all he praised its wisdom. Moreau's words had come as a surprise to them. Hitherto they had never known him as other than a bitter critic of their projects of reform and regeneration. And quite lately they had heard, not without misgivings, of his appointment as delegate for a nobleman in the states of Brittany. But they held the explanation of his conversion. The murder of their dear colleague, Villemorin, had produced this change. In that brutal deed, Moreau had beheld at last, in true proportions, the workings of that evil spirit which they were vowed to exercise from France. And to-day he had proven himself the stoutest apostle among them of the new faith. He had pointed out to them the only sane and useful course. The illustration he had borrowed from natural history was most apt. Above all, let them pack like wolves, and to ensure this uniformity of action in the people of all Brittany, let a delegate at once be sent to Nantes, which had already proved itself the real seat of Brittany's power. It but remained to appoint that delegate, and Le Chapelier invited them to elect him. André Louis, on a bench near the window, a prey now to some measure of reaction, listened in bewilderment to that flood of eloquence. As the applause died down, he heard a voice exclaiming, "'I propose to you that we appoint our leader here, Le Chapelier, to be that delegate.' Le Chapelier reared his elegantly dressed head, which had been bowed in thought, and it was seen that his countenance was pale. Nervously he fingered a gold spyglass. "'My friends,' he said slowly, "'I am deeply sensible of the honour that you do me, but in accepting it I should be usurping an honour that rightly belongs elsewhere. Who could represent us better?' Who more deserving to be our representative to speak to our friends of Nantes with the voice of Wren than the champion who once already today has so incomparably given utterance to the voice of this great city? Confer this honour of being your spokesman where it belongs, upon André Louis Moreau. Rising in response to the storm of applause that greeted the proposal, André Louis bowed, and forthwith yielded. "'Be it so,' he said simply. 
it is perhaps fitting that I should carry out what I have begun. Though I too am of the opinion that Le Chapelier would have been a worthier representative. I will set out tonight. You will set out at once, my lad, Le Chapelier informed him, and now revealed what an uncharitable mind might account the true source of his generosity. It is not safe after what has happened for you to linger an hour in Rennes, and you must go secretly. Let none of you allow it to be known that he has gone. I would not have you come to harm over this, André Louis, but you must see the risks you run, and if you are to be spared, to help in this work of salvation of our afflicted motherland, you must use caution, move secretly, veil your identity even, or else Monsieur de Lesdiguieres will have you laid by the heels, and it will be good night for you. End of chapter 7 of Book 1This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Scaramouche, a Romance of the French Revolution by Raphael Sabatini. Chapter 8 Omnes Omnibus. André Louis rode forth from Rennes, committed to a deeper adventure than he had dreamed when he left the sleepy village of Gavriac. Lying the night at a roadside inn, and setting out again early in the morning, he reached Nantes soon after noon of the following day. Through that long and lonely ride, through the dull plains of Brittany, now at their dreariest in their winter garb, he had ample leisure in which to review his actions and his position. From one who had taken hitherto a purely academic and by no means friendly interest in the new philosophies of social life, exercising his wits upon these new ideas merely as a fencer exercises his eye and wrist with the foils, without ever suffering himself to be deluded into supposing the issue a real one, he found himself suddenly converted into a revolutionary firebrand, committed to revolutionary action of the most desperate kind. The representative and delegate of a nobleman in the states of Brittany, he found himself simultaneously and incongruously the representative and delegate of the whole third estate of Rennes. It is difficult to determine to what extent, in the heat of passion, and swept along by the torrent of his own oratory, he might yesterday have succeeded in deceiving himself. But it is at least certain that, looking back in cold blood now, he had no single delusion on the score of what he had done. Cynically he had presented to his audience one side only of the great question that he propounded. But, since the established order of things in France was such as to make a rampart for Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir, affording him complete immunity for this and any other crimes that it pleased him to commit, why, then the established order must take the consequences of its wrongdoing. Therein he perceived his clear justification. And so it was, without misgivings, that he came on his errand of sedition into that beautiful city of Nantes, rendered its spacious streets and splendid port the rival in prosperity of Bordeaux and Marseilles. He found an inn on the Quai La Fosse, where he put up his horse, and where he dined in the embrasure of a window that looked out over the tree-bordered quay and the broad bosom of the Loire on which argosies of all nations rode at anchor. The sun had again broken through the clouds and shed its pale wintry light over the yellow waters and the tall masted shipping. Along the quays there was a stir of life as great as that to be seen on the quays of Paris. 
foreign sailors in outlandish garments and of harsh-sounding outlandish speech, stalwart fishwives with baskets of herrings on their heads, voluminous of petticoat above bare legs and bare feet, calling their wares shrilly and almost inarticulately, watermen in woolen caps and loose trousers rolled to the knees, peasants in goatskin coats, their wooden shoes clattering on the round kidney stones, shipwrights and laborers from the dockyards, bellows menders, rat catchers, water carriers, ink sellers, and other itinerant peddlers, and sprinkled through this proletariat mass that came and went in constant movement, André Louis beheld tradesmen in sober garments, merchants in long fur-lined coats, occasionally a merchant prince rolling along in his two-horse cabriolet to the whip-crackings and shouts of Gar from his coachman, occasionally a dainty lady carried past in her sedan-chair, with perhaps a mincing abbé from the episcopal court tripping along in attendance, occasionally an officer in scarlet riding disdainfully, and once the great carriage of a nobleman, with escutcheoned panels and a pair of white-stockinged powdered footmen in gorgeous liveries hanging on behind. And there were capuchins in brown and benedictines in black, and secular priests in plenty, for God was well served in the sixteen parishes of Nantes. And by way of contrast, there were lean-jawed, out-at-elbow adventurers, and gendarmes in blue coats and gaitered legs, sauntering guardians of the peace. Representatives of every class that went to make up the seventy thousand inhabitants of that wealthy, industrious city were to be seen in the human stream that ebbed and flowed beneath the window from which André Louis observed it. Of the waiter who ministered to his humble wants with soup and bouilli and a measure of vin gris, André Louis inquired into the state of public feeling in the city. The waiter, a staunch supporter of the privileged orders, admitted regretfully that an uneasiness prevailed. Much would depend upon what happened at Rennes. If it was true that the king had dissolved the states of Brittany, then all should be well, and the malcontents would have no pretext for further disturbances. There had been trouble and to spare in Nantes already. They wanted no repetition of it. All manner of rumours were abroad, and since early morning there had been crowds besieging the portals of the Chamber of Commerce for definite news. But definite news was yet to come. It was not even known for a fact that His Majesty actually had dissolved the States. It was striking, too, the busiest hour of the day upon the Bourse, when André Louis reached the Place du Commerce. The square, dominated by the imposing classical building of the exchange, was so crowded that he was compelled almost to fight his way through to the steps of the magnificent Ionic porch. A word would have sufficed to have opened a way for him at once, but guile moved him to keep silent. He would come upon that waiting multitude as a thunderclap, precisely as yesterday he had come upon the mob at Rennes he would lose nothing of the surprise effect of his entrance. The precincts of that house of commerce were jealously kept by a line of ushers armed with staves, a guard as hurriedly assembled by the merchants as it was evidently necessary. One of these now effectively barred the young lawyer's passage as he attempted to mount the steps. André Louis announced himself in a whisper. The stave was instantly raised from the horizontal, and he passed and went up the steps in the wake of the usher. At the top, on the threshold of the chamber, he paused, and stayed his guide. "'I will wait here,' he announced. "'Bring the President to me.' "'Your name, monsieur?' Almost had André Louis answered him when he remembered Le Chapelier's warning of the danger with which his mission was fraught and Le Chapelier's parting admonition, 
to conceal his identity. My name is unknown to him, it matters nothing. I am the mouthpiece of a people, no more. Go. The usher went, and in the shadow of that lofty pillared portico André Louis waited, his eyes straying out ever and anon to survey that spread of upturned faces immediately below him. Soon the president came, others following, crowding out into the portico, jostling one another in their eagerness to hear the news. "'You are a messenger from Rennes?' "'I am the delegate sent by the literary chamber of that city to inform you here in Nantes of what is taking place.' "'Your name?' André Louis paused. "'The less we mention names, perhaps the better.' The President's eyes grew big with gravity. He was a corpulent, florid man, purse-proud and self-sufficient. He hesitated a moment. Then, "'Come into the chamber,' said he. "'By your leave, monsieur, I will deliver my message from here, from these steps.' "'From here?' the great merchant frowned. "'My message is for the people of Nantes.' and from here I can speak at once to the greatest number of Nantai of all ranks, and it is my desire, and the desire of those whom I represent, that as great a number as possible should hear my message at first hand. Tell me, sir, is it true that the king has dissolved the states? André Louis looked at him. He smiled apologetically and waved a hand towards the crowd, which by now was straining for a glimpse of this slim young man who had brought forth the President, and more than half the numbers of the chamber, guessing already, with that curious instinct of crowds, that he was the awaited bearer of tidings. "'Summon the gentlemen of your chamber, monsieur,' said he, "'and you shall hear all.' "'So be it.' A word, and forth they came to crowd upon the steps, but leaving clear the topmost step and a half-moon space in the middle. To the spot so indicated, André Louis now advanced very deliberately. He took his stand there, dominating the entire assembly. He removed his hat, and launched the opening bombshell of that address which is historic marking as it does one of the great stages of France's progress towards revolution. People of this great city of Nantes, I have come to summon you to arms. In the amazed and rather scared silence that followed, he surveyed them for a moment before resuming. I am a delegate of the people of Rennes, charged to announce to you what is taking place and to invite you in this dreadful hour of our country's peril to rise and march to her defence. Name! Your name! a voice shouted, and instantly the cry was taken up by others until the multitude rang with the question. He could not answer that excited mob as he had answered the President. It was necessary to compromise, and he did so happily. My name, said he, is Omnis Omnibus, all for all. Let that suffice for now. I am a herald, a mouthpiece, a voice, no more. I come to announce to you that since the privileged orders assembled for the states of Brittany and Rennes resisted your will, our will, despite the king's plain hint to them, his Majesty has dissolved the States. There was a burst of delirious applause. Men laughed and shouted, and cries of Vive le Roi rolled forth like thunder. Andre Louis waited, and gradually the preternatural gravity of his countenance came to be observed, and to beget the suspicion that there might be more to follow. Gradually silence was restored, and at last André Louis was able to proceed. You rejoice too soon. Unfortunately, the nobles, in their insolent arrogance, have elected to ignore 
the royal dissolution, and in despite of it persist in sitting and in conducting matters as seems good to them. A silence of utter dismay greeted that disconcerting epilogue to the announcement that had been so rapturously received. André Louis continued after a moment's pause. So that these men, who were already rebels against the people, rebels against justice and equity, rebels against humanity itself, are now also rebels against their king. Sooner than yield an inch of the unconscionable privileges by which too long already they have flourished to the misery of a whole nation, they will make a mock of royal authority, hold up the king himself to contempt. They are determined to prove that there is no real sovereignty in France but the sovereignty of their own parasitic feignantis. There was a faint splutter of applause, but the majority of the audience remained silent, waiting. This is no new thing. Always has it been the same. No minister in the last ten years who, seeing the needs and perils of the state, counseled the measures that we now demand as the only means of arresting our motherland in its ever-quickening progress to the abyss, but found himself as a consequence cast out of office by the influence which privilege brought to bear against him. Twice already has Monsieur Necker been called to the ministry, to be twice dismissed when his insistent counsels of reform threatened the privileges of clergy and nobility. For the third time now he has been called to office, and at last it seems we are to have states-general in spite of privilege. But what the privileged orders can no longer prevent, they are determined to stultify. Since it is now a settled thing that these states-general are to meet, at least the nobles and the clergy will see to it, unless we take measures to prevent them, by packing the third estate with their own creatures and denying it all effective representation, they convert the states-general into an instrument of their own will for the perpetuation of abuses by which they live. To achieve this end, they will stop at nothing. They have flouted the authority of the king, and they are silencing by assassination those who raise their voices to condemn them. Yesterday in Rennes, two young men who addressed the people as I am addressing you were done to death in the streets by assassins at the instigation of the nobility. Their blood cries out for vengeance. Beginning in a sullen mutter, the indignation that moved his hearers swelled up to express itself in a roar of anger. Citizens of Nantes, the motherland is in peril. Let us march to her defense. Let us proclaim it to the world that we recognize that the measures to liberate the third estate from the slavery in which for centuries it has groaned, find only obstacles in those orders whose frenetic egotism sees in the tears and suffering of the unfortunate an odious tribute which they would pass on to their generation still unborn. Realizing from the barbarity of the means employed by our enemies to perpetuate our oppression, that we have everything to fear from the aristocracy they would set up as a constitutional principle for the governing of France, let us declare ourselves at once enfranchised from it. The establishment of liberty and equality should be the aim of every citizen member of the Third Estate, and to this end we should stand indivisibly united especially the young 
and vigorous, especially those who have had the good fortune to be born late enough to be able to gather for themselves the precious fruits of the philosophy of this eighteenth century. Acclamations broke out unstintedly now. He had caught them in the snare of his oratory, and he pressed his advantage instantly. Let us all swear, he cried in a great voice, to raise up in the name of humanity and of liberty a rampart against our enemies, to oppose to their bloodthirsty covetousness the calm perseverance of men whose cause is just. And let us protest here and in advance against any tyrannical decrees that should declare us seditious when we have none but pure and just intentions. Let us make oath upon the honor of our motherland that should any of us be seized by an unjust tribunal, intending against us one of those acts termed of political expediency which are in fact but acts of despotism. Let us swear, I say, to give a full expression to the strength that is in us, and do that in self-defense, which nature, courage, and despair dictate to us. Loud and long rolled the applause that greeted his conclusion and he observed with satisfaction, and even some inward grim amusement, that the wealthy merchants who had been congregated upon the steps, and who now came crowding about him to shake him by the hand and to acclaim him, were not merely participants in, but the actual leaders of, this delirium of enthusiasm. It confirmed him, had he needed confirmation, in his conviction that just as the philosophies upon which this new movement was based had their source in thinkers extracted from the bourgeoisie, so the need to adopt those philosophies to the practical purposes of life was most acutely felt at present by those bourgeois who found themselves debarred by privilege from the expansion their wealth permitted them. If it might be said of André Louis, that he had that day lighted the torch of the revolution in Nantes. It might, with even greater truth, be said that the torch itself was supplied by the opulent bourgeoisie. I need not dwell at any length upon the sequel. It is a matter of history how that oath which omnis omnibus administered to the citizens of Nantes formed the backbone of the formal protest which they drew up and signed in their thousands. Nor were the results of that powerful protest, which, after all, might already be said to harmonize with the expressed will of the sovereign himself, long delayed. Who shall say how far it may have strengthened the hand of Necker, when on the twenty-seventh of that same month of November he compelled the council to adopt the most significant and comprehensive of all those measures to which clergy and nobility had refused their consent. On that date was published the royal decree ordaining that the deputies to be elected to the states-general should number at least one thousand, and that the deputies of the third estate should be fully representative by numbering as many as the deputies of clergy and nobility together. End of chapter 8 Scaramouche, Book 1, Chapter 9 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Scaramouche, A Romance of the French Revolution, 
by Raphael Sabatini. Book One, Chapter Nine, The Aftermath. Dusk of the following day was falling when the homing Andre Louis approached Gavriac. Realizing fully what a hue and cry there would presently be for the apostle of revolution, who had summoned the people of Nantes to arms, he desired as far as possible to conceal the fact that he had been in that maritime city. Therefore he made a wide detour, crossing the river at Bruges, and recrossing it a little above Chavain, so as to approach Gavriac from the north, and create the impression that he was returning from Rennes, whither he was known to have gone two days ago. Within a mile or so of the village he caught, in the fading light, his first glimpse of a figure on horseback pacing slowly towards him, but it was not until they had come within a few yards of each other, and he observed that this cloaked figure was leaning forward to peer at him, that he took much notice of it, and then he found himself challenged almost at once by a woman's voice. "'It is you, André, at last!' He drew rein, mildly surprised, to be assailed by another question, impatiently, anxiously asked. "'Where have you been?' "'Where have I been, Cousin Aline? Oh, seeing the world. "'I have been patrolling this road since noon to-day, waiting for you,' she spoke breathlessly, in haste to explain. "'A troop of the Marchosé from Rennes descended upon Gavriac this morning in quest of you.' They turned the chateau and the village inside out, and at last discovered that you were due to return with a horse hired from the Breton arm. So they have taken up their quarters at the inn to wait for you. I have been here all the afternoon on the lookout to warn you against walking into that trap. My dear Aline, that I should have been the cause of so much concern and trouble. Never mind that. It is not important. On the contrary, it is the most important part of what you tell me. It is the rest that is unimportant. "'Do you realize that they have come to arrest you?' she asked him with increasing impatience. "'You are wanted for sedition, and upon a warrant from Monsieur de Lédiguier.' "'Sedition,' quoth he, and his thoughts flew to that business at Nantes. It was impossible that they could have news of it in Rennes, and acted upon it in so short a time. Yes, sedition, the sedition of that wicked speech of yours at Rennes on Wednesday. Oh, that, said he, pooh, his note of relief might have told her, had she been more attentive, that he had to fear the consequences of a greater wickedness committed since. Why, that was nothing. Nothing. I almost suspect that the real intentions of these gentlemen of the Marchaise have been misunderstood. Most probably they have come to thank me on Monsieur de Lédiguier's behalf. I restrained the people when they would have burnt the palais and himself inside it. After you had first incited them to do it, I suppose you were afraid of your work. You drew back at the last moment. But you said things of Monsieur de Lédiguier, if you are correctly reported which he will never forgive. I see, said André Louis, and he fell into thought. But Mademoiselle de Kercadio had already done what thinking was necessary, and her alert young mind had settled all that was to be done. You must not go into Gavriac, she told him, and you must get down from your horse and let me take it. I will stable it at the chateau to-night, and some time to-morrow afternoon, by when you should be well away, I will return it to the Breton arm. Oh, but that is impossible. Impossible? Why? For several reasons. One of them is that you haven't considered what will happen to you if you do such a thing. To me? Do you suppose I am afraid of that pack of oafs sent by Monsieur de Lédiguier? I have committed no sedition. But it is almost as bad to give aid to one who is wanted for the crime. That is the law. What do I care for the law? Do you imagine that the law will presume to touch me? Of course there is that. You are sheltered by one of the abuses I complained of at Rennes. I was forgetting. 
complain of it as much as you please, but meanwhile profit by it. Come, André, do as I tell you. Get down from your horse. And then, as he still hesitated, she stretched out and caught him by the arm. Her voice was vibrant with earnestness. André, you don't realize how serious is your position. If these people take you, it is almost certain that you will be hanged. Don't you realize it? You must not go to Gavriac. You must go away at once, and lie completely lost for a time until this blows over. Indeed, until my uncle can bring influence to bear to obtain your pardon, you must keep in hiding. That will be a long time, then, said André Louis. Monsieur de Kerquedieu has never cultivated friends at court. There is Monsieur de la Tour d'Azier, she reminded him, to his astonishment. That man! he cried, and then he laughed. But it was chiefly against him that I aroused the resentment of the people of Rennes. I should have known that all my speech was not reported to you. It was, and that part of it among the rest. Ah, and yet you are concerned to save me, the man who seeks the life of your future husband at the hands either of the law or of the people? Or is it, perhaps, that since you have seen his true nature revealed in the murder of poor Philippe, you have changed your views on the subject of becoming Marquise de la Tour d'Azir? You often show yourself without any faculty of deductive reasoning. Perhaps, but hardly to the extent of imagining that Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir will ever lift a finger to do as you suggest. In which, as usual, you are wrong. He will certainly do so if I ask him. If you ask him? Sheer horror rang in his voice. Why, yes. You see, I have not yet said that I will be Marquise de la Tour d'Azir. I am still considering. It is a position that has its advantages. One of them is that it ensures a suitor's complete obedience. So, so, I see the crooked logic of your mind. You might go so far as to say to him, Refuse me this, and I shall refuse to be your Marquise. You would go so far as that? At need I might. And do you not see the converse implication? Do you not see that your hands would then be tied? That you would be wanting in honour if afterwards you refused him? And do you think that I would consent to anything that could so tie your hands? Do you think I want to see you damned, Aline? Her hand fell away from his arm. Oh, you are mad! she exclaimed, quite out of patience. Possibly. But I like my madness. There is a thrill in it unknown to such sanity as yours. By your leave, Aline, I think I will ride on to Gavriac. André, you must not. It is death to you. In her alarm she backed her horse and pulled it across the road to bar his way. It was almost completely night by now, but from behind the rack of clouds overhead a crescent moon sailed out to alleviate the darkness. "'Come now,' she enjoined him. "'Be reasonable. Do as I bid you. See, there is a carriage coming up behind you. Do not let us be found here together thus.' He made up his mind quickly. He was not the man to be actuated by false heroics about dying and he had no fancy whatever for the gallows of Monsieur de Lesdiguières providing. The immediate task that he had set himself might be accomplished. He had made heard, and ringingly, the voice that Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir imagined he had silenced. But he was very far from having done with life. Aline, on one condition only. And that? That you swear to me, you will never seek the aid of Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir on my behalf. Since you insist, and as time presses, I consent. And now ride on with me as far as the lane. There is that carriage coming up. The lane to which she referred was one that branched off the road some three hundred yards nearer the village, and led straight up the hill to the chateau itself. In silence they rode together towards it, 
and together they turned into that thickly hedged and narrow bypath. At a depth of fifty yards she halted him. Now, she bade him. Obediently he swung down from his horse and surrendered the reins to her. Helene, he said, I haven't the words in which to thank you. It isn't necessary, said she. But I shall hope to repay you some day. Nor is that necessary. Could I do less than I am doing? I do not want to hear of you hanged, André. Nor does my uncle, though he is very angry with you. I suppose he is. And you can hardly be surprised. You were his delegate, his representative. He depended upon you, and you have turned your coat. He is rightly indignant, calls you a traitor, and swears that he will never speak to you again. But he doesn't want you hanged, André. Then we are agreed on that, at least, for I don't want it myself. I will make your peace with him. And now, good-bye, André. Send me a word when you are safe. She held out a hand that looked ghostly in the faint light. He took it and bore it to his lips. God bless you, Aline. She was gone, and he stood listening to the receding clopper-clop of hooves until it grew faint in the distance. Then, slowly, with shoulders hunched and head sunk on his breast, he retraced his steps to the main road, cogitating whither he should go. Quite suddenly he checked, remembering with dismay that he was almost entirely without money. In Brittany itself he knew of no dependable hiding-place, and as long as he was in Brittany his peril must remain imminent. Yet to leave the province, and to leave it as quickly as prudence dictated, horses would be necessary. And how was he to procure horses having no money beyond a single louis d'or and a few pieces of silver? There was also the fact that he was very weary. He had had little sleep since Tuesday night, and not very much then, and much of the time had been spent in the saddle. A wearing thing to one so little accustomed to long rides. Worn as he was, it was unthinkable that he should go far to-night. He might get as far as Chavain, perhaps, but there he must sup and sleep. And what then of to-morrow? Had he but thought of it before, perhaps Aline might have been able to assist him with the loan of a few louis. His first impulse now was to follow her to the chateau. But prudence dismissed the notion. Before he could reach her he must be seen by servants, and word of his presence would go forth. There was no choice for him. He must tramp as far as Chavain, find a bed there, and leave to-morrow until it dawned. On the resolve he set his face in the direction whence he had come. But again he paused. Chavain lay on the road to Rennes. To go that way was to plunge further into danger. He would strike south again. At the foot of some meadows on this side of the village there was a ferry that would put him across the river. Thus he would avoid the village, and by placing the river between himself and the immediate danger he would obtain an added sense of security. A lane turning out of the high road, a quarter of a mile this side of Gavriac, led down to that ferry. By this lane, some twenty minutes later, came André Louis with dragging feet. He avoided the little cottage of the ferryman, whose window was alight, and in the dark crept down to the boat, intending, if possible, to put himself across. He felt for the chain by which the boat was moored, and ran his fingers along this to the point where it was fastened. Here, to his dismay, he found a padlock. He stood up in the gloom and laughed silently. Of course he might have known it. The ferry was the property of Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir, and not likely to be left unfastened so that poor devils might cheat him of seigneurial dues. There being no possible alternative, he walked back to the cottage and rapped on the door. When it opened, he stood well back, and aside out of the shaft of light that issued thence. 
Fairy, he rapped out, laconically. The ferryman, a burly scoundrel well known to him, turned aside to pick up a lantern and came forth as he was bidden. As he stepped from the little porch he leveled the lantern so that its light fell on the face of this traveller. "'My God!' he ejaculated. "'You realize, I see, that I am pressed,' said André Louis, his eyes on the fellow's startled countenance. "'And well you may be with the gallows waiting for you at Rennes,' growled the ferryman. "'Since you've been so foolish as to come back to Gavriac, you had better go again as quickly as you can.' I will say nothing of having seen you. I thank you, Fresnel. Your advice accords with my intention. That is why I need the boat. Ah, that. No, said Fresnel with determination. I'll hold my peace, but it's as much as my skin's worth to help you. You need not have seen my face. Forget that you have seen it. I'll do that, monsieur. But that is all I will do. I cannot put you across the river. Then give me the key of the boat, and I will put myself across. That is the same thing. I cannot. I'll hold my tongue, but I will not. I dare not help you. André Louis looked a moment into that sullen, resolute face, and understood. This man, living under the shadow of Le Tour d'Azir, dared exercise no will that might be in conflict with the will of his dread lord. Fresnel, he said quietly, if, as you say, the gallows claim me, the thing that has brought me to this extremity arises out of the shooting of Mabby. Had not Mabby been murdered, there would have been no need for me to have raised my voice as I have done. Mabby was your friend, I think. Will you, for his sake, lend me the little help I need to save my neck? The man kept his glance averted, and the cloud of sullenness deepened on his face. I would if I dared, but I dare not. Then quite suddenly he became angry. It was as if in anger he sought support. Don't you understand that I dare not? Would you have a poor man risk his life for you? What have you or yours ever done for me that you should ask that? You do not cross to-night in my ferry. Understand that, monsieur. And go at once. Go, before I remember that it may be dangerous even to have talked to you, and not give information. Now go! He turned on his heel to re-enter his cottage, and a wave of hopelessness swept over André Louis. But in a second it was gone. The man must be compelled, and he had the means. He bethought him of a pistol pressed upon him by Le Chapelier at the moment of his leaving Rennes, a gift which at the time he had almost disdained. True, it was not loaded, and he had no ammunition. But how was Fresnel to know that? He acted quickly. As with his right hand he pulled it from his pocket, with his left he caught the ferryman by the shoulder and swung him round. "'What do you want now?' Fresnel demanded angrily. "'Haven't I told you that I—' He broke off short. The muzzle of the pistol was within a foot of his eyes. I want the key of the boat. That is all, Fresnel. And you can either give it me at once, or I'll take it after I have burnt your brains. I should regret to kill you, but I shall not hesitate. It is your life against mine, Fresnel, and you'll not find it strange that if one of us must die, I prefer that it shall be you. Fresnel dipped a hand into his pocket and fetched thence a key. He held it out to André Louis in fingers that shook, more in anger than in fear. "'I yield to violence,' he said, showing his teeth like a snarling dog. "'But don't imagine that it will greatly profit you.' André Louis took the key. His pistol remained leveled. "'You threaten me, I think,' he said. It is not difficult to read your threat. The moment I am gone, you will run to inform against me. You will set the Mère Chose on my heels to overtake me. No, no, cried the other. He perceived his peril. He read his doom in the cold, sinister note on which André Louis addressed him. 
and grew afraid. "'I swear to you, monsieur, that I have no such intention. I think I had better make quite sure of you. Oh, my God, have mercy, monsieur!' The knave was in a palsy of terror. "'I mean you no harm. I swear to heaven I mean you no harm. I will not say a word. I will not. I would rather depend upon your silence than your assurances. Still, you shall have your chance. I am a fool, perhaps, but I have a reluctance to shed blood. Go into the house, Fresnel. Go, man, I follow you. In the shabby main room of that dwelling, André Louis halted him again. Get me a length of rope, he commanded, and was readily obeyed. Five minutes later Fresnel was securely bound to a chair, and effectively silenced by a very uncomfortable gag improvised out of a block of wood and a muffler. On the threshold the departing André Louis turned. "'Good night, Fresnel,' he said. Fierce eyes glared mute hatred at him. "'It is unlikely that your ferry will be required again to-night, but someone is sure to come to your relief quite early in the morning. Until then, bear your discomfort with what fortitude you can, remembering that you have brought it entirely upon yourself by your uncharitableness. If you spend the night considering that, the lesson should not be lost upon you. By morning you may have even grown so charitable as not to know who it was that tied you up. Good night. He stepped out and closed the door. To unlock the ferry and pull himself across the swift running waters, on which the faint moonlight was making a silver ripple, were matters that engaged not more than six or seven minutes. He drove the nose of the boat through the decaying sedges that fringed the southern bank of the stream, sprang ashore, and made the little craft secure. Then, missing the footpath in the dark, he struck out across a sodden meadow in quest of the road. End of chapter 9 End of book 1 This recording by Gordon Mackenzie December 2006 Troy, Michigan Scaramouche Book 2, Chapter 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Scaramouche, A Romance of the French Revolution by Raphael Sabatini. Book 2, Chapter 1 THE TRESPASSERS Coming presently upon the Redden Road, André Louis, obeying instinct rather than reason, turned his face to the south, and plodded wearily and mechanically forward. He had no clear idea of whither he was going, or of whither he should go. All that imported at that moment was to put as great a distance as possible between Gavriac and himself. He had a vague, half-formed notion of returning to Nantes, and there, by employing the newly found weapon of his oratory, excite the people into sheltering him as the first victim of the persecution he had foreseen, and against which he had sworn them to take up arms. But the idea was one which he entertained merely as an indefinite possibility, upon which he felt no real impulse to act. Meanwhile he chuckled at the thought of Fresnel, as he had last seen him, with his muffled face and glaring eyeballs. For one who was anything but a man of action, he writes, I felt that I had acquitted myself none so badly. It is a phrase that recurs at intervals in his sketchy confessions. Constantly is he reminding you that he is a man of mental and not physical activities, and apologizing when dire necessity drives him into acts of violence. I suspect this insistence upon his philosophic detachment, for which I confess he had justification enough, 
to betray his besetting vanity. With increasing fatigue came depression and self-criticism. He had stupidly overshot his mark in insultingly denouncing M. de Lédiguier. It is much better, he says somewhere, to be wicked than to be stupid. Most of this world's misery is the fruit, not, as priests tell us, of wickedness, but of stupidity. And we know that of all stupidities he considered anger the most deplorable. Yet he had permitted himself to be angry with a creature like M. de Lédiguier, a lackey, a fribble, a nothing, despite his potentialities for evil. He could perfectly have discharged his self-imposed mission without arousing the vindictive resentment of the king's lieutenant. He beheld himself vaguely launched upon life with the riding suit in which he stood, a single louis d'or and a few pieces of silver for all capital, and a knowledge of law which had been inadequate to preserve him from the consequences of infringing it. He had, in addition, but these things that were to be the real salvation of him he did not reckon, his gift of laughter, sadly repressed of late, and the philosophic outlook and mercurial temperament which are the stock in trade of your adventurer in all ages. Meanwhile he tramped mechanically on through the night, until he felt that he could tramp no more. He had skirted the little township of Guichen, and now, within a half-mile of Guinen, and with Gavriac a good seven miles behind him, his legs refused to carry him any farther. He was midway across the vast common to the north of Guinan, when he came to a halt. He had left the road and taken heedlessly to the footpath that struck across the waste of indifferent pasture interspersed with clumps of gorse. A stone's throw away on his right the common was bordered by a thorn hedge. Beyond this loomed a tall building which he knew to be an open barn, standing on the edge of a long stretch of meadowland. That dark, silent shadow it may have been that brought him to a standstill, suggesting shelter to his subconsciousness. A moment he hesitated. Then he struck across towards a spot where a gap in the hedge was closed by a five-barred gate. He pushed the gate open, went through the gap, and stood now before the barn. It was as big as a house. It consisted of no more than a roof carried upon half a dozen tall brick pillars. But densely packed under that roof was a great stack of hay that promised a warm couch on so cold a night. Stout timbers had been built into the brick pillars, with projecting ends to serve as ladders by which the laborer might climb to pack or withdraw hay. With what little strength remained him, André Louis climbed by one of these, and landed safely at the top, where he was forced to kneel, for lack of room to stand upright. Arrived there, he removed his coat and neckcloth, his sodden boots and stockings. Next he cleared a trough for his body, and lying down in it, covered himself to the neck with the hay he had removed. Within five minutes, he was lost to all worldly cares, and soundly asleep. When next he awakened, the sun was already high in the heavens, from which he concluded that the morning was well advanced, and this before he realized quite where he was or how he came there. Then to his awakening senses came a drone of voices close at hand, to which at first he paid little heed, he was deliciously refreshed, luxuriously drowsy, and luxuriously warm. But as consciousness and memory grew more full, he raised his head clear of the hay that he might free both ears to listen, his pulses faintly quickened by the nascent fear that those voices might bode him no good. Then he caught the reassuring accents of a woman, musical and silvery, though laden with alarm. Ah, mon Dieu, Leandre, let us separate at once, if it should be my father. And upon this a man's voice broke in, calm and reassuring. 
No, no, Clemen, you are mistaken. There is no one coming. We are quite safe. Why do you start at shadows? Ah, Leandre, if he should find us here together, I tremble at the very thought. More was not needed to reassure André Louis. He had overheard enough to know that this was but the case of a pair of lovers, who, with less to fear of life, were yet, after the manner of their kind, more timid of heart than he. Curiosity drew him from his warm trough to the edge of the hay. Lying prone, he advanced his head and peered down. In the space of cropped meadow between the barn and the hedge stood a man and a woman, both young. The man was a well-set-up, comely fellow, with a fine head of chestnut hair tied in a queue by a broad bow of black satin. He was dressed with certain tawdry attempts at ostentatious embellishments, which did not prepossess one at first glance in his favour. His coat of a fashionable cut was of faded plum-coloured velvet edged with silver lace, whose glory had long since departed. He affected ruffles, but for want of starch they hung like weeping willows over his hands that were fine and delicate. His breeches were of plain black cloth, and his black stockings were of cotton, matters entirely out of harmony with his magnificent coat. His shoes, stout and serviceable, were decked with buckles of cheap, lack-luster paste. But for his engaging and ingenious countenance, André Louis must have set him down as a knight of that order which lives dishonestly by its wits. As it was, he suspended judgment whilst pushing investigation further by a study of the girl. At the outset, be it confessed, that it was a study that attracted him prodigiously. And this notwithstanding the fact that bookish and studious as were his ways, and in despite of his years, it was far from his habit to waste consideration on femininity. The child, she was no more than that, perhaps twenty at the most, possessed, in addition to the allurements of face and shape that went very near perfection, a sparkling vivacity and a grace of movement the like of which André Louis did not remember ever before to have beheld assembled in one person. And her voice, too, that musical, silvery voice that had awakened him, possessed in its exquisite modulations an allurement of its own that must have been irresistible, he thought, in the ugliest of her sex. She wore a hooded mantle of green cloth, and the hood being thrown back, her dainty head was all revealed to him. There were glints of gold struck by the morning sun from her light nut-brown hair that hung in a cluster of curls about her oval face. Her complexion was of a delicacy that he could compare only with a rose petal. He could not at that distance discern the color of her eyes, but he guessed them blue as he admired the sparkle of them under the fine, dark line of eyebrows. He could not have told you why, but he was conscious that it aggrieved him to find her so intimate with this pretty young fellow, who was partly clad, as it appeared, in the cast-offs of a nobleman. He could not guess her station, but the speech that reached him was cultured in tone and word. He strained to listen. I shall know no peace, Leandre, until we are safely wed, she was saying. Not until then shall I count myself beyond his reach. And yet if we marry without his consent, we but make trouble for ourselves, and of gaining his consent I almost despair. Evidently, thought André Louis, her father was a man of sense, who saw through the shabby finery of Monsieur Leandre, and was not to be dazzled by cheap paste buckles. "'My dear Clemen,' the young man was answering her, standing squarely before her and holding both her hands, "'you are wrong to despond. 
if I do not reveal to you all the stratagem that I have prepared to win the consent of your unnatural parent. It is because I am loath to rob you of the pleasure of the surprise that is in store. But place your faith in me, and in that ingenious friend of whom I have spoken, and who should be here at any moment. The stilted ass! Had he learnt that speech by heart in advance, or was he by nature a pedantic idiot, who expressed himself in this set and formal manner? How came so sweet a blossom to waste her perfume on such a prig? And what a ridiculous name the creature owned! Thus André Louis to himself from his observatory. Meanwhile she was speaking. That is what my heart desires, Leandre but I am beset by fears lest your stratagem should be too late. I am to marry this horrible Marquis of Sabrufadeli this very day. He arrives by noon. He comes to sign the contract to make me Marchioness of Sabrufadeli. Oh! It was a cry of pain from that tender young heart. The very name burns my lips. If it were mine, I could never utter it. Never! The man is so detestable. Save me, Leandre, save me. You are my only hope. André Louis was conscious of a pang of disappointment. She failed to soar to the heights he had expected of her. She was evidently infected by the stilted manner of her ridiculous lover. There was an atrocious lack of sincerity about her words. They touched his mind but left his heart unmoved. Perhaps this was because of his antipathy to Monsieur Leandre, and to the issue involved. So, her father was marrying her to a marquis. That implied birth on her side. And yet she was content to pair off with his dull young adventurer in the tarnished lace. It was, he supposed, the sort of thing to be expected of a sex that all philosophy had taught him to regard as the maddest part of a mad species. "'It shall never be,' Monsieur Leandre was storming passionately. "'Never! I swear it!' And he shook his puny fist at the blue vault of heaven, Ajax defying Jupiter. "'Ah! But here comes our subtle friend!' André Louis did not catch the name, Monsieur Leandre having at that moment turned to face the gap in the hedge. He will bring us news, I know. André Louis looked also in the direction of the gap. Through it emerged a lean, slight man in a rusty cloak, and a three-cornered hat worn well down over his nose so as to shade his face. And when presently he doffed this hat and made a sweeping bow to the young lovers, André Louis confessed to himself that had he been cursed with such a hang-dog countenance, he would have worn his hat in precisely such a manner, so as to conceal as much of it as possible. If Monsieur Leandre appeared to be wearing, in part at least, the cast-offs of a nobleman, the newcomer appeared to be wearing the cast-offs of Monsieur Leandre. Yet, despite his vile clothes and viler face, with its three days' growth of beard, the fellow carried himself with a certain air. He positively strutted as he advanced, and he made a leg in a manner that was courtly and practised. Monsieur, said he, with the air of a conspirator, the time for action has arrived, and so has the Marquis. That is why. The young lovers sprang apart in consternation. Clemen, with clasped hands, parted lips, and a bosom that raced distractingly under its white fichu monture. Monsieur Leandre agape, the very picture of foolishness and dismay. Meanwhile the newcomer rattled on. I was at the inn an hour ago, when he descended there, and I studied him attentively whilst he was at breakfast. Having done so, not a single doubt remains me of our success. As for what he looks like, I could entertain you at length upon the fashion in which nature has designed his gross fatuity, but that is no matter. We are concerned with what he is, and with the wit of him. And I tell you confidently, 
that I find him so dull and stupid that you may be confident he will tumble headlong into each and all of the traps I have so cunningly prepared for him. Tell me, tell me, speak, Clemen implored him, holding out her hands in a supplication no man of sensibility could have resisted. And then, on the instant, she caught her breath on a faint scream. My father! she exclaimed turning distractedly from one to the other of the two. He is coming! We are lost! You must fly, Clemen, said Monsieur Leandre. Too late! she sobbed. Too late! He is here! Calm, mademoiselle, calm! the subtle friend was urging her. Keep calm and trust to me. I promise you that all shall be well. Oh! cried Monsieur Leandre, limply. Say what you will, my friend. This is ruin, the end of all our hopes. Your wits will never extricate us from this. Never! Through the gap strode now an enormous man with an inflamed moon face and a great nose, decently dressed after the fashion of a solid bourgeois. There was no mistaking his anger— but the expression that it found was an amazement to André Louis. Leandre, you're an imbecile. Too much phlegm, too much phlegm. Your words wouldn't convince a ploughboy. Have you considered what they mean at all? Thus, he cried, casting his round hat from him in a broad gesture, he took his stand at Monsieur Leandre's side and repeated the very words that Leandre had lately uttered, what time the three observed him coolly and attentively. "'Oh, say what you will, my friend. This is ruin, the end of all our hopes. Your wits will never extricate us from this. Never!' A frenzy of despair vibrated in his accents. He swung again to face Monsieur Leandre. "'Thus,' he bade him contemptuously, let the passion of your hopelessness express itself in your voice. Consider that you are not asking Scaramouche here whether he has put a patch in your breeches. You are a despairing lover, expressing— He checked abruptly, startled. André Louis, suddenly realizing what was afoot and how duped he had been, had loosed his laughter. The sound of it pealing and booming uncannily under the great roof that so immediately confined him was startling to those below. The fat man was the first to recover, and he announced it after his own fashion in one of the ready sarcasms in which he habitually dealt. "'Hark!' he cried. "'The very gods laugh at you, Leandre.' Then he addressed the roof of the barn and its invisible tenant. "'Hi! You there!' André Louis revealed himself by a further protrusion of his tussled head. "'Good morning,' said he, pleasantly. Rising now on his knees, his horizon was suddenly extended to include the broad common beyond the hedge. He beheld there an enormous and very battered travelling chaise, a cart piled up with timbers, partly visible under the sheet of oiled canvas that covered them, and a sort of house on wheels equipped with a tin chimney from which the smoke was slowly curling. Three heavy Flemish horses and a couple of donkeys, all of them hobbled, were contentedly cropping the grass in the neighborhood of these vehicles. These, had he perceived them sooner, must have given him the clue to the queer scene that had been played under his eyes. Beyond the hedge other figures were moving. Three at that moment came crowding into the gap, a saucy-faced girl with a tip-tilted nose, whom he supposed to be Columbine, the Sobrette, a lean, active youngster, who must be the lackey Harlequin, and another rather loutish youth, who might be a zany or an apothecary. All this he took in at a comprehensive glance that consumed no more time than it had taken him to say good morning. To that good morning Pantaloon replied in a bellow, "'What the devil are you doing up there?' "'Precisely the same thing that you are doing down there,' was the answer. "'I am trespassing.' "'Eh?' said Pantaloon, and looked at his companions, some of the assurance beaten out of his big red face. 
although the thing was one that they did habitually, to hear it called by its proper name was disconcerting. "'Whose land is this?' he asked, with diminishing assurance. André Louis answered whilst drawing on his stockings. "'I believe it to be the property of the Marquis de la Tour d'Azir.' Well, "'That's a high-sounding name. Is the gentleman severe?' "'The gentleman,' said André Louis, "'is the devil. Or rather, I should prefer to say upon reflection that the devil is a gentleman by comparison.' "'And yet,' interposed the villainous-looking fellow who played Scaramouche, "'by your own confessing you don't hesitate yourself to trespass upon his property.' "'Ah! But then, you see, I am a lawyer, and lawyers are notoriously unable to observe the law, just as actors are notoriously unable to act. Moreover, sir, nature imposes her limits upon us, and nature conquers respect for laws, as she conquers all else. Nature conquered me last night, when I had got as far as this, and so I slept here without regard for the very high and puissant Marquis de la Tour d'Azir. At the same time, Monsieur Scaramouche, You'll observe that I did not flaunt my trespass quite as openly as you and your companions. Having donned his boots, André Louis came nimbly to the ground in his shirt-sleeves, his riding-coat over his arm. As he stood there to don it, the little cunning eyes of the heavy father conned him in detail, observing that his clothes, if plain, were of a good fashion, that his shirt was of a fine cambric, and that he expressed himself like a man of culture, such as he claimed to be, M. Pantaloon was disposed to be civil. "'I am very grateful to you for the warning, sir,' he was beginning. "'Act upon it, my friend. The garde champette of M. Désir have orders to fire on trespassers. Imitate me, and decamp.' They followed him upon the instant through the gap in the hedge to the encampment on the common. There André Louis took his leave of them, but as he was turning away he perceived a young man of the company performing his morning toilet at a bucket placed upon one of the wooden steps at the tail of the house on wheels. A moment he hesitated. Then he turned frankly to Monsieur Pantaloon, who was still at his elbow. "'If it were not unconscionable to encroach so far upon your hospitality, monsieur,' said he, I would beg leave to imitate that very excellent young gentleman before I leave you. But, my dear sir, good nature oozed out of every pore of the fat body of the master player. It is nothing at all. But, by all means, Rodemont will provide what you require. He is the dandy of the company in real life, though a fire-eater on the stage. Hi, Rodemont! The young ablutionist straightened his long body from the right angle in which it had been bent over the bucket, and looked out through a foam of soap-suds. Pantaloon issued an order, and Rodemont, who was indeed as gentle and amiable off the stage as he was formidable and terrible upon it, made the stranger free of the bucket in the friendliest manner. So André Louis once more removed his neckcloth and his coat, and rolled up the sleeves of his fine shirt, whilst Rodemont procured him soap, a towel, and presently a broken comb, and even a greasy hair-ribbon, in case the gentleman should have lost his own. This last André Louis declined, but the comb he gratefully accepted, and having presently washed himself clean, stood with the towel flung over his left shoulder, restoring order to his dishevelled locks before a broken piece of mirror affixed to the door of the travelling house. He was standing thus, what time the gentle Rodemont babbled aimlessly at his side, when his ears caught the sound of hooves. He looked over his shoulder carelessly, and then stood frozen, with uplifted comb and loosened mouth. Away across the common, on the road that bordered it, he beheld a party of seven horsemen, in the blue coats with red facings, of the Mère Chausée. Not for a moment did he doubt what was the quarry of this prowling gendarmerie. It was as if the chill shadow of the gallows had fallen suddenly upon him. And then the troop halted, abreast with them, and the sergeant, leading it, 
sent his bawling voice across the common. Hi there! Hi! His tone rang with menace. Every member of the company, and there were some twelve in all, stood at gaze. Pantaloon advanced a step or two, stalking, his head thrown back, his manner that of a king's lieutenant. "'Now, what the devil's this?' quoth he, but whether of fate or heaven or the sergeant was not clear. There was a brief colloquy among the horsemen. Then they came trotting across the common straight towards the player's encampment. André Louis had remained standing at the tail of the travelling house, he was still passing the comb through his straggling hair, but mechanically and unconsciously his mind was all intent upon the advancing troop, his wits alert and gathered together for a leap in whatever direction should be indicated. Still in the distance, but evidently impatient, the sergeant bawled a question. "'Who gave you leave to encamp here?' It was a question that reassured André Louis not at all. He was not deceived by it into supposing, or even hoping, that the business of these men was merely to round up vagrants and trespassers. That was no part of their real duty. It was something done in passing, done perhaps in the hope of levying attacks of their own. It was very long odds that they were from Wren, and that their real business was the hunting down of a young lawyer charged with sedition. Meanwhile Pantaloon was shouting back, who gave us leave, do you say? What leave? This is communal land, free to all. The sergeant laughed unpleasantly, and came on, his troop following. There is, said a voice at Pantaloon's elbow, no such thing as communal land in the proper sense in all Monsieur de la Tour d'Azier's vast domain. This is terre sensive, and his bailiffs collect his dues from all who send their beasts to graze here. Pantaloon turned to behold at his side André Louis, in his shirt-sleeves, and without a neckcloth, the towel still trailing over his left shoulder, a comb in his hand, his hair half-dressed. "'God of God!' swore Pantaloon. "'But it is an ogre, this Marquis de la Tour d'Azier.' "'I have told you already what I think of him,' said André Louis. "'As for these fellows, you had better let me deal with them. I have experience of their kind.' and without waiting for Pantaloon's consent, André Louis stepped forward to meet the advancing men of the Mère Chaussée. He had realized that here boldness alone could save him. When, a moment later, the sergeant pulled up his horse alongside of this half-dressed young man, André Louis combed his hair, what time he looked up with a half-smile intended to be friendly, ingenious, and disarming. In spite of it, the sergeant hailed him gruffly. Are you the leader of this troop of vagabonds? Yes. That is to say, my father there is really the leader, and he jerked a thumb in the direction of Monsieur Pantaloon, who stood at gaze out of earshot in the background. What is your pleasure, Captain? My pleasure is to tell you that you are very likely to be jailed for this, all the pack of you. His voice was loud and bullying. It carried across the common to the ears of every member of the company, and brought them all to stricken attention where they stood. The lot of strolling players was hard enough, without the addition of jailings. But how so, my captain? This is communal land, free to all. It is nothing of the kind. Where are the fences? quoth André Louis, waving the hand that held the comb as if to indicate the openness of the place. Fences! snorted the sergeant. What have fences to do with the matter? This is terre sensive. There is no grazing here, save by payment of dues to the Marquis de la Tour d'Azier. But we are not grazing, quoth the innocent André Louis. To the devil with you, Zany! You are not grazing, but your beasts are grazing. They eat so little, André Louis apologized, and again essayed his ingratiating smile. The sergeant grew more terrible than ever. That is not the point. The point is that you are committing what amounts to a theft, and there's the jail for thieves. Technically, I suppose you are right, sighed André Louis, 
and fell to combing his hair again, still looking up into the sergeant's face. "'But we have sinned in ignorance. We are grateful to you for the warning.' He passed the comb into his left hand, and with his right fumbled in his breeches pocket, whence there came a faint jingle of coins. "'We are desolated to have brought you out of your way. Perhaps for their trouble your men would honour us by stopping at the next inn to drink the health of—of of this Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir, or any other health that they think proper. Some of the clouds lifted from the sergeant's brow, but not yet all. "'Well, well,' said he gruffly, "'but you must decamp, you understand.' He leaned from the saddle to bring his recipient hand to a convenient distance. André Louis placed in it a three-livre piece. "'In half an hour,' said André Louis. "'Why in half an hour? Why not at once?' "'Oh, but time to break our fast.' They looked at each other. The sergeant next considered the broad piece of silver in his palm. Then at last his features relaxed from their sternness. "'After all,' said he, "'it is none of our business to play the tip-staves for Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir. "'We are of the Marchosé from Rennes.' "'André Louis's eyelids played him false by flickering. "'But if you linger, look out for the guard champêtre of the Marquis. "'You'll find them not at all accommodating. "'Well, well, a good appetite to you, monsieur.' said he in valediction. "'A pleasant ride, my captain,' answered André Louis. The sergeant wheeled his horse about, his troop wheeled with him. They were starting off when he reined up again. "'You! Monsieur!' he called over his shoulder. In a bound André Louis was beside his stirrup. "'We are in quest of a scoundrel named André Louis Moreau, from Gavriac.' A fugitive from justice wanted for the gallows on a matter of sedition. You've seen nothing, I suppose, of a man whose movements seemed to you suspicious. Indeed we have, said André Louis very boldly, his face eager with consciousness of the ability to oblige. You have? cried the sergeant, in a ringing voice. Where? When? Yesterday evening, in the neighborhood of Guinen. Yes? Yes? The sergeant felt himself hot upon the trail. There was a fellow who seemed very fearful of being recognized, a man of fifty or thereabouts. Fifty! cried the sergeant, and his face fell. Bah! This man of ours is no older than yourself. A thin wisp of a fellow of about your own height and of black hair, just like your own, by the description. Keep a lookout on your travels, Master Player. The king's lieutenant in Rennes has sent us word this morning that he will pay ten louis to any one giving information that will lead to this scoundrel's arrest. So there's ten louis to be earned by keeping your eyes open and sending word to the nearest justices. It would be a fine windfall for you, that. A fine windfall indeed, Captain, answered André Louis, laughing. But the sergeant had touched his horse with the spur and was already trotting off in the wake of his men. André Louis continued to laugh, quite silently, as he sometimes did when the humour of a jest was peculiarly keen. Then he turned slowly about, and came back towards Pantaloon, and the rest of the company, who were now all grouped together at gaze. Pantaloon advanced to meet him with both hands outheld. For a moment André Louis thought he was about to be embraced. "'We hail you, our saviour. The big man declaimed. Already the shadow of the jail was creeping over us, chilling us to the very marrow. For though we be poor, yet are we all honest folk, and not one of us has ever suffered the indignity of prison, nor is there one of us who would survive it. But for you, my friend, it might have happened. What magic did you work? The magic that is to be worked in France with a king's portrait. The French are a very loyal nation. As you will have observed, they love their king and his portrait even better than himself, especially when it is wrought in gold. 
but even in silver it is respected. The sergeant was so overcome by the sight of that noble visage, on a three livre piece, that his anger vanished, and he has gone his ways, leaving us to depart in peace. Ah, true. He said we must decamp. About it, my lads, come, come. But not until after breakfast, said André Louis. A half hour for breakfast was conceded us by that loyal fellow, so deeply was he touched. True, he spoke of possible garde champêtre, but he knows as well as I do that they are not seriously to be feared, and that if they came, again the king's portrait, wrought in copper this time, would produce the same melting effect upon them. So, my dear Monsieur Pantaloon, break your fast at your ease. I can smell your cooking from here, and from the smell I argue that there is no need to wish you a good appetite. My friend, my saviour! Pantaloon flung a great arm about the young man's shoulders. You shall stay to breakfast with us. I confess to a hope that you would ask me, said André Louis. End of chapter 1 Book 2 of Scaramouche as read by Gordon Mackenzie, December 2006, Troy, Michigan. Scaramouche, Book 2, Chapter 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading is by Gordon Mackenzie. Scaramouche, a romance of the French Revolution, by Raphael Sabatini. Book Two, Chapter Two, The Service of Thespis. They were, thought Andre Louis, as he sat down to breakfast with them behind the itinerant house in the bright sunshine that tempered the cold breath of that November morning. An odd, and yet, an attractive crew. An air of gaiety pervaded them. They affected to have no cares, and made merry over the trials and tribulations of their nomadic life. They were curiously, yet amiably, artificial, histrionic in their manner of discharging the most commonplace of functions, exaggerated in their gestures, stilted and affected in their speech. They seemed, indeed, to belong to a world apart, a world of unreality which became real only on the planks of their stage, in the glare of their footlights. Good fellowship bound them one to another, and André Louis reflected cynically that this harmony among them might be the cause of their apparent unreality. In the real world, greedy striving and the emulation of acquisitiveness preclude such amity as was present here. They numbered exactly eleven. Three women and eight men, and they addressed each other by their stage names, names which denoted their several types, and never, or only very slightly, varied, no matter what might be the play that they performed. We are... Pantaloon informed him, one of those few remaining staunch bands of real players who uphold the traditions of the old Italian Commedia dell'arte. Not for us to vex our memories and stultify our wit with the stilted phrases that are the fruits of wretched authors' lucubrations. Each of us is in detail his own author in a measure as he develops the part assigned to him. We are improvisers, improvisers of the old and noble Italian school. I had guessed as much, said André Louis, when I discovered you rehearsing your improvisations. Pantaloon frowned. I have observed, young sir— that your humour inclines to the pungent, not to say the acrid. It is very well. It is, I suppose, the humour that should go with such a countenance. 
but it may lead you astray as in this instance. That rehearsal, a most unusual thing with us, was necessitated by the histrionic rawness of our Leandre. We are seeking to inculcate into him by training an art with which nature neglected to endow him against his present needs. Should he continue to fail in doing justice to our schooling, but we will not disturb our present harmony with the unpleasant anticipation of misfortunes which we still hope to avert. We love our Leandre for all his faults. Let me make you acquainted with our company. And he proceeded to introduce in detail. He pointed out the long and amiable Rodomont, whom André Louis already knew. His length of limb and hooked nose were his superficial qualifications to play roaring captains, Pantaloon explained. His lungs have justified our choice. You should hear him roar. At first we called him Spavento, or Epuvapte. But that was unworthy of so great an artist. Not since the superb Mondor amazed the world has so thrasonical a bully been seen upon the stage. So we conferred upon him the name of Rodomont, that Mondor made famous, and I give you my word as an actor and a gentleman, for I am a gentleman, monsieur, that he has justified us. His little eyes beamed in his great swollen face as he turned their gaze upon the object of his encomium, the terrible Rodomont, confused by so much praise, blushed like a schoolgirl as he met the solemn scrutiny of André Louis. Then here we have Scaramouche, whom also you already know. Sometimes he is Scapin, and sometimes Coviello. But in the main, Scaramouche, to which, let me tell you, he is best suited, sometimes too well suited, I think, for he is Scaramouche not only on the stage, but also in the world. He has a gift of sly intrigue, an art of setting folk by the ears, combined with an impudent aggressiveness upon occasion when he considers himself safe from reprisals. He is... Scaramouche, the little skirmisher, to the very life. I could say more, but I am by disposition charitable and loving to all mankind. As the priest said when he kissed the serving wench, snarled Scaramouche, and went on eating. His humor, like your own, you will observe, is acrid, said Pantaloon. He passed on. Then that rascal with the lumpy nose and the grinning bucolic countenance is, of course, Perrault. Could he be aught else? I could play lovers a deal better, said the rustic cherub. That is the delusion proper to Perrault, said Pantaloon contemptuously. This heavy, beetle-browed ruffian who has grown old in sin, and whose appetite increases with his years, is Polichinelle. Each one, as you perceive, is designed by nature for the part he plays. This nimble, freckled jackanapes is Harlequin, not your spangled Harlequin into which modern degeneracy has debased that first-born of Momus, but the genuine original zany of the Comedia, ragged and patched, an impudent, cowardly, black, guardly clown. "'Each one of us, as you perceive,' said Harlequin, mimicking the leader of the troop, "'is designed by nature for the part he plays. "'Physically, my friend, physically only, "'else we should not have so much trouble in teaching this beautiful Leandre to become a lover. "'Then we have Pasquariel here.' who is sometimes an apothecary, sometimes a notary, sometimes a lackey. An amiable, accommodating fellow. He is also an excellent cook, being a child of Italy, that land of gluttons. And finally, you have myself. 
who, as the father of the company, very properly play as pantaloon, the roles of father. Sometimes, it is true, I am a deluded husband, and sometimes an ignorant, self-sufficient doctor. But it is rarely that I find it necessary to call myself other than pantaloon. For the rest, I am the only one who has a name, a real name. It is Benet, monsieur. And now, for the ladies. First, in order of seniority, we have Madame there. He waved one of his great hands towards a buxom, smiling blonde of five and forty, who is seated on the lowest of the steps of the travelling house. She is our duenne, or mother, or nurse, as the case requires. She is known quite simply and royally as Madame. If she ever had a name in the world, she has long since forgotten it, which is perhaps as well. Then we have this pert jade with the tip-tilted nose and the wide mouth, who is, of course, our sabrette Columbine. And lastly, my daughter, Climen, an amoureuse of talents not to be matched outside the Comédie Française, of which she has the bad taste to aspire to become a member. The lovely Clemen, and lovely indeed she was, tossed her nut-brown curls and laughed as she looked across at André Louis. Her eyes, he had perceived by now, were not blue, but hazel. "'Do not believe him, monsieur. Here I am queen, and I prefer to be queen here, rather than a slave in Paris.' "'Mademoiselle,' said André Louis quite solemnly, "'will be queen wherever she condescends to reign. Her only answer was a timid and yet alluring glance from under fluttering lids. Meanwhile her father was bawling at the comely young man who played lovers. You hear, Leandre? That is the sort of speech you should practice. Leandre raised languid eyebrows. That, quoth he, and shrugged, the merest commonplace. André Louis laughed approval. Monsieur Leandre is of a readier wit than you concede. There is a subtlety in pronouncing it a commonplace to call Mademoiselle Climen a queen. Some laughed, Monsieur Benet amongst them, with good-humoured mockery. You think he has the wit to mean it thus? Bah! His subtleties are all unconscious. The conversation becoming general, André Louis soon learnt what yet there was to learn of this strolling band. They were on their way to Guichen, where they hoped to prosper at the fair that was to open on Monday next. They would make their triumphal entry into the town at noon, and setting up their stage in the old market, they would give their first performance that same Saturday night in a new canevas, or scenario, of M. Benet's own, which should set the rustics gaping. And then M. Benet fetched a sigh, and addressed himself to the elderly, swarthy, beetle-browed Polichinelle, who sat on his left. "'But we shall miss Felicien,' said he. "'Indeed, I do not know what we shall do without him. Oh, we shall contrive, said Polichinelle, with his mouth full. So you always say, whatever happens, knowing that in any case the contriving will not fall upon yourself. He should not be difficult to replace, said Harlequin. True, if we were in a civilized land— but where among the rustics of Brittany are we to find a fellow of even his poor parts? Monsieur Binet turned to André Louis. He was our property man, our machinist, our stage carpenter, our man of affairs, and occasionally he acted. The part of Figaro, I presume, said André Louis, which elicited a laugh. So... You are acquainted with Beaumarchais. 
Benet eyed the young man with fresh interest. "'He is tolerably well known, I think?' "'In Paris, to be sure, but I had not dreamt his fame had reached the wilds of Brittany.' But then I was some years in Paris, at the Lycée of Louis le Grand. It was there I made acquaintance with his work. "'A dangerous man,' said Polichinelle sententiously. "'Indeed you are right,' Pantaloon agreed. "'Clever! I do not deny him that, although myself I find little use for authors.' but of a sinister cleverness responsible for the dissemination of many of these subversive new ideas. I think such writers should be suppressed. Monsieur de la Tour d'Azur would probably agree with you. The gentleman who, by the simple exertion of his will, turns this communal land into his own property. And André Louis drained his cup, which had been filled with the poor vin gris that was the player's drink. It was a remark that might have precipitated an argument, had it not also reminded M. Benet of the terms on which they were encamped there, and of the fact that the half-hour was more than past. In a moment he was on his feet, leaping up with an agility surprising in so corpulent a man, issuing his commands like a marshal on a field of battle. "'Come! Come, my lads! Are we to sit guzzling here all day?' Time flees, and there's a deal to be done if we are to make our entry into Guichen at noon. Go, get you dressed. We strike camp in twenty minutes. Be stir, ladies, to your chaise. See that you contrive to look your best. Soon the eyes of Guichen will be upon you, and the condition of your interior tomorrow will depend upon the impression made by your exterior today. Away! Away! The implicit obedience this autocrat commanded set them in a whirl. Baskets and boxes were dragged forth to receive the platters and remains of their meagre feast. In an instant the ground was cleared, and the three ladies had taken their departure to the chaise, which was set apart for their use. The men were already climbing into the house on wheels, when Benet turned to André Louis. "'We part here, sir.' said he dramatically. The richer by your acquaintance, your debtors, and your friends. He put forth his podgy hand. Slowly, André Louis took it into his own. He had been thinking swiftly in the last few moments, and remembering the safety he had found from his pursuers in the bosom of this company. It occurred to him that nowhere could he be better hidden for the present until the quest for him should have died down. Sir, he said, the indebtedness is on my side. It is not every day one has the felicity to sit down with so illustrious and engaging a company. Benet's little eyes peered suspiciously at the young man in quest of irony. He found nothing but candor and simple good faith. I part from you reluctantly, André Louis continued the more reluctantly, since I do not perceive the absolute necessity for parting. How? quoth Benet, frowning and slowly withdrawing the hand which the other had already retained rather longer than was necessary. Thus, André Louis explained himself, you may set me down as a sort of knight of rueful countenance in quest of adventure, with no fixed purpose in life at present. You will not marvel that what I have seen of yourself and your distinguished troop should inspire me to desire your better acquaintance. On your side, you tell me that you are in need of someone to replace your Figaro, your Felicien, I think you called him. Whilst it may be presumptuous of me to hope that I could discharge an office so varied and so onerous. You are indulging that acrid humour of yours again, my friend, Benet interrupted him. Excepting for that, he added slowly, meditatively, his little eyes screwed up, we might discuss this proposal that you seem to be making. Alas, we can accept nothing. If you take me, you take me as I am, 
what else is possible? As for this humour, such as it is, which you decry, you might turn it to profitable account. How so? In several ways. I might, for instance, teach Leandre to make love. Pantaloon burst into laughter. You do not lack confidence in your powers. Modesty does not afflict you. Therefore I evince the first quality necessary in an actor. Can you act? Upon occasion, I think, said André Louis, his thoughts upon his performance at Rennes and Nantes, and wondering when in all his histrionic career Pantaloon's improvisations had so rent the heart of mobs. M. Benet was musing. "'Do you know much of the theatre? quoth he. "'Everything,' said André Louis. Mm, "'I said that modesty will prove no obstacle in your career. "'But consider. "'I know the work of Beaumarchais, Eglatine, Mercier, Chanier, "'and many others of our contemporaries. "'Then I have read, of course, Molière, Racine, Corniel, "'besides many other lesser French writers.' Of foreign authors I am intimate with the works of Gozzi, Goldoni, Guarini, Bibbiena, Machiavelli, Secchi, Tasso, Ariosto, and Fadini. Whilst of those of antiquity I know most of the work of Euripides and Aristophanes, Terence, Plautus. Enough! roared Pantaloon. I am not nearly through with my list, said André Louis. You may keep the rest for another day. In heaven's name, what can have induced you to read so many dramatic authors? In my humble way, I am a student of man. And some years ago I made the discovery that he is most intimately to be studied in the reflections of him provided for the theatre. That is a very original and profound discovery, said Pantaloon, quite seriously. It had never occurred to me. Yet... Is it true? Sir, it is a truth that dignifies our art. You are a man of parts, that is clear to me. It has been clear since first I met you. I can read a man. I knew you from the moment that you said, Good morning. Tell me now, do you think you could assist me upon occasion in the preparation of a scenario? My mind fully engaged as it is with a thousand details of organization, is not always as clear as I would have it for such work. Could you assist me there, do you think? I am quite sure I could. Hmm. Yes. I was sure you would be. The other duties that were Feliciennes you would soon learn. Well, well. If you are willing, you may come along with us. You'd want some salary, I suppose. If it is usual, said André Louis. What should you say to ten livres a month? I should say that it isn't exactly the riches of Peru. I might go as far as fifteen, said Benet, reluctantly. But times are bad. I'll make them better for you. I've no doubt you believe it. Then we understand each other? Perfectly, said André Louis, dryly, and was thus committed to the service of Thespis. End of Chapter 2 of Book 2 This reading by Gordon Mackenzie December 2006 Troy, Michigan This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. Scaramouche, Book 2, Chapter 3 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Scaramouche, a romance of the French Revolution, by Raphael Sabatini. Book Two, Chapter Three. The Comic Muse. The company's entrance into the township of Guichen, if not exactly triumphal, as Binet had expressed the desire that it should be, was at least sufficiently startling and cacophonous to set the rustics gaping. To them these fantastic creatures appeared, as indeed they were, beings from another world. First went the great travelling chaise, creaking and groaning on its way, drawn by two of the Flemish horses. It was Pantaloon who drove it, an obese and massive pantaloon, and a tight-fitting suit of scarlet under a long brown bedgown, his countenance adorned by a colossal cardboard nose. Beside him on the box sat Perrault, in a white smock, with sleeves that completely covered his hands, loose white trousers and a black skull-cap. He had whitened his face with flour, and he made hideous noises with a trumpet. On the roof of the coach were assembled Polichinelle, Scaramouche, Harlequin, and Pascariel. Polichinelle in black and white, his doublet cut in the fashion of a century ago, with humps before and behind, a white frill round his neck, and a black mask upon the upper half of his face, stood in the middle, his feet planted wide to steady him, solemnly and viciously banging a big drum. The other three were seated, each at one of the corners of the roof, their legs dangling over, Scaramouche, all in black in the Spanish fashion of the seventeenth century, his face adorned with a pair of mustachios, jangled a guitar discordantly. Harlequin, ragged and patched in every color of the rainbow, with his leather girdle and sword of lathe the upper half of his face, smeared in soot, clashed a pair of cymbals intermittently. Pascaril, as an apothecary in skull-cap and white apron, excited the hilarity of the onlookers by his enormous tin clyster, which emitted, when pumped, a dolorous squeak. Within the chaise itself, but showing themselves freely at the windows, and exchanging quips with the townsfolks, sat the three ladies of the company. Clemen, the Amoureuse, beautifully gowned in flowered satin, her own clustering ringlets concealed under a pumpkin-shaped wig, looked so much the lady of fashion that you might have wondered what she was doing in that fantastic rabble. Madame, as the mother, was also dressed with splendor, but exaggerated to achieve the ridiculous. Her headdress was a monstrous structure adorned with flowers and superimposed by little ostrich plumes. Columbine sat facing them, her back to the horses, falsely demure, in milkmaid bonnet of white muslin and a striped gown of green and blue. The marvel was that the old chaise, which in its halcyon days may have served to carry some dignitary of the church, did not founder, instead of merely groaning, under that excessive and ribald load. Next came the house on wheels, led by the long, lean Rodomont, who had daubed his face red, and increased the terror of it by a pair of formidable mustachios. He was in long thigh boots and leather jerkin, trailing an enormous sword from a crimson baldric. He wore a broad felt hat with a draggled feather, and as he advanced he raised his great voice and roared out defiance and threats of blood-curtling butchery to be performed upon all and sundry. On the roof of this vehicle sat Leandre alone. He was in blue satin, with ruffles, 
small sword, powdered hair, patches, and spyglass, and red-heeled shoes, the complete courtier, looking very handsome. The women of Guichen ogled him coquettishly. He took the ogling as a proper tribute to his personal endowments, and returned it with interest. Like Climene, he looked out of place amid the bandits who composed the remainder of the company. Bringing up the rear came André Louis, leading the two donkeys that dragged the property cart. He had insisted upon assuming a false nose, representing, as for embellishment, that which he intended for disguise. For the rest he had retained his own garments. No one paid any attention to him as he trudged along beside his donkeys, an insignificant rear-guard, which he was well content to be. They made the tour of the town, in which the activity was already above the normal in preparation for next week's fair. At intervals they halted, the cacophony would cease abruptly, and Polichinelle would announce in a stentorian voice that at five o'clock that evening in the old market Monsieur Benet's famous company of improvisers would perform a new comedy in four acts entitled The Heartless Father. Thus at last they came to the old market, which was the ground floor of the town hall, and opened to the four winds by two archways on each side of its length, and one archway on each side of its breadth. These archways, with two exceptions, had been boarded up. Through those two, which gave admission to what presently would be the theatre, the ragamuffins of the town, and the niggards who were reluctant to spend the necessary sous to obtain proper admission, might catch furtive glimpses of the performance. That afternoon was the most strenuous of André Louis's life. Unaccustomed as he was to any sort of manual labor, it was spent in erecting and preparing the stage at one end of the market hall, and he began to realize how hard-earned were to be his monthly fifteen livres. At first there were four of them to the task, or really three, for Pantaloon did no more than bawl directions. Stripped of their finery, Rodemont and Leandre assisted André Louis in that carpentering. Meanwhile the other four were at dinner with the ladies. When a half-hour or so later they came to carry on the work, André Louis and his companions went to dine in their turn, leaving Polichinelle to direct the operations as well as assist in them. They crossed the square to the cheap little inn where they had taken up their quarters. In the narrow passage André Louis came face to face with Climène, her fine feathers cast and restored by now to her normal appearance. "'And how do you like it?' she asked him pertly. He looked her in the eyes. "'It has its compensations,' quoth he, in that curious cold tone of his that left one wondering whether he meant or not what he seemed to mean. She knit her brows. "'You... you feel the need of compensations already?' "'Faith, I felt it from the beginning,' said he. "'It was the perception of them allured me. They were quite alone.' the others having gone on into the room set apart for them, where food was spread. André Louis, who was as unlearned in woman as he was learned in man, was not to know, upon feeling himself suddenly extraordinarily aware of her femininity, that it was she who in some subtle, imperceptible manner so rendered him. What? she asked him with demurest innocence. Are these compensations? He caught himself upon the brink of the abyss. Fifteen livres a month, he said, abruptly. A moment she stared at him, bewildered. He was very disconcerting. Then she recovered. Oh, and bed and board, said she. Don't be leaving that from the reckoning, as you seem to be doing, for your dinner will be going cold. Aren't you coming? Haven't you dined? he cried, and she wondered, had she caught a note of eagerness? 
No, she answered over her shoulder. I waited. What for? quoth his innocence, hopefully. I had to change, of course, zany, she answered rudely. Having dragged him as she imagined to the chopping block, she could not refrain from chopping. But then he was of those who must be chopping back. And you left your manners upstairs with your grand lady clothes, mademoiselle, I understand. A scarlet flame suffused her face. You are very insolent, she said, lamely. I have often been told so, but I don't believe it. He thrust open the door for her, and bowing with an air which imposed upon her, although it was merely copied from Fleury of the Comédie Française, so often visited in the Louis Le Grand days, he waved her in. After you, mademoiselle. For greater emphasis he deliberately broke the word into its two component parts. I thank you, monsieur, she answered frostily, as near sneering as was possible to so charming a person, and went in, nor addressed him again throughout the meal. Instead, she devoted herself with an unusual and devastating assiduity to the suspiring Leandre, that poor devil who could not successfully play the lover with her on the stage because of his longing to play it in reality. André Louis ate his herrings and black bread with a good appetite, nevertheless. It was poor fare, but then poor fare was the common lot of poor people in that winter of starvation, and since he had cast in his fortunes with a company whose affairs were not flourishing, he must accept the evils of the situation philosophically. "'Have you a name?' Benet asked him once in the course of that repast, and during a pause in the conversation. "'It happens that I have,' said he. "'I think it is Parvissimus.' Parvissimus, quoth Benet, is that a family name? In such a company, where only the leader enjoys the privilege of a family name, the like would be unbecoming its least member, so I take the name that best becomes in me, and I think it is Parvissimus, the very least. Benet was amused. It was droll. It showed a ready fancy. Oh, to be sure, they must get to work together on those scenarios. I shall prefer it to the carpentering, said André Louis. Nevertheless, he had to go back to it that afternoon, and to labor strenuously until four o'clock, when at last the autocratic Binet announced himself satisfied with the preparations, and proceeded again, with the help of André Louis, to prepare the lights, which were supplied partly by tallow candles and partly by lamps burning fish-oil. At five o'clock that evening the three knocks were sounded, and the curtain rose on the heartless father. Among the duties inherited by André Louis from the departed Felicienne, whom he replaced, was that of doorkeeper. This duty he discharged dressed in a polichinelle costume and wearing a pasteboard nose. It was an arrangement mutually agreeable to Monsieur Benet and himself. Monsieur Benet, who had taken the further precaution of retaining André Louis's own garments, was thereby protected against the risk of his latest recruit absconding with the takings. André Louis, without illusions on the score of Pantaloon's real object, agreed to it willingly enough, since it protected him from the chance of recognition by any acquaintance who might possibly be in Guichen. The performance was, in every sense, unexciting, the audience meagre and unenthusiastic. The benches provided in the front half of the market contained some twenty-seven persons, eleven at twenty sous ahead and sixteen at twelve. Behind these stood a rabble of some thirty others at six sous apiece. Thus the gross takings were two louis, ten livres, and two sous. By the time M. Benet had paid for the use of the market, his lights, and the expenses of his company at the inn over Sunday, there was not likely to be very much left towards the wages of his players. It is not surprising, therefore, that M. Benet's bonhomie 
should have been a trifle overcast that evening. "'And what do you think of it?' he asked André Louis, as they were walking back to the inn after the performance. "'Possibly it could have been worse. Probably it could not,' said he. In sheer amazement, M. Benet checked in his stride and turned to look at his companion. Huh, said he. Dieu de Dieu, but you are frank. An unpopular form of service among fools, I know. Well, I am not a fool, said Binet. That is why I am frank. I pay you the compliment of assuming intelligence in you, M. Binet. Oh, you do, quoth M. Binet. And who the devil are you to assume anything? Your assumptions are presumptuous, sir. And with that he lapsed into silence in the gloomy business of mentally casting up his accounts. But at table over supper a half hour later he revived the topic. Our latest recruit, this excellent Monsieur Parvissimus, he announced, has the impudence to tell me that possibly our comedy could have been worse, but that probably it could not. And he blew out his great round cheeks to invite a laugh at the expense of that foolish critic. That's bad, said the swarthy and sardonic Polichinelle. He was grave as Radamanthus pronouncing judgment. That's bad. But what is infinitely worse is that the audience had the impudence to be of the same mind. "'An ignorant pack of clods,' sneered Leandre, with a toss of his handsome head. "'You are wrong,' quoth Harlequin. "'You were born for love, my dear, not criticism.' Leandre, a dull dog, you will have conceived, looked contemptuously down upon the little man. "'And you, what were you born for?' he wondered. "'Nobody knows.' was the candid admission. Nor yet why. It is the case of many of us, my dear, believe me. But why? Monsieur Binet took him up, and thus spoilt the beginnings of a very pretty quarrel. Why do you say that Leandre is wrong? To be general, because he is always wrong. To be particular, because I judge the audience of Guichen to be too sophisticated for the heartless father. You would put it more happily, interposed André Louis, who was the cause of this discussion, if you said that the heartless father is too unsophisticated for the audience of Guichen. Why, what's the difference? asked Leandre. I didn't imply a difference. I merely suggested that it is a happier way to express the fact. The gentleman is being subtle, sneered Binet. Why happier? Harlequin demanded. Because it is easier to bring the heartless father to the sophistication of the Guichen audience than the Guichen audience to the unsophistication of the heartless father. Let me think that out, groaned Polichinelle, and he took his head in his hands. But from the tail of the table André Louis was challenged by Clemen, who sat there between Columbine and Madame. "'You would alter the comedy, would you, Monsieur Parvissimus?' she cried. He turned to parry her malice. "'I would suggest that it be altered,' he corrected, inclining his head. "'And how would you alter it, Monsieur?' "'I? Oh, for the better.' "'But of course.' She was sleekest sarcasm. "'And how would you do it?' Ay, tell us that, roared Monsieur Benet, and added, Silence! I pray you, gentlemen and ladies, silence for Monsieur Parvissimus. André Louis looked from father to daughter and smiled. Pardy, said he, I am between bludgeon and dagger. If I escape with my life, I shall be fortunate. Why, then, since you pin me to the very wall, I'll tell you what I should do. I should go back to the original and help myself more freely from it. The original? questioned Monsieur Binet, the author. It is called, I believe, Monsieur de Porcignac, and was written by Moliere. 
Somebody tittered, but that somebody was not Monsieur Benet. He had been touched on the raw, and the look in his little eyes betrayed the fact that his bonhomme exterior covered anything but a bonhomme. "'You charge me with plagiarism,' he said at last, "'with filching the ideas of Moliere?' "'There is always, of course,' said André Louis, unruffled, "'the alternative possibility of two great minds working upon parallel lines.' Monsieur Bonnet studied the young man attentively for a moment. He found him bland and inscrutable, and decided to pin him down. "'Then you do not imply that I have been stealing from Moliere?' "'I advise you to do so, monsieur,' was the disconcerting reply. Monsieur Benet was shocked. "'You advise me to do so? You advise me, me, Antoine Billet, to turn thief at my age?' "'He is outrageous,' said the mademoiselle indignantly. "'Outrageous is the word. I thank you for it, my dear.' I take you on trust, sir. You sit at my table. You have the honor to be included in my company. And to my face, you have the audacity to advise me to become a thief. The worst kind of thief that is conceivable. A thief of spiritual things. A thief of ideas. It is insufferable. Intolerable. I have been, I fear, deeply mistaken in you, monsieur, just as you appear to have been mistaken in me. I am not the scoundrel you suppose me, sir, and I will not number in my company a man who dares to suggest that I should become one. Outrageous! He was very angry. His voice boomed through the little room, and the company sat hushed and something scared, their eyes upon André Louis, who was the only one entirely unmoved by this outburst of virtuous indignation. "'You realize, monsieur,' he said very quietly, "'that you are insulting the memory of the illustrious dead.' Eh? said Binet. André Louis developed his sophistries. "'You insult the memory of Molière.' the greatest ornament of our stage, one of the greatest ornaments of our nation, when you suggest that there is vileness in doing that which he never hesitated to do, which no great author yet has hesitated to do. You cannot suppose that Moliere ever troubled himself to be original in the matter of ideas. You cannot suppose that the stories he tells in his plays have never been told before. They were culled as you very well know, though you seem momentarily to have forgotten it, and it is therefore necessary that I should remind you. They were culled, many of them, from the Italian authors, who themselves had culled them heavens alone knows where. Moliere took those old stories, and retold them in his own language. That is precisely what I am suggesting that you should do. Your company is a company of improvisers. You supply the dialogue as you proceed, which is rather more than Moliere ever attempted. You may, if you prefer it, though it would seem to me to be yielding to an excess of scruple, go straight to Boccaccio or Sacchetti. But even then you cannot be sure that you have reached the sources. André Louis came off with flying colors after that, you see what a debater was lost in him, how nimble he was in the art of making white look black. The company was impressed, and no one more than Monsieur Benet, who found himself supplied with a crushing argument against those who in future might tax him with the impudent plagiarisms which he undoubtedly perpetrated. He retired in the best order he could from the position he had taken up at the outset. "'So that you think,' he said, at the end of a long outburst of agreement, you think that our story of the heartless father could be enriched by dipping into Monsieur de Porcignac, 
to which I confess, upon reflection, that it may present uh, certain superficial resemblances. I do, most certainly I do, always provided that you do so judiciously. Times have changed since Moliere. It was as a consequence of this that Binet retired soon after, taking André Louis with him. The pair sat together late that night, and were again in close communion throughout the whole of Sunday morning. After dinner M. Binet read to the assembled company the amended and amplified canevas of The Heartless Father, which, acting upon the advice of M. Parvissimus, he had been at great pains to prepare. The company had few doubts as to the real authorship before he began to read, none at all when he had read. There was a verve, a grip about this story, and what was more, those of them who knew their Moliere realized that far from approaching the original more closely, this canevas had drawn farther away from it. Moliere's original part, the title role, had dwindled into insignificance to the great disgust of Polichinelle, to whom it fell, but the other parts had all been built up into importance, with the exception of Leandre, who remained as before. The two great roles were now Scaramouche, in the character of the intriguing Sebrigandini, and Pantaloon, the father. There was, too, a comical part for Rodomont, as the roaring bully hired by Polichinelle to cut Leandre into ribbons. And in view of the importance now of Scaramouche, the play had been rechristened Figaro Scaramouche. This last had not been without a deal of opposition from M. Binet. But his relentless collaborator, who was in reality the real author, drawing shamelessly but practically at last upon his great store of reading, had overborne him. "'You must move with the times, monsieur. In Paris Beaumarchais is the rage. Figaro is known to-day throughout the world. Let us borrow a little of his glory. It will draw the people in. They will come to see half a Figaro, when they will not come to see a dozen heartless fathers. Therefore let us cast the mantle of Figaro upon some one, and proclaim it in our title. But, as I am the head of the company, began M. Benet weakly, if you will be blind to your interests, you will presently be a head without a body. And what use is that? Can the shoulders of Pantaloon carry the mantle of Figaro? You laugh. Of course you laugh. The notion is absurd. The proper person for the mantle of Figaro is Scaramouche, who is naturally Figaro's twin brother. Thus tyrannized, the tyrant Binet gave way, comforted by the reflection that if he understood anything at all about the theatre, he had for fifteen livres a month acquired something that would presently be earning him as many louis. The company's reception of the canevas now confirmed him. If we accept Polichinelle, who, annoyed at having lost half his part in the alterations, declared the new scenario fatuous, Ah, you call my work fatuous, do you? Monsieur Benet hectored him. Your work, said Polichinelle, to add his tongue in his cheek. Ah, pardon, I had not realized that you were the author. Then realize it now. You were very close with Monsieur Parvissimus over this authorship, said Polichinelle, with impudent suggestiveness. And what if I was? What do you imply? That you took him to cut quills for you, of course. I'll cut your ears for you if you're not civil, stormed the infuriated Binet. Polichinelle got up slowly and stretched himself. Dieu de Dieu, said he. If Pantaloon is to play Rodomont, I think I'll leave you. He is not amusing in the part. And he swaggered out before Monsieur Binet had recovered from his speechlessness. End of Book Two, Chapter Three
as read by Gordon Mackenzie. January 2007. Troy, Michigan. Scaramouche. Book 2. Chapter 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Scaramouche. A Romance of the French Revolution. By Raphael Sabatini. Book 2. Chapter 4. Exit. Monsieur Parvissimus. At four o'clock on Monday afternoon, the curtain rose on Figaro Scaramouche to an audience that filled three-quarters of the market hall. Monsieur Benet attributed this good attendance to the influx of people to Guichen for the fair, and to the magnificent parade of his company through the streets of the township at the busiest time of the day. André Louis attributed it entirely to the title. It was the Figaro touch that had fetched in the better-class bourgeoisie, which filled more than half of the twenty-sous places and three-quarters of the twelve-sous seats. The lure had drawn them. Whether it was to continue to do so would depend upon the manner in which the canvas, over which he had labored to the glory of Binet, was interpreted by the company. Of the merits of the canvas itself he had no doubt. The authors upon whom he had drawn for the elements of it were sound, and he had taken of their best, which he claimed to be no more than the justice due to them. The company excelled itself. The audience followed with relish the sly intriguings of Scaramouche, delighted in the beauty and freshness of Clemen, was moved almost to tears by the hard fate which through four long acts kept her from the hungering arms of the so beautiful Leandre, howled its delight over the ignominy of Pantaloon, the buffooneries of his sprightly lackey Harlequin, and the thrasonical strut and bellowing fierceness of the cowardly Rodemont. The success of the Benet troupe in Guichen was assured. That night the company drank Burgundy at M. Benet's expense. The takings reached the sum of eight louis, which was as good business as M. Benet had ever done in all his career. He was very pleased. Gratification rose like steam from his fat body. He even condescended so far as to attribute a share of the credit for the success to M. Parvissimus. His suggestion, he was careful to say, by way of properly delimiting that share, was most valuable, as I perceived at the time. And his cutting of quills, growled Polichinelle, don't forget that. It is most important to have by you a man who understands how to cut a quill, as I shall remember when I turn author but not even that jibe could stir M. Benet out of his lethargy of content. On Tuesday the success was repeated artistically and augmented financially. Ten louis and seven livres was the enormous sum that André Louis, the doorkeeper, counted over to M. Benet after the performance. Never yet had M. Benet made so much money in one evening and a miserable little village like Guichen was certainly the last place in which he would have expected this windfall. Ah, but Guichen in the time of fair, André Louis reminded him. There are people here from as far as Nantes and Rennes to buy and sell. Tomorrow, being the last day of the fair, the crowds will be greater than ever. We should better this evening's receipts. Better them? I shall be quite satisfied if we do as well, my friend. You can depend upon that, André Louis assured him. Are we to have Burgundy? And then the tragedy occurred. 
it announced itself in a succession of bumps and thuds, culminating in a crash outside the door that brought them all to their feet in alarm. Perrault sprang to open and beheld the tumbled body of a man lying at the foot of the stairs. It emitted groans, therefore it was alive. Perrault went forward to turn it over and disclosed the fact that the body wore the wizened face of Scaramouche, a grimacing, groaning, twitching Scaramouche. The whole company, pressing after Perrault, abandoned itself to laughter. "'I always said you should change parts with me,' cried Harlequin. "'You're such an excellent tumbler. Have you been practicing? "'Fool!' Scaramouche snapped. "'Must you be laughing when I've all but broken my neck?' "'You are right. We ought to be weeping, because you didn't break it. "'Come, man, get up,' and he held out a hand to the prostrate rogue. Scaramouche took the hand, clutched it, heaved himself from the ground, then with a scream dropped back again. "'My foot!' he complained. Benet rolled through the group of players, scattering them to right and left. Apprehension had been quick to seize him. Fate had played him such tricks before. "'What ails your foot?' quoth he sourly. "'It's broken, I think,' Scaramouche complained. "'Broken? Bah! Get up, man!' He caught him under the armpits and hauled him up. Scaramouche came howling to one foot. The other doubled under him when he attempted to set it down, and he must have collapsed again but that Benet supported him. He filled the place with his plaint, whilst Benet swore amazingly and variedly. "'Must you bellow like a calf, you fool? Be quiet! A chair here! Someone!' A chair was thrust forward. He crushed Scaramouche down into it. "'Let us look at this foot of yours.' Heedless of Scaramouche's howls of pain, he swept away shoe and stocking. "'What ails it?' he asked, staring. "'Nothing that I can see?' He seized it, heel in one hand, instep in the other, and gyrated it. Scaramouche screamed in agony until Climène caught Benet's arm and made him stop. "'My God! Have you no feelings?' she reproved her father. "'The lad has hurt his foot. Must you torture him? Will that cure it?' "'Hurt his foot,' said Benet. "'I can see nothing the matter with his foot. Nothing to justify all this uproar. He has bruised it, maybe.' "'A man with a bruised foot doesn't scream like that,' said Madame, over Clement's shoulder. "'Perhaps he has dislocated it.' "'That is what I fear,' whimpered Scaramouche. Benet heaved himself up in disgust. "'Take him to bed,' he bade them, "'and fetch a doctor to see him.' It was done, and the doctor came. Having seen the patient, he reported that nothing very serious had happened but that in falling he had evidently sprained his foot a little. A few days' rest, and all would be well. "'A few days!' cried Benet. "'God of God! Do you mean that he can't walk?' It would be unwise, indeed impossible, for more than a few steps. Monsieur Benet paid the doctor's fee, and sat down to think. He filled himself a glass of burgundy, tossed it off without a word, and sat thereafter staring into the empty glass. "'It is, of course, the sort of thing that must always be happening to me,' he grumbled to no one in particular. The members of the company were all standing in silence before him, sharing his dismay. "'I might have known that this, or something like it, would occur to spoil the first vein of luck that I have found in years!' Ah, well, it is finished. Tomorrow we pack and depart. The best 
day of the fair on the crest of the wave of our success. A good fifteen louis to be taken, and this happens. God of God! Do you mean to abandon tomorrow's performance? All turned to stare with Benet at André Louis. Are we to play Figaro Scaramouche without Scaramouche? asked Binet, sneering. Of course not, André Louis came forward. But surely some rearrangements of the parts is possible. For instance, there is a fine actor in Polichinelle. Polichinelle swept him a bow. Overwhelmed, said he, ever sardonic. But he has a part of his own, objected Binet. A small part, which Pascarial could play. And who will play Pascarial? Nobody. We delete it. The play need not suffer. He thinks of everything, sneered Polichinelle. What a man! But Binet was far from agreement. Are you suggesting that Polichinelle should play Scaramouche? He asked incredulously. Why not? He is able enough. Overwhelmed again, interjected Polichinelle. Play Scaramouche with that figure? Binet heaved himself up to point a denunciatory finger at Polichinelle's sturdy, thick-set shortness. For lack of a better, said André Louis. Overwhelmed more than ever. Polichinelle's bow was superb at this time. Faith, I think I'll take the air to cool me after so much blushing. Go to the devil, Benet flung at him. Better and better, Polichinelle made for the door. On the threshold he halted and struck an attitude. Understand me, Benet. I do not now play Scaramouche in any circumstances whatever. And he went out. On the whole, it was a very dignified exit. André Louis shrugged, threw out his arms, and let them fall to his sides again. You have ruined everything, he told Monsieur Benet. The matter could easily have been arranged. Well, well, it is you are master here, and since you want us to pack and be off, that is what we will do, I suppose. He went out, too. Monsieur Benet stood in thought a moment, and then followed him, his little eyes very cunning. He caught him up in the doorway. Let us take a walk together, Monsieur Parvissimus, said he, very affably. He thrust his arm through André Louise and led him out into the street, where there was still considerable movement. Past the booths that ranged about the market they went, and down the hill towards the bridge. I don't think we shall pack tomorrow, said Monsieur Benet presently. In fact, we shall play tomorrow night. Not if I know Polichinelle. You have. I am not thinking of Polichinelle. Of whom, then? Of yourself. I am flattered, sir. And in what capacity are you thinking of me? There was something too sleek and oily in Benet's voice for André Louis' taste. I am thinking of you in the part of Scaramouche. Daydreams, said André Louis. You are amusing yourself, of course. Not in the least. I am quite serious. But I am not an actor. You told me that you could be? Oh, upon occasion. A small part, perhaps. Well, here is a big part. The chance to arrive at a single stride. How many men have had such a chance? It is a chance I do not covet, Monsieur Benet. Shall we change the subject? He was very frosty, as much perhaps because he scented in Monsieur Benet's manner something that was vaguely 
menacing as for any other reason. "'We'll change the subject when I please,' said M. Benet, allowing a glimpse of steel to glimmer through the silk of him. "'Tomorrow night you play Scaramouche. You are ready enough in your wits, your figure is ideal, and you have just the kind of mordant humour for the part. You should be a great success.' It is much more likely that I should be an egregious failure. "'That won't matter,' said Binet cynically, and explained himself. "'The failure will be personal to yourself. The receipts will be safe by then.' "'Much obliged,' said André Louis. "'We should take fifteen louis tomorrow night.' "'It is unfortunate that you are without a scaramouche.' said André Louis. "'It is fortunate that I have one, Monsieur Parvissimus.' André Louis disengaged his arm. "'I begin to find you tiresome,' said he. "'I think I will return.' "'A moment, Monsieur Parvissimus. "'If I am to lose that fifteen louis, you'll—' not take it amiss that I compensate myself in other ways. That is your own concern, Monsieur Benet. Pardon, Monsieur Parvissimus. It may possibly be also yours. Benet took his arm again. Do me the kindness to step across the street with me, just as far as the post office there. I have something to show you." André Louis went. Before they reached that sheet of paper nailed upon the door, he knew exactly what it would say. And in effect it was, as he had supposed, that twenty Louis would be paid for information leading to the apprehension of one André Louis Moreau, lawyer of Gavriac, who was wanted by the King's lieutenant in Rennes upon a charge of sedition. M. Benet watched him whilst he read. Their arms were linked, and Benet's grip was firm and powerful. "'Now, my friend,' said he, "'will you be M. Parvissimus and play Scaramouche tomorrow, or will you be André-Louis Moreau of Gavriac and go to Rennes to satisfy the king's lieutenant. And if it should happen that you are mistaken, quoth André Louis, his face a mask. I'll take the risk of that, leered M. Benet. You mentioned, I think, that you were a lawyer, an indiscretion, my dear. It is unlikely that two lawyers will be in hiding at the same time in the same district. You see, it is not really clever of me. Well, Monsieur André Louis Moreau, lawyer of Gavriac, what is it to be? We will talk it over as we walk back, said André Louis. What is there to talk over? One or two things, I think. I must know where I stand. Come, sir, if you please. Very well, said M. Binet, and they turned up the street again, but M. Binet maintained a firm hold of his young friend's arm, and kept himself on the alert for any tricks that the young gentleman might be disposed to play. It was an unnecessary precaution. André Louis was not the man to waste his energy futilely. He knew that in bodily strength he was no match at all for the heavy and powerful pantaloon. If I yield to your most eloquent and seductive persuasions, Monsieur Benet, said he sweetly, what guarantee do you give me that you will not sell me for twenty louis after I shall have served your turn? You have my word of honour for that, Monsieur Benet was emphatic. André Louis laughed. Oh, we are to talk of honour, are we? Really, Monsieur Benet, it is clear you think me a fool. 
In the dark he did not see the flush that leapt to Monsieur Benet's round face. It was some moments before he replied. "'Perhaps you are right,' he growled. "'What guarantee do you want?' I do not know what guarantee you can possibly give. I have said that I will keep faith with you. Until you find it more profitable to sell me. You have it in your power to make it more profitable always for me to keep faith with you. It is due to you that we have done so well in Guichen. Oh, I admit it frankly. In private, said André Louis. Monsieur Benet left the sarcasm unheeded. What you have done for us here, with Figaro Scaramouche, you can do elsewhere with other things. Naturally, I shall not want to lose you. That is your guarantee. Yet tonight you would sell me for twenty louis. Because, name of God, you enrage me by refusing me a service well within your powers. Don't you think, had I been entirely the rogue you think me, that I could have sold you on Saturday last? I want you to understand me, my dear Parvissimus. I beg that you'll not apologize. You would be more tiresome than ever. Of course you will be jibing. You never miss a chance to jibe. It'll bring you trouble before you're done with life. Come. Here we are, back at the inn, and you have not yet given me your decision. André Louis looked at him. I must yield, of course. I can't help myself. Monsieur Benet released his arm at last and slapped him heartily upon the back. Well declared, my lad. You'll never regret it. If I know anything of the theatre, I know that you have made the great decision of your life. Tomorrow night you'll thank me. Andre Louis shrugged and stepped out ahead towards the inn, but Monsieur Benet called him back. Monsieur Pavissimus. He turned. There stood the man's great bulk, the moonlight beating down upon that round, fat face of his, and he was holding out his hand. Monsieur Pavissimus. No rancor. It is a thing I do not admit into my life. You will shake hands with me, and we will forget all this. André Louis considered him a moment with disgust. He was growing angry. Then, realized this, he conceived himself ridiculous. Almost as ridiculous as that sly, scoundrelly pantaloon. He laughed and took the outstretched hand. No rancor, Monsieur Benet insisted. Oh, no rancor, said Andre Louis. End of Book Two, Chapter Four. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. January two thousand and seven. Troy, Michigan. Scaramouche. Book Two, Chapter Five. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Scaramouche, a Romance of the French Revolution, by Raphael Sabatini. Book Two, Chapter Five. Enter Scaramouche. Dressed in the close fitting suit of a bygone age, all black, from flat velvet cap to rosetted shoes, his face whitened and a slight up curled mustache glued to his upper lip. A small sword at his side and a guitar slung behind him. Scaramouche surveyed himself in a mirror, and was disposed to be sardonic, which was the proper mood for the part. He reflected that his life, which until lately had been of a stagnant, contemplative quality, 
had suddenly become excessively active. In the course of one week he had been lawyer, mob orator, outlaw, property man, and finally buffoon. Last Wednesday he had been engaged in moving an audience of Wren to anger. On this Wednesday he was to move an audience of Guichen to mirth. Then he had been concerned to draw tears. Today it was his business to provoke laughter. There was a difference, and yet there was a parallel. Then as now he had been a comedian, and the part that he had played then was, when you came to think of it, akin to the part he was to play this evening. For what had he been at Rennes but a sort of scaramouche, the little skirmisher, the astute intriguer, spattering the seed of trouble with a sly hand? The only difference lay in the fact that today he went forth under the name that properly described his type, whereas last week he had been disguised as a respectable young provincial attorney. He bowed to his reflection in the mirror. Buffoon, he apostrophized it. At last you have found yourself. At last you have come into your heritage. You should be a great success. Hearing his new name called out by Monsieur Benet, he went below to find the company assembled, and waiting in the entrance corridor of the inn. He was, of course, an object of great interest to all the company. Most critically was he conned by Monsieur Benet and Mademoiselle, by the former with gravely searching eyes, by the latter with a curl of scornful lip. "'You'll do,' Monsieur Benet commended his make-up. "'At least you look the part.' "'Unfortunately men are not always what they look.' said Clemen, acidly. "'That is a truth that does not at present apply to me,' said André Louis. "'For it is the first time in my life that I look what I am.' Mademoiselle curled her lip a little further, and turned her shoulder to him. But the others thought him very witty, probably because he was obscure. Columbine encouraged him with a friendly smile that displayed her large white teeth, and M. Benet swore yet once again that he would be a great success, since he threw himself with such spirit into the undertaking. Then, in a voice that for the moment he appeared to have borrowed from the roaring captain, M. Benet marshaled them for the short parade across to the market hall. The new Scaramouche fell into place beside Rodomont. The old one, hobbling on a crutch, had departed an hour ago to take the place of doorkeeper vacated of necessity by André Louis, so that the exchange between those two was a complete one. Headed by Polichinelle banging his great drum, and Perrault blowing his trumpet, they set out, and were duly passed in review by the ragamuffins drawn up in files to enjoy so much of the spectacle as was to be obtained for nothing. Ten minutes later the three knocks sounded, and the curtains were drawn aside to reveal a battered set that was partly garden, partly forest, in which Clemen feverishly looked for the coming of Leandre. In the wings stood the beautiful, melancholy lover, awaiting his cue, and immediately behind him the unfledged Scaramouche, who was anon to follow him. André Louis was assailed with nausea in that dread moment. He attempted to take a lightning mental review of the first act of this scenario of which he himself was the author-in-chief, but found his mind a complete blank. With perspiration starting from his skin, he stepped back to the wall, where above a dim lantern was pasted a sheet bearing the brief outline of the piece. He was still studying it, when his arm was clutched and he was pulled violently towards the wings. He had a glimpse of Pantaloon's grotesque face, its eyes blazing, and he caught a raucous growl. Clemen has spoken your cue three times already! Before he realized it, he had been bundled onto the stage, and stood there, foolishly, blinking in the glare of the footlights.
with their tin reflectors. So utterly foolish and bewildered did he look, that volley upon volley of laughter welcomed him from the audience, which this evening packed the hall from end to end. Trembling a little, his bewilderment at first increasing, he stood there to receive that rolling tribute to his absurdity. Clemen was eyeing him with expectant mockery, savoring in advance his humiliation. Leandre regarded him in consternation, whilst behind the scenes Monsieur Benet was dancing in fury. "'Name of name!' he groaned to the rather scared members of the company assembled there. "'What will happen when they discover that he isn't acting?' But they never did discover it. Scaramouche's bewildered paralysis lasted but a few seconds. He realized that he was being laughed at, and remembered that his Scaramouche was a creature to be laughed with and not at. He must save the situation, twist it to his own advantage as best he could. And now his real bewilderment and terror was succeeded by acted bewilderment and terror far more marked, but not quite so funny. He contrived to make it clearly appear that his terror was of someone off the stage. He took cover behind a painted shrub, and thence, the laughter at last beginning to subside, he addressed himself to Climen and Leandre. Forgive me, beautiful lady, if the abrupt manner of my entrance startled you. The truth is that I have never been the same since that last affair of mine with Alma Viva. My heart is not what it used to be. Down there at the end of the lane I came face to face with an elderly gentleman carrying a heavy cudgel, and a horrible thought entered my mind that it might be your father, and that our little stratagem to get you safely married might already have been betrayed to him. I think it was the cudgel put such notion in my head. Not that I am afraid. I am not really afraid of anything. But I could not help reflecting that, if it should really have been your father, and he had broken my head with his cudgel, your hopes would have perished with me. For without me, what should you have done, my poor children? A ripple of laughter from the audience had been steadily enheartening him, and helping him to recover his natural impudence. It was clear they found him comical. They were to find him far more comical than ever he had intended, and this was largely due to the fortuitous circumstance upon which he had insufficiently reckoned. The fear of recognition by someone from Gavriac or Rennes had been strong upon him. His face was sufficiently made up to baffle recognition, but there remained his voice. To dissemble this he had availed himself of the fact that Figaro was a Spaniard, and he had known a Spaniard at Louis le Grand, who spoke a fluent but most extraordinary French with grotesque excess of sibilant sounds. It was an accent that he had often imitated, as youths will imitate characteristics that excite their mirth. Opportunely he had bethought him of that Spanish student and it was upon his speech that to-night he modelled his own. The audience of Guichen found it as laughable on his lips as he and his fellows had found it formerly on the lips of that derided Spaniard. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, Binet, listening to that glib impromptu of which the scenario gave no indication, had recovered from his fears. Dieu de Dieu, he whispered, grinning. Did he do it then, on purpose? It seemed to him impossible that a man who had been so terror-stricken as he had fancied André Louis could have recovered his wits so quickly and completely. Yet the doubt remained. To resolve it after the curtain had fallen upon a first act that had gone with a verve unrivaled until this hour in the annals of the company born almost entirely upon the slim shoulders of the new Scaramouche, M. Benet bluntly questioned him. They were standing in the space that did duty as green-room. The company all assembled there, showering congratulations upon their new recruit. 
Scaramouche, a little exalted at the moment by his success, however trivial he might consider it tomorrow, took then a full revenge upon Climene for the malicious satisfaction with which she had regarded his momentary blank terror. "'I do not wonder that you ask,' said he. "'Faith, I should have warned you that I intended to do my best from the start, to put the audience in a good humour with me. Mademoiselle very nearly ruined everything by refusing to reflect any of my terror. She was not even startled. Another time, Mademoiselle, I shall give you full warning of my every intention." She crimsoned under her grease-paint. But before she could find an answer of sufficient venom, her father was rating her soundly for her stupidity, the more soundly because himself he had been deceived by Scaramouche's supreme acting. Scaramouche's success in the first act was more than confirmed as the performance proceeded. Completely master of himself by now, and stimulated as only success can stimulate, he warmed to his work. Impudent, alert, sly, graceful, he incarnated the very ideal of Scaramouche, and he helped out his own native wit by many a remembered line from Beaumarchais, thereby persuading the better informed among the audience that here indeed was something of the real Figaro and bringing them, as it were, into touch with the great world of the capital. When at last the curtain fell for the last time, it was Scaramouche who shared with Climene the honours of the evening. His name that was coupled with hers, and the calls that summoned them before the curtains. As they stepped back and the curtains screened them again from the departing audience, Monsieur Benet approached them, rubbing his fat hands softly together. This runagate young lawyer, whom chance had blown into his company, had evidently been sent by fate to make his fortune for him. The sudden success at Guichen, hitherto unrivaled, should be repeated and augmented elsewhere. There would be no more sleeping under hedges and tightening of belts. Adversity was behind him. He placed a hand upon Scaramouche's shoulder, and surveyed him with a smile whose oiliness not even his red paint and colossal false nose could dissemble. "'And what have you to say to me now?' he asked him. "'Was I wrong when I assured you that you would succeed?' Do you think I have followed my fortunes in the theatre for a lifetime without knowing a born actor when I see one? You are my discovery, Scaramouche. I have discovered you to yourself. I have set your feet upon the road to fame and fortune. I await your thanks. Scaramouche laughed at him and his laugh was not altogether pleasant. "'Always pantaloon,' said he. The great countenance became overcast. "'I see that you do not yet forgive me the little stratagem by which I forced you to do justice to yourself, ungrateful dog! As if I could have had any purpose but to make you and I have done so. Continue as you have begun, and you will end in Paris. You may yet tread the stage of the Comédie Francais, the rival of Talma, Fleury, and Dugazon. When that happens to you, perhaps you will feel the gratitude that is due to old Binet, for you will owe it all to this soft-hearted old fool." If you were as good an actor on the stage as you are in private, said Scaramouche, you would yourself have won to the Comédie Française long since. But I bear no rancor, Monsieur Benet. He laughed and put out his hand. Benet fell upon it and wrung it heartily. That at least is something, he declared. My boy, 
I have great plans for you, for us. Tomorrow we go to Moore. There is a fair there to the end of this week. Then on Monday we take our chances at Pipriac, and after that we must consider. It may be that I am about to realize the dream of my life. There must have been upwards of fifteen louis taken tonight. Where that devil is that rascal Cordemay? Cordemay was the name of the original Scaramouche, who had so unfortunately twisted his ankle. That Benet should refer to him by his secular designation was a sign that in the Benet company at least he had fallen for ever from the lofty eminence of Scaramouche. Let us go and find him, and then we'll away to the inn, and crack a bottle of the best burgundy, perhaps two bottles. But Cordemay was not readily to be found. None of the company had seen him since the close of the performance. Monsieur Benet went round to the entrance. Cordemay was not there. At first he was annoyed. Then, as he continued in vain to bawl the fellow's name, he began to grow uneasy. Lastly, when Polichinelle, who was with them, discovered Cordemay's crutch standing discarded behind the door, M. Benet became alarmed. A dreadful suspicion entered his mind. He grew visibly pale under his paint. "'But this evening he couldn't walk without the crutch!' he exclaimed. "'How, then, does he come to leave it there and take himself off?' "'Perhaps he has gone on to the inn,' suggested someone. "'But he couldn't walk without his crutch,' Monsieur Benet insisted. Nevertheless, since clearly he was not anywhere about the market hall, to the inn they all trooped, and deafened the landlady with their inquiries. "'Oh, yes, Monsieur Cordemay came in some time ago.' "'Where is he now?' "'He went away again at once. He just came for his bag.' "'For his bag?' Benet was on the point of apoplexy. "'How long ago was that?' She glanced at the timepiece on the overmantel. It would be about half an hour ago. It was a few minutes before the Ren diligence passed through. The Ren diligence? Monsieur Benet was almost inarticulate. Could he... could he walk? He asked, on a note of terrible anxiety. Walk? He ran like a hare when he left the inn. I thought myself that his agility was suspicious, seeing how lame he had been since he fell downstairs yesterday. Is anything wrong? Monsieur Benet had collapsed into a chair. He took his head in his hands and groaned. The scoundrel was shamming all the time, exclaimed Climene. His fall downstairs was a trick. He was playing for this. He has swindled us. Fifteen louis at least. Perhaps sixteen, said M. Binet. Oh, the heartless blackguard! To swindle me, who have been as a father to him, and to swindle me in such a moment! From the ranks of the silent, awe-stricken company, each member of which was wondering by how much of the loss his own meager pay would be mulcted, there came a splutter of laughter. M. Benet glared with blood-injected eyes. "'Who laughs?' he roared. "'What heartless wretch has the audacity to laugh at my misfortune?' André Louis, still in the sable glories of Scaramouche, stood forward. He was laughing still. "'It is you, is it?' You may laugh on another note, my friend, if I choose a way to recoup myself that I know of. Dullard! Scaramouche scorned him. 
rabbit-brained elephant. What if Cordemais has gone with fifteen louis? Hasn't he left you with something worth twenty times as much? M. Benet gaped, uncomprehending. You are between two wines, I think. You've been drinking, he concluded. So I have, at the fountain of Thalia. Oh, don't you see? Don't you see the treasure that Cordemais has left behind him? What has he left? A unique idea for the groundwork of a scenario. It unfolds itself all before me. I'll borrow part of the title from Moliere. We'll call it Les Forberies de Scaramouche. And if we don't leave the audience of Moore and Pipriac with sides aching from laughter, I'll play the dullard pantaloon in the future. Polichinelle smacked fist into palm. Superb, he said fiercely. To call fortune from misfortune, to turn loss into profit, that is to have genius. Scaramouche made a leg. Polichinelle... You are a fellow after my own heart. I love a man who can discern my merit. If Pantaloon had half your wit, we should have Burgundy tonight in spite of the flight of Cordemay. Burgundy! roared Monsieur Benet, and before he could get farther, Harlequin had clapped his hands together. That is the spirit, Monsieur Benet. You heard him, landlady. He called for Burgundy. I called for nothing of the kind. But you heard him, dear madam. We all heard him. The others made chorus, whilst Scaramouche smiled at him and patted his shoulder. Up, man. A little courage. Did you not say that fortune awaits us? And have we not now the wherewithal to constrain fortune? Burgundy, then, to... to toast... Les Fauberies de Scaramouche. And Monsieur Benet, who was not blind to the force of the idea, yielded, took courage, and got drunk with the rest. End of Book Two, Chapter Five. As read by Gordon Mackenzie. Scaramouche. Book Two, Chapter Six. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Scaramouche, a Romance of the French Revolution, by Raphael Sabatini. Book Two, Chapter Six. Climen. Diligent search, among the many scenarios of the improvisers which have survived their day, has failed to bring to light the scenario of Les Fourberies de Scaramouche, upon which we are told the fortunes of the Benet troupe came to be soundly established. They played it for the first time at Moore in the following week, with André Louis, who was known by now as Scaramouche to all the company and to the public alike in the title role. If he had acquitted himself well as Figaro Scaramouche, he excelled himself in the new piece, the scenario of which would appear to be very much the better of the two. After more came Pipriac, where four performances were given, two of each of the scenarios that now formed the backbone of the Benet repertoire. In both Scaramouche, who was beginning to find himself, materially improved his performances. So smoothly now did the two pieces run, that Scaramouche actually suggested to Benet that after Fougeret, which they were to visit in the following week, they should tempt fortune in a real theatre in the important town of Redon. The notion terrified Benet at first, but coming to think of it, and his ambition being fanned by André Louis, he ended by allowing himself to succumb to the temptation. It seemed to André Louis in those days that he had found his real métier. 
and not only was he beginning to like it, but actually to look forward to a career as actor-author that might indeed lead him in the end to that mecca of all comedians, the Comédie Française. And there were other possibilities. From the writing of skeleton scenarios for improvisers, he might presently pass to writing plays of dialogue, plays in the proper sense of the word, after the manner of Chenier, Eglantine, and Beaumarchais. The fact that he dreamed such dreams shows us how very kindly he had taken to the profession into which chance and M. Benet, between them, had conspired to thrust him. That he had real talent both as author and as actor I do not doubt, and I am persuaded that, had things fallen out differently, he would have won for himself a lasting place among French dramatists, and thus have fully realized that dream of his. Now, dream though it was, he did not neglect the practical side of it. You realize, he told M. Binet, that I have it in my power to make your fortune for you. He and Binet were sitting alone together in the parlor of the inn at Pipriac, drinking a very excellent bottle of Volnay. It was on the night after the fourth and last performance there of Les Furberies. The business in Pipriac had been as excellent as in Maure and Guichen. You will have gathered this from the fact that they drank Volnay. I will concede it, my dear Scaramouche, so that I may hear the sequel. I am disposed to exercise this power, if the inducement is sufficient. You will realize that for fifteen livres a month a man does not sell such exceptional gifts as mine. There is an alternative, said Monsieur Benet, darkly. There is no alternative. Don't be a fool, Benet. Benet sat up as if he had been prodded. Members of his company did not take this tone of direct rebuke with him. Anyway, I make you a present of it, Scaramouche pursued airily. Exercise it if you please. Step outside and inform the police that they can lay hands upon one André Louis Moreau but that will be the end of your fine dreams of going to Redon, and for the first time in your life playing in a real theatre. Without me you can't do it, and you know it. And I am not going to Redon or anywhere else. In fact, I am not even going to Fougere until we have an equitable arrangement. But what heat! complained Benet. And all for what? Why must you assume that I have the soul of a usurer? When our little arrangement was made, I had no idea, how could I, that you would prove as valuable to me as you are. You had but to remind me, my dear Scaramouche. I am a just man. As from today, you shall have thirty livres a month. See? I double it at once. I am a generous man. But you are not ambitious. Now listen to me a moment. And he proceeded to unfold a scheme that filled Benet with a paralyzing terror. After Redden, Nantes, he said. Nantes and the Theatre Fédot. Monsieur Benet choked in the act of drinking. The Théâtre Feydeau was sort of provincial comedy française. The great Fleury had played there to an audience as critical as any in France. The very thought of Redden, cherished as it had come to be by Monsieur Benet, gave him at moments a cramp in the stomach so dangerously ambitious did it seem to him. And Redden was a puppet show by comparison with Nantes. Yet this raw lad, whom he had picked up by chance three weeks ago, and who in that time had blossomed from a country attorney into author and actor, could talk of Nantes and the Théâtre Fédot 
without changing color. But why not Paris and the Comédie Française? wondered M. Binet with sarcasm, when at last he had got his breath. That may come later, says impudence. Eh, you've been drinking, my friend. But André Louis detailed the plan that had been forming in his mind. Fougere should be a training ground for Redden, and Redden should be a training ground for Nantes. They would stay in Redden as long as Redden would pay adequately to come and see them, working hard to perfect themselves the while. They would add three or four new players of talent to the company. He would write three or four fresh scenarios, and these should be tested and perfected until the troupe was in possession of at least half a dozen plays upon which they could depend. They would lay out a portion of their profits on better dresses and better scenery, and finally, in a couple of months' time, if all went well, they should be ready to make their real bid for fortune at Nantes. It was quite true that distinction was usually demanded of the companies appearing at the Fado, But on the other hand, Nantes had not seen a troupe of improvisers for a generation, and longer. They would be supplying a novelty to which all Nantes should flock, provided that the work were really well done. And Scaramouche undertook, pledged himself, that if matters were left in his own hands, his projected revival of the Commedia dell'arte in all its glories would exceed whatever expectations the public of Nantes might bring to the theatre. We'll talk of Paris after Nantes, he finished, supremely matter-of-fact, just as we will definitely decide on Nantes after Redden. The persuasiveness that could sway a mob ended by sweeping M. Benet off his feet. The prospect which Scaramouche unfolded, if terrifying, was also intoxicating, and as Scaramouche delivered a crushing answer to each weakening objection in a measure as it was advanced, Benet ended by promising to think the matter over. Redden will point the way, said André Louis, and I don't doubt which way Redden will point. Thus the great adventure of Redden dwindled to insignificance. Instead of a terrifying undertaking in itself, it became merely a rehearsal for something greater. In his momentary exultation, Benet proposed another bottle of Volnay. Scaramouche waited until the cork was drawn before he continued. The thing remains possible said he then, holding his glass to the light and speaking casually, as long as I am with you. Agreed, my dear Scaramouche, agreed. Our chance meeting was a fortunate thing for both of us. For both of us, said Scaramouche with stress. That is, as I would have it, so that I do not think you will surrender me just yet to the police. As if I could do such a thing. My dear Scaramouche, you amuse yourself. I beg that you will never, never allude to that little joke of mine again. It is forgotten, said André Louis. And now for the remainder of my proposal. If I am to become the architect of your fortunes, if I am to build them as I have planned them, I must also, and in the same degree, become the architect of my own. In the same degree, Monsieur Binet frowned. In the same degree. From today, if you please, we will conduct the affairs of this company in a proper manner, and we will keep account books. I am an artist, said Monsieur Binet with pride. I am not a merchant. There is a business side to your art, and that shall be conducted in the business manner. I have thought it all out for you. You shall not be troubled with details that might hinder the due exercise of your art. All that you have to do is say yes or no to my proposal. Huh? 
And the proposal is that you constitute me your partner with an equal share in the profits of your company. Pantaloon's great countenance grew pale. His little eyes widened to their fullest extent as he conned the face of his companion. Then he exploded. You are mad, of course, to make me a proposal so monstrous. It has its injustices, I admit. But I have provided for them. It would not, for instance, be fair that in addition to all that I am proposing to do for you, I should also play Scaramouche and write your scenarios without any reward outside of the half-profit which would come to me as a partner. Thus, before the profits come to be divided, there is a salary to be paid me as actor, and a small sum for each scenario with which I provide the company. That is a matter for mutual agreement. Similarly, you shall be paid a salary as pantaloon. After those expenses are cleared up, as well as all the other salaries and disbursements, the residue is the profit to be divided equally between us. It was not, as you can imagine, a proposal that Monsieur Benet would swallow at a draft. He began with a point-blank refusal to consider it. In that case, my friend, said Scaramouche, we part company at once. Tomorrow I shall bid you a reluctant farewell. Benet fell to raging. He spoke of ingratitude in feeling terms. He even permitted himself another sly allusion to that little jest of his concerning the police which he had promised never again to mention. As to that you may do as you please. Play the informer, by all means. But consider that you will just as definitely be deprived of my services, and that without me you are nothing, as you were before I joined your company. Monsieur Benet did not care what the consequences might be. A fig for the consequences. He would teach this impudent young country attorney that Monsieur Benet was not the man to be imposed upon. Scaramouche rose. Very well, said he, between indifference and resignation. As you wish. But before you act, sleep on the matter. In the cold light of morning you may see our two proposals in their proper proportions. Mine spells fortune for both of us. Yours spells ruin for both of us. Good night, Monsieur Benet. Heaven help you to a wise decision. The decision to which Monsieur Benet finally came was, naturally, the only possible in the face of so firm a resolve as that of André Louis, who held the trumps. Of course there were further discussions before all was settled, and M. Benet was brought to an agreement only after an infinity of haggling surprising in one who was an artist and not a man of business. One or two concessions were made by André Louis. He consented, for instance, to waive his claim to be paid for scenarios and he also consented that M. Benet should appoint himself a salary that was out of all proportion to his deserts. Thus in the end the matter was settled, and the announcement duly made to the assembled company. There were, of course, jealousies and resentments. But these were not deep-seated, and they were readily swallowed when it was discovered that under the new arrangement the lot of the entire company was to be materially improved from the point of view of salaries. This was a matter that had met with considerable opposition from M. Benet. But the irresistible Scaramouche swept away all objections. If we are to play at the Fado, you want a company of self-respecting comedians and not a pack of cringing starvelings. The better we pay them in reason, the more they will earn for us. Thus was conquered the company's resentment of this too swift promotion of its latest recruit. Cheerfully now, with one exception, they accepted the dominance of Scaramouche. 
a dominance soon to be so firmly established that M. Benet himself came under it. The one exception was Climene. Her failure to bring to heel this interesting young stranger, who had almost literally dropped into their midst that morning outside Guichen, had begotten in her a malice which his persistent ignoring of her had been steadily inflaming. She had remonstrated with her father when the new partnership was first formed. She had lost her temper with him and called him a fool. Whereupon Monsieur Benet, in Pantaloon's best manner, had lost his temper in his turn and boxed her ears. She piled it up to the account of Scaramouche, and spied her opportunity to pay off some of that ever-increasing score. But opportunities were few. Scaramouche was too occupied just then. During the week of preparation at Fougeray, he was hardly seen save at the performances, whilst, when once they were at Redden, he came and went like the wind between the theatre and the inn. The Redden experiment had justified itself from the first. Stimulated and encouraged by this, André Louis worked day and night during the month that they spent in that busy little town. The moment had been well chosen, for the trade in chestnuts, of which Redden is the centre, was just then at its height. And every afternoon the little theatre was packed with spectators. The fame of the troupe had gone forth, borne by the chestnut growers of the district who were bringing their wares to Redden Market, and the audiences were made up of people from the surrounding country, and from neighboring villages as far out as Allaire, saint Perriot, and St. Nicholas. To keep the business from slackening, André Louis prepared a new scenario every week. He wrote three in addition to those two with which he had already supplied the company. These were The Marriage of Pantaloon, The Shy Lover, and The Terrible Captain. Of these, the last was the greatest success. It was based upon the Miles Gloriosus of Plautus, with great opportunities for Rodemont, and a good part for Scaramouche as the roaring captain's sly lieutenant. Its success was largely due to the fact that André Louis amplified the scenario to the extent of indicating very fully in places the lines which the dialogue should follow, whilst here and there he had gone so far as to supply some of the actual dialogue to be spoken without, however, making it obligatory upon the actors to keep to the letter of it. And meanwhile, as the business prospered, he became busy with tailors improving the wardrobe of the company, which was sorely in need of improvement. He ran to earth a couple of needy artists, lured them into the company to play small parts, apothecaries and notaries, and set them to beguile their leisure in painting new scenery so as to be ready for what he called the Conquest of Nantes, which was to come in the new year. Never in his life had he worked so hard. Never in his life had he worked at all by comparison with his activities now. His fund of energy and enthusiasm was inexhaustible, like that of his good humor. He came and went, acted, wrote, conceived, directed, planned, and executed. What time M. Benet took his ease at last in comparative affluence, drank burgundy every night, ate white bread and other delicacies, and began to congratulate himself upon his astuteness in having made this industrious, tireless fellow his partner. Having discovered how idle had been his fears of performing at Redden, he now began to dismiss the terrors with which the notion of Nantes had haunted him, and his happiness was reflected throughout the ranks of his company, with the single exception always of Climene. She had ceased to sneer at Scaramouche, having realized at last that her sneers left him untouched and recoiled upon herself. Thus her almost indefinable resentment of him was increased by being stifled, until, at all costs, an outlet for it must be found. 
One day she threw herself in his way as he was leaving the theatre after the performance. The others had already gone, and she had returned upon pretense of having forgotten something. "'Will you tell me what I have done to you?' she asked him point-blank. "'Done to me, mademoiselle?' He did not understand. She made a gesture of impatience. "'Why do you hate me?' "'Hate you, mademoiselle. I do not hate anybody. It is the most stupid of all the emotions I have never hated. Not even my enemies. What Christian resignation! As for hating you, of all people, why, I consider you adorable. I envy Leandre every day of my life. I have seriously thought of setting him to play Scaramouche and playing lovers myself. I don't think you would be a success, said she. That is the only consideration that restrains me. And yet, given the inspiration that is given Leandre, it is possible that I might be convincing. Why, what inspiration do you mean? The inspiration of playing to so adorable a Clement. Her lazy eyes were now alert to search that lean face of his. "'You are laughing at me,' she said, and swept past him into the theatre on her pretended quest. There was nothing to be done with such a fellow. He was utterly without feeling. He was not a man at all. Yet when she came forth again at the end of some five minutes, she found him still lingering at the door. "'Not gone yet?' she asked him superciliously. "'I was waiting for you, mademoiselle.' You will be walking to the inn, if I might escort you. But what gallantry! What condescension! Perhaps you would prefer that I did not. How could I prefer that, Monsieur Scaramouche? Besides, we are both going the same way, and the streets are common to all. It is that I am overwhelmed by the unusual honour. He looked into her piquant little face and noted how obscured it was by its cloud of dignity. He laughed. Perhaps I feared that the honour was not sought. "'Ah, now I understand,' she cried. "'It is for me to seek these honours. I am to woo a man before he will pay me the homage of civility. It must be so, since you, who clearly know everything, have said so. It remains for me to beg your pardon for my ignorance. It amuses you to be cruel, says Scaramouche. No matter. Shall we walk? They set out together, stepping briskly to warm their blood against the wintry evening air. A while they went in silence, yet each furtively observing the other. And so, you find me cruel? She challenged him at length, thereby betraying the fact that the accusation had struck home. He looked at her with a half-smile. Will you deny it? You are the first man that ever accused me of that. I dare not suppose myself the first man to whom you have been cruel. That were an assumption too flattering to myself. I must prefer to think that others suffered in silence. Mon Dieu! Have you suffered? She was between seriousness and raillery. I placed the confession as an offering on the altar of your vanity. I should never have suspected it. How could you? Am I not what your father calls a natural actor? I was an actor long before I became Scaramouche. Therefore I have laughed. I often do when I am hurt. When you were pleased to be disdainful, I acted disdain in my turn. You acted very well, said she, without reflecting. Of course, I am an excellent actor. And why this sudden change? In response to the change in you. You have grown weary of your part of cruel madam. 
a dull part, believe me, and unworthy of your talents. Were I a woman, and had I your loveliness and your grace, Clemen, I would disdain to use them as weapons of offence. Loveliness and grace, she echoed, feigning amused surprise. But the vain baggage was mollified. When was it that you discovered this beauty and this grace, Monsieur Scaramouche? He looked at her a moment, considering the sprightly beauty of her, the adorable femininity that from the first had so irresistibly attracted him. One morning when I beheld you rehearsing a love scene with Leandre, he caught the surprise that leapt to her eyes before she veiled them under drooping lids from his questing gaze. Why, that was the first time you saw me. I had no earlier occasion to remark your charms. You ask me to believe too much, said she, but her tone was softer than he had ever known it yet. Then you'll refuse to believe me if I confess that it was this grace and beauty that determined my destiny that day by urging me to join your father's troop. At that she became a little out of breath. There was no longer any question of finding an outlet for resentment. Resentment was all forgotten. But why? With what object? With the object of asking you one day to be my wife. She halted under the shock of that, and swung round to face him. Her glance met his without shyness now. There was a hardening glitter in her eyes, a faint stir of color in her cheeks. She suspected him of an unpardonable mockery. "'You go very fast, don't you?' she asked him with heat. "'I do. Haven't you observed it? I am a man of sudden impulses. See what I have made of the Benet troop in less than a couple of months. Another might have labored for a year and not achieved the half of it. Shall I be slower in love than in work? Would it be reasonable to expect it? I have curbed and repressed myself not to scare you by precipitancy. In that I have done violence to my feelings and more than all in using the same cold aloofness with which you chose to treat me. I have waited, oh, so patiently, until you should tire of that mood of cruelty. You are an amazing man, said she, quite colorlessly. I am, he agreed with her. It is only the conviction that I am not commonplace that has permitted me to hope, as I have hoped. Mechanically, and as if by tacit consent, they resumed their walk. And I ask you to observe, he said, when you complain that I go very fast, that, after all, I have so far asked you for nothing. How? quoth she, frowning. I have merely told you of my hopes. I am not so rash as to ask at once whether I may realize them. My faith, but that is prudent, said she tartly. Of course. It was his self-possession that exasperated her, for after that she walked the short remainder of the way in silence, and so, for the moment, the matter was left just there. But that night, after they had supped, it chanced that when Climene was about to retire, he and she were alone together in the room above stairs that her father kept exclusively for his company. The Benet troupe, you see, was rising in the world. As Climene now rose to withdraw for the night, Scaramouche rose with her to light her candle. Holding it in her left hand, she offered him her right, a long, tapering white hand at the end of a softly rounded arm 
that was bare to the elbow. Good night, Scaramouche, she said, but so softly, so tenderly, that he caught his breath, and stood conning her, his dark eyes aglow. Thus a moment, then he took the tips of her fingers in his grasp, and bowing over the hand, pressed his lips upon it. Then he looked at her again. The intense femininity of her lured him on, invited him, surrendered to him. Her face was pale. There was a glitter in her eyes, a curious smile upon her parted lips, and under its fichu mentor, her bosom rose and fell to complete the betrayal of her. By the hand he continued to hold, he drew her towards him. She came unresisting. He took the candle from her and set it down on the sideboard by which she stood. The next moment her slight, lithe body was in his arms, and he was kissing her, murmuring her name as if it was a prayer. Am I cruel now? she asked him, panting. He kissed her again for only answer. You made me cruel because you would not see, she told him next in a whisper. And then the door opened, and Monsieur Benet came in to have his paternal eyes regaled by this highly indecorous behavior of his daughter. He stood at gaze, whilst they quite leisurely, and in a self-possession too complete to be natural, detached each from the other. "'And what may be the meaning of this?' demanded M. Benet, bewildered and profoundly shocked. "'Does it require explaining?' asked Scaramouche. "'Doesn't it speak for itself, eloquently?' It means that Clemen and I have taken it into our heads to be married. And doesn't it matter what I may take into my head? Of course. But you could have neither the bad taste nor the bad heart to offer any obstacle. You take that for granted? Aye, that is your way to be sure to take things for granted. But my daughter is not to be taken for granted. I have very definite views for my daughter. You have done an unworthy thing, Scaramouche. You have betrayed my trust in you. I am very angry with you. He rolled forward with his ponderous yet curiously noiseless gait. Scaramouche turned to her, smiling, and handed her the candle. If you will leave us, Clemen, I will ask your hand of your father in proper form. She vanished, a little fluttered, lovelier than ever in her mixture of confusion and timidity. Scaramouche closed the door and faced the enraged Monsieur Benet, who had flung himself into an armchair at the head of the short table, faced him with the avowed purpose of asking for Clemen's hand in proper form. And this was how he did it. Father-in-law, said he, I congratulate you. This will certainly mean the Comédie Française for Climène, and that before long, and you shall shine in the glory that she will reflect. As the father of Madame Scaramouche, you may yet be famous. Benet, his face slowly empurpling, glared at him in speechless stupefaction. His rage was the more utter from his humiliating conviction that whatever he might say or do this irresistible fellow would bend him to his will. At last speech came to him. "'You're a damned corsair!' he cried thickly, banging his ham-like fist upon the table. 
A corsair! First you sail in and plunder me of half my legitimate gains, and now you want to carry off my daughter. But I'll be damned if I'll give her to a graceless, nameless scoundrel like you, for whom the gallows are waiting already. Scaramouche pulled the bell-rope, not at all discomposed. He smiled. There was a flush on his cheeks and a gleam in his eyes. He was very pleased with the world that night. He really owed a great debt to Monsieur de Lesdiguieres. Benet, said he, forget for once that you are pantaloon, and behave as a nice, amiable father-in-law should behave when he has secured a son-in-law of exceptionable merits. We are going to have a bottle of Burgundy, at my expense, and it shall be the best bottle of Burgundy to be found in Redden. Compose yourself to do fitting honour to it. Excitations of the bile invariably impair the fine sensitiveness of the palate. End of Book Two, Chapter Six As read by Gordon Mackenzie January 2007Scaramouche, Book Two, Chapter Seven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Scaramouche, A Romance of the French Revolution, by Raphael Sabatini. Book Two, Chapter Seven. THE CONQUEST OF NANTES The Benet troupe opened in Nantes, as you may discover in surviving copies of the Courier Nantais, on the Feast of the Purification, with Les Forberies de Scaramouche. But they did not come to Nantes as hitherto they had gone to little country villages and townships, unheralded and depending entirely upon the parade of their entrance to attract attention to themselves. André Louis had borrowed from the business methods of the Comédie Française, carrying matters with a high hand entirely in his own fashion. He had ordered at Redden the printing of playbills, and four days before the company's descent upon Nantes these bills were pasted outside the Théâtre Feydeau, and elsewhere about the town, and had attracted, being still sufficiently unusual announcements at the time, considerable attention. He had entrusted the matter to one of the company's latest recruits, an intelligent young man named Basque, sending him on ahead of the company for the purpose. You may see for yourself one of these playbills in the Carnavalet Museum. It details the players by their stage names only, with the exception of Monsieur Benet and his daughter, leaving out of account that he who plays Trivelin in one piece appears as Tabarin in another. It makes the company appear to be at least half as numerous again as it really was. It announces that they will open with Les Fauberies de Scaramouche, to be followed by five other plays of which it gives the titles and by others not named, which shall also be added, should the patronage to be received in the distinguished and enlightened city of Nantes, encourage the Benet troupe to prolong its sojourn at the Théâtre Feydeau. It lays great stress upon the fact that this is a company of improvisers in the old Italian manner, the like of which has not been seen in France for half a century and it exhorts the public of Nantes not to miss this opportunity of witnessing these distinguished mimes who are reviving for them the glories of the Comédie de l'Arte. Their visit to Nantes, the announcement proceeds, is preliminary to their visit to Paris, where they intend to throw down the glove to the actors of the Comédie Française, and to show the world how superior is the art of the improviser to that of the actor who depends upon an author for what he shall say, 
and who consequently says always the same thing every time that he plays in the same piece. It is an audacious bill, and its audacity had scared M. Benet out of the little sense left him by the burgundy which in these days he could afford to abuse. He had offered the most vehement opposition. Part of this André Louis had swept aside, part he had disregarded. I admit that it is audacious, said Scaramouche, but at your time of life you should have learnt that in this world nothing succeeds like audacity. I forbid it! I absolutely forbid it! M. Benet insisted. I knew you would, just as I know that you'll be very grateful to me presently for not obeying you. You are inviting a catastrophe! I am inviting fortune. The worst catastrophe that can overtake you is to be back in the market halls of the country villages from which I rescued you. I'll have you in Paris yet, in spite of yourself. Leave this to me. And he went out to attend to the printing. Nor did his preparations end there. He wrote a piquant article on the glories of the Comédie dell'Arte, and its resurrection by the improvising troupe of the great mime Florimond Binet. Binet's name was not Florimond, it was just Pierre. But André Louis had a great sense of theatre. That article was an amplification of the stimulating matter contained in the playbills, and he persuaded Basque, who had relations in Nantes, to use all the influence he could command, and all the bribery they could afford, to get that article printed in the Courier Nantais a couple of days before the arrival of the Benet troupe. Bosque had succeeded, and considering the undoubted literary merits and intrinsic interest of the article, this is not at all surprising. And so it was upon an already expectant city that Benet and his company descended in that first week of February. M. Benet would have made his entrance in the usual manner, a full-dress parade with banging drums and crashing cymbals. But to this André Louis offered the most relentless opposition. We should but discover our poverty, said he. Instead we will creep into the city unobserved and leave ourselves to the imagination of the public. He had his way, of course. M. Benet, worn already with battling against the strong waters of this young man's will, was altogether unequal to the contest now that he found Climène in alliance with Scaramouche. Adding her insistence to his, and joining with him in reprobation of her father's sluggish and reactionary wits. Metaphorically, M. Benet threw up his arms, and cursing the day on which he had taken this young man into his troop, he allowed the current to carry him whither it would. He was persuaded that he would be drowned in the end. Meanwhile he would drown his vexation in Burgundy. At least there was abundance of Burgundy. Never in his life had he found Burgundy so plentiful. Perhaps things were not as bad as he imagined, after all. He reflected that when all was said he had to thank Scaramouche for the Burgundy. Whilst fearing the worst, he would hope for the best. And it was very much the worst that he feared as he waited in the wings when the curtain rose on that first performance of theirs at the Theatre Feydeau, to a house that was tolerably filled by a public whose curiosity the preliminary announcements had thoroughly stimulated. Although the scenario of Les Fourberies de Scaramouche has not apparently survived, yet we know from André Louis' confessions that it is opened by Polichinelle in the character of an arrogant and fiercely jealous lover shown in the act of beguiling the waiting-maid, Columbine, to play the spy upon her mistress, Climène. Beginning with cajolery, but failing in this with the saucy Columbine, 
who likes cajolers to be at least attractive, and to pay a due deference to her own very piquant charms. The fierce hump-backed scoundrel passes on to threats of the terrible vengeance he will wreak upon her if she betrays him or neglects to obey implicitly. Failing here, likewise, he finally has recourse to bribery, and after he has bled himself freely to the very expectant Columbine, he succeeds by these means in obtaining her consent to spy upon Climene, and to report to him upon her lady's conduct. The pair played the scene well together, stimulated perhaps by their very nervousness at finding themselves before so imposing an audience. Polichinelle was everything that is fierce, contemptuous, and insistent. Columbine was the essence of pert indifference under his cajolery, saucily mocking under his threats, and finally sly in extorting the very maximum when it came to accepting a bribe. Laughter rippled through the audience and promised well. But M. Benet, standing trembling in the wings, missed the great guffaws of the rustic spectators to whom he had played hitherto, and his fears steadily mounted. Then scarcely was Polichianelle departed by the door, then Scaramouche bounds in through the window. It was an effective entrance, usually performed with broad comic effect, that set the people in a roar. Not so on this occasion. Meditating in bed that morning, Scaramouche had decided to present himself in a totally different aspect. He would cut out all the broad play, all the usual clowning which had delighted their past rude audiences, and he would obtain his effects by subtlety instead. He would present a slyly humorous rogue, restrained, and of a certain dignity, wearing a countenance of complete solemnity, speaking his lines dryly, as if unconscious of the humor with which he intended to invest them. Thus, though it might take the audience longer to understand and discover him, they would like him all the better in the end. True to that resolve, he now played his part as the friend and hired ally of the lovesick Leandre, on whose behalf he came for news of Climene. Seizing the opportunity to further his own amour with Columbine, and his designs upon the money-bags of Pantaloon. Also he had taken certain liberties with the traditional costume of Scaramouche. He had caused the black doublet and breeches to be slashed with red, and the doublet to be cut more to a peak, à la Henri III. The conventional black velvet cap he had replaced by a conical hat with a turned-up brim and a tuft of feathers on the left, and he had discarded the guitar. M. Benet listened desperately for the roar of laughter that usually greeted the entrance of Scaramouche, and his dismay increased when it did not come. And then he became conscious of something alarmingly unusual in Scaramouche's manner. The sibilant foreign accent was there, but none of the broad boisterousness their audiences had loved. He wrung his hands in despair. "'It's all over,' he said. "'The fellow has ruined us. "'It serves me right for being a fool "'and allowing him to take control of everything.' "'But he was profoundly mistaken. "'He began to have an inkling of this "'when presently himself he took the stage "'and found the public attentive, "'remarked a grin of quiet appreciation "'on every upturned face. "'It was not, however, until the thunders of applause greeted the fall of the curtain on the first act, that he felt quite sure they would be allowed to escape with their lives. Had the part of Pantaloon in Les Fourberies been other than that of a blundering, timid old idiot, Benet would have ruined it by his apprehensions. As it was, those very apprehensions, magnifying as they did the hesitancy and bewilderment that were the essence of his part, contributed to the success. 
and a success it proved that more than justified all the heralding of which Scaramouche had been guilty. For Scaramouche himself, this success was not confined to the public. At the end of the play a great reception awaited him from his companions assembled in the green room of the theatre. His talent, resource, and energy had raised them in a few weeks from a pack of vagrant mountebanks to a self-respecting company of first-rate players. They acknowledged it generously in a speech entrusted to Polichinelle, adding the tribute to his genius that, as they had conquered Nantes, so would they conquer the world under his guidance. In their enthusiasm they were a little neglectful of the feelings of M. Benet. Irritated enough had he been already by the overriding of his every wish, by the consciousness of his weakness when opposed to Scaramouche. And although he had suffered the gradual process of usurpation of authority, because its every step had been attended by his own greater profit, deep down in him the resentment abode to stifle every spark of that gratitude due from him to his partner. Tonight his nerves had been on the rack, and he had suffered agonies of apprehension, for all of which he blamed Scaramouche so bitterly that not even the ultimate success, almost miraculous when all the elements are considered, could justify his partner in his eyes. And now, to find himself, in addition, ignored by this company, his own company, which he had so laboriously and slowly assembled and selected among the men of ability whom he had found here and there in the dregs of cities, was something that stirred his bile, and aroused the malevolence that never did more than slumber in him. But deeply though his rage was moved, it did not blind him to the folly of betraying it. Yet that he should assert himself in this hour was imperative, unless he were forever to become a thing of no account in this troop over which he had lorded it for long months before this interloper came amongst them to fill his purse and destroy his authority. So he stepped forward now when Polichinelle had done, his make-up assisting him to mask his bitter feelings, he professed to add his own to Polichinelle's acclamation of his dear partner. But he did it in such a manner as to make it clear that what Scaramouche had done, he had done by M. Benet's favor, and that in all M. Benet's had been the guiding hand. In associating himself with Polichinelle, he desired to thank Scaramouche, much in the manner of a lord, rendering thanks to his steward for services diligently rendered and orders scrupulously carried out. It neither deceived the troop nor mollified himself. Indeed, his consciousness of the mockery of it but increased his bitterness. But at least it saved his face and rescued him from nullity he who was their chief. To say, as I have said, that it did not deceive them, is perhaps to say too much, for it deceived them at least on the score of his feelings. They believed, after discounting the insinuations in which he took all the credit to himself, that at heart he was filled with gratitude, as they were. That belief was shared by André Louis himself who in his brief, grateful answer was very generous to M. Benet, more than endorsing the claims that M. Benet had made. And then followed from him the announcement that their success in Nantes was the sweeter to him, because it rendered almost immediately attainable the dearest wish of his heart, which was to make Clemen his wife. It was a felicity of which he was the first to acknowledge his utter unworthiness. It was to bring him into still closer relations with his good friend M. Benet, to whom he owed all that he had achieved for himself and for them. 
The announcement was joyously received, for the world of the theatre loves a lover as dearly as does the greater world. So they acclaimed the happy pair, with the exception of poor Leandre, whose eyes were more melancholy than ever. They were a happy family that night, in the upstairs room of their inn on the Quai Le Fosse, the same inn from which André Louis had set out some weeks ago to play a vastly different role before an audience of Nantes. Yet was it so different, he wondered? Had he not then been a sort of scaramouche, an intriguer glib and specious, deceiving folk, cynically misleading them with opinions that were not really his own? Was it at all surprising that he should have made so rapid and signal a success as a mime? Was not this really all that he had ever been, the thing for which nature had designed him? On the following night they played The Shy Lover to a full house, the fame of their debut having gone abroad, and the success of Monday was confirmed. On Wednesday they gave Figaro Scaramouche, and on Thursday morning the Courier Nantes came out with an article of more than a column of praise of these brilliant improvisers, for whom it claimed that they utterly put to shame the mere reciters of memorized parts. André Louis, reading the sheet at breakfast and having no delusions on the score of the falseness of that statement, laughed inwardly. The novelty of the thing and the pretentiousness in which he had swaddled it had deceived them finely. He turned to greet Binet and Climen, who entered at that moment. He waved the sheet above his head. "'It is settled,' he announced. "'We stay in Nantes until Easter.' "'Do we?' said Binet sourly. "'You settle everything, my friend.' "'Read for yourself.' and he handed him the paper. Moodily M. Benet read. He set the sheet down in silence and turned his attention to his breakfast. "'Was I justified or not?' quoth André Louis, who found M. Benet's behaviour a thought intriguing. "'In what?' "'In coming to Nantes.' "'If I had not thought so, we should not have come,' said Benet, and he began to eat." André Louis dropped the subject, wondering. After breakfast he and Clemens sallied forth to take the air upon the quays. It was a day of brilliant sunshine, and less cold than it had lately been. Columbine tactlessly joined them as they were setting out, though in this respect matters were improved a little when Harlequin came running after them and attached himself to Columbine. André Louis, stepping out ahead with Climen, spoke of the thing that was uppermost in his mind at the moment. "'Your father is behaving very oddly towards me,' said he. "'It is almost as if he had suddenly become hostile.' "'You imagine it,' said she. "'My father is very grateful to you, as we all are.' "'He is anything but grateful. He is infuriated against me. And I think I know the reason.' Don't you? Can't you guess? I can't, indeed. If you were my daughter, Clemen, which God be thanked you are not, I should feel aggrieved against the man who carried you away from me. Poor old Pantaloon. He called me a corsair when I told him that I intend to marry you. He was right. You are a bold robber, Scaramouche. It is in the character, said he. Your father believes in having his mimes play upon the stage the parts that suit their natural temperaments. Yes, you take everything you want, don't you? She looked up at him, half adoringly, half shyly. If it is possible, said he. I took his consent to our marriage by main force from him. I never waited for him to give it. When, in fact, he refused it, I just snatched it from him. And I'll defy him now to win it back from me. I think that is what he most resents. 
She laughed, and launched upon an animated answer. But he did not hear a word of it. Through the bustle of traffic on the quay, a cabriolet, the upper half of which was almost entirely made of glass, had approached them. It was drawn by two magnificent bay horses and driven by a superbly livened coachman. In the cabriolet, alone, sat a slight young girl wrapped in a lynx fur pelisse, her face of a delicate loveliness. She was leaning forward, her lips parted, her eyes devouring Scaramouche until they drew his gaze. When that happened, the shock of it brought him abruptly to a dumbfounded halt. Climen, checking in the middle of a sentence, arrested by his own sudden stopping, plucked at his sleeve. What is it, Scaramouche? But he made no attempt to answer her, and at that moment the coachman to whom the little lady had already signalled brought the carriage to a standstill beside them. Seen in the gorgeous setting of that coach with its escutcheoned panels, its portly coachman, and its white-stockinged footman, who swung instantly to earth as the vehicle stopped, its dainty occupant seemed to Climen a princess out of a fairy tale. And this princess leaned forward with eyes aglow and cheeks aflush, stretched out a choicely gloved hand to Scaramouche. André Louis, she called him. And Scaramouche took the hand of that exalted being, just as he might have taken the hand of Climen herself and with eyes that reflected the gladness of her own, and a voice that echoed the joyous surprise of hers, he addressed her familiarly by name, just as she had addressed him. Aline! End of Book Two, Chapter Seven As read by Gordon Mackenzie January, 2007《スケラムーシュ》Book Two, Chapter Eight. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie.《スケラムーシュ》A Romance of the French Revolution by Raphael Sabatini. Book Two. Chapter Eight. The Dream. The door, Aline commanded her footman, and mount here beside me, she commanded André Louis in the same breath. A moment, Aline. He turned to his companion, who was all amazement, and to Harlequin and Columbine, whom had that moment come up to share it. You permit me, Climen, said he breathlessly but it was more a statement than a question. Fortunately, you are not alone. Harlequin will take care of you. Au revoir. At dinner. With that he sprang into the cabriolet without waiting for a reply. The footman closed the door, the coachman cracked his whip, and the regal equipage rolled away along the quay, leaving the three comedians staring after it open-mouthed. Then Harlequin laughed. "'A prince in disguise, our Scaramouche,' said he. Columbine clapped her hands and flashed her strong teeth. "'But what a romance for you, Clement! How wonderful!' The frown melted from Clement's brow. Resentment changed to bewilderment. "'But who is she?' "'His sister, of course,' said Harlequin quite definitely. His sister? How do you know? I know what he will tell you on his return. But why? Because you wouldn't believe him if he said she was his mother. Following the carriage with their glance, they wandered on in the direction it had taken. And in the carriage Aline was considering André Louis with grave eyes lips slightly compressed and a tiny frown between her finely drawn eyebrows. 
"'You've taken to queer company, André,' was the first thing she said to him. "'Or else I am mistaken in thinking that your companion was Mademoiselle Binet of the Theatre Fédot?' "'You are not mistaken, but I had not imagined Mademoiselle Binet so famous already.' "'Oh, as to that,' Mademoiselle shrugged, her tone quietly scornful, and she explained— it is simply that I was at the play last night. I thought I recognized her. You were at the Fado last night? And I never saw you. Were you there, too? Was I there? he cried. And then he checked, and abruptly changed his tone. Oh, yes, I was there, he said, as commonplace as he could beset by a sudden reluctance to avow that he had so willingly descended to the depths that she must account unworthy, and grateful that his disguise of face and voice should have proved impenetrable even to one who knew him so very well. "'I understand,' said she, and compressed her lips a little more tightly. "'But what do you understand?' "'The rare attractions of Mademoiselle Binet,' Naturally you would be at the theatre. Your tone conveyed it very clearly. Do you know that you disappoint me, André? It is stupid of me, perhaps. It betrays, I suppose, my imperfect knowledge of your sex. I am aware that most young men of fashion find an irresistible attraction for creatures who parade themselves upon the stage but I did not expect you to ape the ways of a man of fashion. I was foolish enough to imagine you to be different, rather above such trivial pursuits. I conceived you something of an idealist. Sheer flattery. So I perceive. But you misled me. You talked so much morality of a kind— you made philosophy so readily that I came to be deceived. In fact, your hypocrisy was so consummate that I never suspected it. With your gift of acting, I wonder that you haven't joined Mademoiselle Binet's troupe. I have, said he. It had really become necessary to tell her, making choice of the lesser of the two evils with which she confronted him. He saw first incredulity, then consternation, and lastly disgust overspread her face. "'Of course,' said she, after a long pause, "'that would have the advantage of bringing you closer to your charmer.' That was only one of the inducements. There was another. Finding myself forced to choose between the stage and the gallows— I had the incredible weakness to prefer the former. It was utterly unworthy of a man of my lofty ideals, but what would you? Like other ideologists, I find it easier to preach than to practice. Shall I stop the carriage and remove the contamination of my disgusting person, or shall I tell you how it happened? Tell me how it happened first. Then we will decide." He told her how he met the Benet troupe, and how the men of the Mère forced upon him the discovery that in its bosom he could lie safely lost until the hue and cry had died down. The explanation dissolved her iciness. "'My poor André! Why didn't you tell me this at first? "'For one thing, you didn't give me time. For another, I feared to shock you with the spectacle of my degradation.' She took him seriously. But where was the need of it? Why did you not send us word, as I required you, of your whereabouts? I was thinking of it only yesterday. I have hesitated for several reasons. You thought it would offend us to know what you were doing? I think that I preferred to surprise you by the magnitude of my ultimate achievements. "'Oh, you are to become a great actor?' she was frankly scornful. "'That is not impossible. But I am more concerned to become a great author. 
There is no reason why you should sniff. The calling is an honourable one. All the world is proud to know such men as Beaumarchais and Chenier. And you hope to equal them? I hope to surpass them, whilst acknowledging that it was they who taught me how to walk. What did you think of the play last night? It was amusing and well-conceived. Let me present you to the author. You? But the company is one of improvisers. Even improvisers require an author to write their scenarios. That is all I write at present. Soon I shall be writing plays in the modern manner. You deceive yourself, my poor André. The piece last night would have been nothing without the players. You are fortunate in your scaramouche. In confidence, I present you to him. You! Scaramouche! You! She turned to regard him fully. He smiled his close-lipped smile that made wrinkles like gashes in his cheeks. He nodded. And I didn't recognize you. I thank you for the tribute. You imagined, of course, that I was a scene-shifter. And now that you know all about me, what of Gavriac? What of my godfather? He was well, she told him and still profoundly indignant with André Louis for his defection, whilst secretly concerned on his behalf. I shall write him to-day that I have seen you. Do so. Tell him that I am well and prospering. But say no more. Do not tell him what I am doing. He has his prejudices, too. Besides, it might not be prudent. And now the question I have been burning to ask ever since I entered your carriage. Why are you in Nantes, Aline? I am on a visit to my aunt, Madame de Sautron. It was with her that I came to the play yesterday. We have been dull at the chateau, but it will be different now. Madame, my aunt, is receiving several guests today. Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir is to be one of them. André Louis frowned and sighed. Did you ever hear, Aline, how poor Philippe de Villemarin came by his end? Yes. I was told, first by my uncle, then by Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir himself. Did not that help you to decide this marriage question? How could it? You forget that I am but a woman. You don't expect me to judge between men in matters such as these. Why not? You are well able to do so. The more since you have heard two sides. For my godfather would tell you the truth. If you cannot judge, it is that you do not wish to judge. His tone became harsh. Willfully you close your eyes to justice that might check the course of your unhealthy, unnatural ambition. Excellent! she exclaimed, and considered him with amusement and something else. Do you know that you are almost droll? You rise, unblushing from the dregs of life in which I find you, and shake off the arm of that theatre girl to come and preach to me. If these were the dregs of life, I might still speak from them to counsel you out of my respect and devotion, Aline. He was very stiff and stern. But they are not the dregs of life. Honor and virtue are possible to a theatre girl. They are impossible to a lady who sells herself to gratify ambition who for position, riches, and a great title barters herself in marriage. She looked at him breathlessly. Anger turned her pale. She reached for the cord. I think I had better let you alight, so that you may go back to practice virtue and honor with your theatre wench. You shall not speak so of her, Aline. Faith! Now we are to have heat on her behalf. You think I am too delicate? You think I should speak of her as a— 
"'If you must speak of her at all,' he interrupted hotly, "'you'll speak of her as my wife.' Amazement smothered her anger. Her pallor deepened. "'My God!' she said, and looked at him in horror. And in horror she asked him presently, "'You are married? Married to that—' "'Not yet. But I shall be, soon. And let me tell you that this girl whom you visit with your ignorant contempt is as good and pure as you are, Aline. She has wit and talent which have placed her where she is, and shall carry her a deal farther. And she has the womanliness to be guided by natural instincts in the selection of her mate. She was trembling with passion. She tugged the cord. "'You will descend this instant,' she told him fiercely, "'that you should dare to make a comparison between me and that.' "'And my wife-to-be?' he interrupted before she could speak the infamous word. He opened the door for himself without waiting for the footman and leapt down. "'My compliments,' said he, furiously, "'to the assassin you are to marry.' He slammed the door. "'Drive on,' he bade the coachman. The carriage rolled away up the Faubourg Gigan, leaving him standing where he had alighted, quivering with rage. Gradually, as he walked back to the inn, his anger cooled. Gradually, as he cooled, he perceived her point of view, and in the end forgave her. It was not her fault that she thought as she thought. Her rearing had been such as to make her look upon every actress as a trull, just as it had qualified her calmly to consider the monstrous marriage of convenience into which she was invited. He got back to the inn to find the company at table. Silence fell when he entered, so suddenly that of necessity it must be supposed he was himself the subject of the conversation. Harlequin and Columbine had spread the tale of this prince in disguise, caught up into the chariot of a princess and carried off by her, and it was a tale that had lost nothing in the telling. Climene had been silent and thoughtful, pondering what Columbine had called this romance of hers. Clearly, her Scaramouche must be vastly other than he had hitherto appeared, or else that great lady and he would never have used such familiarity with each other. Imagining him no better than she was, Climene had made him her own. And now she was to receive the reward of disinterested affection. Even old Binet's secret hostility towards André Louis melted before this astounding revelation. He had pinched his daughter's ear quite playfully. "'Ah! Ah! Trust you to have penetrated his disguise, my child!' She sank resentfully from that implication. "'But I did not. I took him for what he seemed.' Her father winked at her very solemnly and laughed. "'To be sure you did. But, like your father, who was once a gentleman, and knows the ways of gentlemen, you detected in him a subtle something different from those with whom misfortune has compelled you hitherto to herd. You knew as well as I did that he never caught that trick of haughtiness.' that grand air of command in a lawyer's musty office, and that his speech had hardly the ring or his thoughts the complexion of the bourgeois that he pretended to be. And it was shrewd of you to have made him yours. Do you know that I shall be very proud of you yet, Clemen? She moved away without answering. Her father's oiliness offended her. 
Scaramouche was clearly a great gentleman, an eccentric, if you please, but a man born, and she was to be his lady. Her father must learn to treat her differently. She looked shyly, with a new shyness, at her lover when he came into the room where they were dining. She observed for the first time that proud carriage of the head with the chin thrust forward. That was a trick of his, and she noticed with what a grace he moved, the grace of one who in youth has had his dancing masters and fencing masters. It almost hurt her when he flung himself into a chair and exchanged a quip with Harlequin in the usual manner, as with an equal. And it offended her still more that Harlequin, knowing what he now knew, should use him with the same unbecoming familiarity. End of Book Two, Chapter Eight As read by Gordon Mackenzie January 2007Scaramouche. Book Two, Chapter Nine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Scaramouche. A Romance of the French Revolution. By Raphael Sabatini. Book Two. CHAPTER Nine. THE AWAKENING "'Do you know,' said Clement, "'that I am waiting for the explanation which I think you owe me?' They were alone together, lingering still at the table to which André Louis had come belatedly, and André Louis was loading himself a pipe. Of late, since joining the Benet troupe, he had acquired the habit of smoking. The others had gone, some to take the air, and others, like Binet and Madame, because they felt that it were discreet to leave those two to the explanations that must pass. It was a feeling that André Louis did not share. He kindled a light and leisurely applied it to his pipe. A frown came to settle on his brow. Explanation? He questioned presently and looked at her. But on what score? On the score of the deception you have practiced on us, on me. I have practiced none, he assured her. You mean that you have simply kept your own counsel, and that in silence there is no deception. But it is deceitful to withhold facts concerning yourself and your true station from your future wife. You should not have pretended to be a simple country lawyer, which, of course, any one could see that you are not. It may have been very romantic, but, enfin, will you explain? I see, he said, and pulled at his pipe. But you are wrong, Clemen. I have practiced no deception. If there are things about me that I have not told you, it is that I did not account them of much importance. But I have never deceived you by pretending to be other than I am. I am neither more nor less than I have represented myself." This persistence began to annoy her, and the annoyance showed on her winsome face, colored her voice. Ha! and that fine lady of the nobility with whom you are so intimate, who carried you off in her cabriolet with so little ceremony towards myself? What is she to you?" "'A sort of sister,' said he. "'A sort of sister!' she was indignant. Harlequin foretold that you would say so, but he was amusing himself. It was not very funny. It is less funny still from you. She has a name, I suppose, this sort of sister? Certainly she has a name. She is Mademoiselle Aline de Kercadio. 
the niece of Quentin de Kercadio, Lord of Gavriac. Oh, ho! That's a sufficiently fine name for your sort of sister. What sort of sister, my friend? For the first time in their relationship he observed and deplored the taint of vulgarity, of shrewishness in her manner. It would have been more accurate in me to have said a sort of reputed left-handed cousin. A reputed left-handed cousin! And what sort of relationship may that be? Faith, you dazzle me with your lucidity! It requires to be explained. That is what I have been telling you, but you seem very reluctant with your explanations. Oh, no. It is only that they are so unimportant. But be you the judge. Her uncle, Monsieur de Kercadio, is my godfather, and she and I have been playmates from infancy as a consequence. It is popularly believed in Gavriac that Monsieur de Kercadio is my father. He has certainly cared for my rearing from my tenderest years, and it is entirely owing to him that I was educated at Louis le Grand. I owe to him everything I have, or rather, everything that I had, for of my own free will I have cut myself adrift, and today I possess nothing save what I can earn for myself in the theatre or elsewhere. She sat stunned and pale under that cruel blow to her swelling pride. Had he told her this but yesterday, it would have made no impression upon her, it would have mattered not at all. The event of today coming as a sequel would but have enhanced him in her eyes. But coming now, after her imagination had woven for him so magnificent a background, after the rashly assumed discovery of his splendid identity had made her the envied of all the company, after having been in her own eyes and theirs, enshrined by marriage with him as a great lady, this disclosure crushed and humiliated her. Her prince in disguise was merely the outcast bastard of a country gentleman, she would be the laughing-stock of every member of her father's troop. Of all those who had so lately envied her this romantic good fortune. You should have told me this before, she said in a dull voice that she strove to render steady. Perhaps I should. But does it really matter? Matter? She suppressed her fury to ask another question. You say that this Monsieur de Kercadio is popularly believed to be your father. What precisely do you mean? Just that? It is a belief that I do not share. It is a matter of instinct, perhaps, with me. Moreover, once I asked Monsieur de Kercadio point-blank, and I received from him a denial. It is not perhaps a denial to which one would attach too much importance in all the circumstances. Yet I have never known M. de Kercadio for other than a man of strictest honour, and I should hesitate to disbelieve him, particularly when his statement leaps with my own instincts. He assured me that he did not know who my father was. And your mother? Was she equally ignorant? She was sneering, but he did not remark it. Her back was to the light. He would not disclose her name to me. He confessed her to be a dear friend of his. She startled him by laughing, and her laugh was not pleasant. A very dear friend, you may be sure, you simpleton. What name do you bear? He restrained his own rising indignation to answer her questions calmly. Moreau, it was given me, so I am told, from the Brittany village in which I was born. But I have no claim to it. 
In fact, I have no name, unless it be Scaramouche, to which I have earned a title. So that you see, my dear, he ended with a smile, I have practised no deception whatever. No, no, I see that now. She laughed without mirth, then drew a deep breath and rose. I am very tired, she said. He was on his feet in an instant, all solicitude. But she waved him wearily back. I think I will rest until it is time to go to the theatre. She moved towards the door, dragging her feet a little. He sprang to open it, and she passed out, without looking at him. Her so brief romantic dream was ended. The glorious world of fancy which in the last hour she had built with such elaborate detail, over which it should be her exalted destiny to rule, lay shattered about her feet. Its debris, so many stumbling blocks that prevented her from winning back to her erstwhile content in Scaramouche, as he really was. André Louis sat in the window embrasure, smoking, and looking idly out across the river. He was intrigued and meditative. He had shocked her. The fact was clear. Not so the reason. That he should confess himself nameless should not particularly injure him in the eyes of a girl reared amid the surroundings that had been Clemens. And yet that his confession had so injured him was fully apparent. There, still at his brooding, the returning Columbine discovered him a half-hour later. "'All alone, my prince,' was her laughing greeting, which suddenly threw light upon his mental darkness. Climen had been disappointed of hopes that the wild imagination of these players had suddenly erected upon the incident of his meeting with Aline. Poor child! He smiled whimsically at Columbine. I am likely to be so for some little time, said he, until it becomes a commonplace that I am not, after all, a prince. Not a prince? Oh, but a duke, then, at least a marquis. Not even a chevalier, unless it be of the order of fortune. I am just Scaramouche. My castles are all in Spain. Disappointment clouded the lively, good-natured face. And I had imagined you. I know, he interrupted. That is the mischief. He might have gauged the extent of that mischief by Clemens' conduct that evening, towards the gentlemen of fashion who clustered now in the green room between the acts, to pay their homage to the incomparable Amoureuse. Hitherto she had received them with a circumspection compelling respect. Tonight she was recklessly gay, impudent, almost wanton. He spoke of it gently to her as they walked home together, counselling more prudence in the future. "'We are not married yet,' she told him tartly. "'Wait until then before you criticise my conduct.' "'I trust that there will be no occasion then,' said he. "'You trust? Ah, yes, you are very trusting. Clemen. I have offended you. I am sorry. It is nothing, said she. You are what you are. Still was he not concerned. He perceived the source of her ill-humour, understood, whilst deploring it, and because he understood, forgave. He perceived also that her ill-humour was shared by her father, and by this he was frankly amused. Towards Monsieur Benet, a tolerant contempt was the only feeling that complete acquaintance could beget. As for the rest of the company, they were disposed to be very kindly towards Scaramouche. 
it was almost as if in reality he had fallen from the high estate to which their own imaginations had raised him, or possibly it was because they saw the effect which that fall from his temporary and fictitious elevation had produced upon Climen. Leandre alone made himself an exception. His habitual melancholy seemed to be dispelled at last, and his eyes gleamed now with malicious satisfaction when they rested upon Scaramouche, whom occasionally he continued to address with sly mockery as Mon Prince. On the morrow, André Louis saw but little of Climène. This was not in itself extraordinary for he was very hard at work again, with preparations now for Figaro Scaramouche, which was to be played on Saturday. Also, in addition to his manifold theatrical occupations, he now devoted an hour every morning to the study of fencing in an academy of arms. This was done not only to repair an omission in his education, but also, and chiefly, to give him added grace and poise upon the stage. He found his mind that morning distracted, by thoughts of both Climène and Aline. And oddly enough, it was Aline who provided the deeper perturbation. Climène's attitude he regarded as a passing phase which need not seriously engage him. But the thought of Aline's conduct towards him kept rankling and still more deeply rankled the thought of her possible betrothal to Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir. This it was that brought forcibly to his mind the self-imposed but by now half-forgotten mission that he had made his own. He had boasted that he would make the voice which Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir had sought to silence ring through the length and breadth of the land. And what had he done of all this that he had boasted? He had incited the mob of Rennes and the mob of Nantes in such terms as poor Philippe might have employed. And then, because of a hue and cry, he had fled like a cur, and taken shelter in the first kennel that offered, there to lie quiet and devote himself to other things, self-seeking things. What a fine contrast between the promise and the fulfillment. Thus André Louis to himself in his self-contempt. And whilst he trifled away his time and played Scaramouche, and centred all his hopes in presently becoming the rival of such men as Chenier and Mercier, Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir went his proud ways unchallenged and wrought his will. It was idle to tell himself that the seed he had sown was bearing fruit, that the demands he had voiced in Nantes for the third estate had been granted by M. Necker, thanks largely to the commotion which his anonymous speech had made. That was not his concern or his mission. It was no part of his concern to set about the regeneration of mankind or even the regeneration of the social structure of France. His concern was to see that Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir paid to the utmost liard for the brutal wrong he had done Philippe de Villemorin. And it did not increase his self-respect to find that the danger in which Aline stood of being married to the Marquis was the real spur to his rancor, and to remembrance of his vow. He was too unjustly, perhaps, disposed to dismiss as mere sophistries his own arguments that there was nothing he could do, that, in fact, he had but to show his head to find himself going to Rennes under arrest and making his final exit from the world stage by way of the gallows. It is impossible to read that part of his confessions without feeling a certain pity for him. You realize what must have been his state of mind. 
you realize what a prey he was to emotions so conflicting. And if you have the imagination that will enable you to put yourself in his place, you will also realize how impossible was any decision save the one to which he says he came, that he would move at the first moment that he perceived in what direction it would serve his real aims to move. It happened that the first person he saw when he took the stage on that Thursday evening was Aline. The second was the Marquis de la Tour d'Azir. They occupied a box on the right of and immediately above the stage. There were others with them, notably a thin, elderly, resplendent lady whom André Louis supposed to be Madame la Comtesse de Sautron. But at the time he had no eyes for any but those two, who of late had so haunted his thoughts. The sight of either of them would have been sufficiently disconcerting. The sight of both of them together very nearly made him forget the purpose for which he had come upon the stage. Then he pulled himself together and played. He played, he says, with an unusual nerve, and never in all that brief but eventful career of his was he more applauded. That was the evening's first shock. The next came after the second act. Entering the green room he found it more thronged than usual, and at the far end with Climen, over whom he was bending from his fine height, his eyes intent upon her face, what time his smiling lips moved in talk, Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir. He had her entirely to himself, a privilege none of the men of fashion who were in the habit of visiting the coulisses had yet enjoyed. Those lesser gentlemen had all withdrawn before the Marquis, as jackals withdraw before the lion. André stared a moment, stricken. Then, recovering from his surprise, he became critical in his study of the Marquis. He considered the beauty and grace and splendor of him, his courtly air, his complete and unshakable self-possession. But more than all, he considered the expression of the dark eyes that were devouring Clemen's lovely face, and his own lips tightened. Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir never heeded him or his stare, nor, had he done so, would he have known who it was that looked at him from behind the make-up of Scaramouche. Nor, again, had he known, would he have been in the least troubled or concerned. André Louis sat down apart, his mind in turmoil. Presently he found a mincing young gentleman addressing him, and made shift to answer as was expected. Clemen having been thus sequestered, and Columbine being already thickly besieged by gallants, the lesser visitors had to contend themselves with Madame and the male members of the troupe. Monsieur Benet, indeed, was the centre of a gay cluster that shook with laughter at his sallies. He seemed of a sudden to have emerged from the gloom of the last two days into a high good humour, and Scaramouche observed how persistently his eyes kept flickering upon his daughter and her splendid courtier. That night there were high words between André Louis and Climen. The high words proceeding from Climen. When André Louis again and more insistently enjoined prudence upon his betrothed, and begged her to beware how far she encouraged the advances of such a man as Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir, she became roundly abusive. She shocked and stunned him by her virulently shrewish tone. 
and her still more unexpected force of invective. He sought to reason with her, and finally she came to certain terms with him. If you have become betrothed to me simply to stand as an obstacle in my path, the sooner we make an end, the better. You do not love me, then, Clemen? Love has nothing to do with it. I'll not tolerate your insensate jealousy. A girl in the theatre must make it her business to accept homage from all. Agreed. And there is no harm, provided she gives nothing in exchange. White-faced, with flaming eyes, she turned on him at that. Now, what exactly do you mean? My meaning is clear. A girl in your position may receive all the homage that is offered, provided she receives it with a dignified aloofness implying clearly that she has no favors to bestow in return beyond the favor of her smile. If she is wise, she will see to it that the homage is always offered collectively by her admirers, and that no single one amongst them shall ever have the privilege of approaching her alone. If she is wise, she will give no encouragement, nourish no hopes that it may afterwards be beyond her power to deny realization. How you dare! I know my world, and I know Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir, he answered her. He is a man without charity, without humanity almost, a man who takes what he wants wherever he finds it, and whether it is given willingly or not, a man who reckons nothing of the misery he scatters on his self-indulgent way, a man whose only law is force. Ponder it, Clemen, and ask yourself if I do you less than honor in warning you. He went out on that, feeling a degradation in continuing the subject. The days that followed were unhappy days for him, and for at least one other. That other was Leandre, who was cast into the profoundest dejection by M. de la Tour d'Azir's assiduous attendance upon Climen. The Marquis was to be seen at every performance. A box was perpetually reserved for him, and invariably he came either alone, or else with his cousin, M. de Chabrienne. On Tuesday of the following week, André Louis went out alone early in the morning. He was out of temper, fretted by an overwhelming sense of humiliation, and he hoped to clear his mind by walking. In turning the corner of the Place de Buffet, he ran into a slightly built, sallow-complexioned gentleman, very neatly dressed in black, wearing a tie wig under a round hat. The man fell back at sight of him, leveling a spyglass, then hailed him in a voice that rang with amazement. Moreau! Where the devil have you been hiding yourself these months? It was... Le Chapelier, the lawyer, the leader of the literary chamber of Rennes. Behind the skirts of Thespis, said Scaramouche. I don't understand. I didn't intend that you should. What of yourself, Isaac, and what of the world which seems to have been standing still of late? Standing still? The Chapelier laughed. But where have you been, then, standing still? He pointed across the square to a café under the shadow of the gloomy prison. Let us go and drink a Bavarois. You are of all men the man we want, the man we have been seeking everywhere, and behold, you drop from the skies into my path. They crossed the square and entered the café. 
So you think the world has been standing still, Dieu de Dieu. I suppose you haven't heard of the royal order for the convocation of the States-General. Or the terms of them, that we are to have what we demanded, that you demanded for us here, in Nantes. You haven't heard that the order has gone forth for the primary elections, the elections of the electors. You haven't heard of the fresh uproar in Rennes last month. The order was that the three estates should sit together at the State General of the Bayage. But in the Bayage of Rennes, the nobles must ever be recalcitrant. They took up arms, actually, six hundred of them, with their valetai, headed by your old friend, Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir, and they were for slashing us, the members of the third estate, into ribbons, so as to put an end to our insolence. He laughed delicately. But by God we showed them that we too could take up arms. It was what you yourself advocated here in Nantes last November. We fought them, a pitched battle in the streets, under the leadership of your namesake, Moreau, the provost, and we so peppered them that they were glad to take shelter in the Cordelier convent. That is the end of their resistance to the royal authority and the people's will. He ran on at great speed, detailing the events that had taken place, and finally came to the matter which had, he announced, been causing him to hunt for André Louis until he had all but despaired of finding him. Nantes was sending fifty delegates to the Assembly of Rennes, which was to select the deputies to the Third Estate and edit their cahier of grievances. Rennes itself was being as fully represented, whilst such villages as Gavriac were sending two delegates for every two hundred hearths or less. Each of these three had clamoured that André Louis Moreau should be one of its delegates. Gavriac wanted him because he belonged to the village, and it was known there what sacrifices he had made in the popular cause. Wren wanted him because it had heard his spirited address on the day of the shooting of the students, and Nantes, to whom his identity was unknown, asked for him as the speaker who had addressed them under the name of Omnes Omnibus, and who had framed for them the memorial that was believed so largely to have influenced M. Necker in formulating the terms of the convocation. Since he could not be found, the delegations had been made up without him. But now it happened that one or two vacancies had occurred in the Nantes representation, and it was the business of filling these vacancies that had brought Le Chapelier to Nantes. André Louis firmly shook his head in answer to Le Chapelier's proposal. "'You refuse?' the other cried. "'Are you mad? Refuse, when you are demanded from so many sides!' Do you realize that it is more than probable you will be elected one of the deputies, that you will be sent to the States General at Versailles to represent us in this work of saving France? But André Louis, we know, was not concerned to save France. At the moment he was concerned to save two women, both of whom he loved though in vastly different ways, from a man he had vowed to ruin. He stood firm in his refusal, until Le Chapelier dejectedly abandoned the attempt to persuade him. "'It is odd,' said André Louis, "'that I should have been so deeply immersed in trifles as never to have perceived that Nantes is being politically active.' "'Active? My friend!' It is a seething cauldron of political emotions. It is kept quiet on the surface only by the persuasion that all goes well. At a hint to the contrary, it would boil over. Would it so? said Scaramouche thoughtfully. The knowledge may be useful. 
and then he changed the subject. You know that Le Tour d'Azir is here. In Nantes? He has courage if he shows himself. They are not a docile people, these Nantai, and they know his record and the part he played in the Rising at Rennes. I marvel that they haven't stoned him. But they will, sooner or later. It only needs that someone should suggest it. That is very likely, said André Louis, and smiled. He doesn't show himself much, not in the streets at least. So that he has not the courage you suppose, nor any kind of courage, as I told him once. He has only insolence. At parting, Le Chapelier again exhorted him to give thought to what he proposed. Send me word if you change your mind. I am lodged at the surf, and I shall be here until the day after tomorrow. If you have ambition, this is your moment. I have no ambition, I suppose, said André Louis, and went his way. That night at the theatre he had a mischievous impulse to test what Le Chapelier had told him of the state of public feeling in the city. They were playing The Terrible Captain, in the last act of which the empty cowardice of the bullying braggart Rodemont is revealed by Scaramouche. After the laughter which the exposure of the roaring captain invariably produced, it remained for Scaramouche contemptuously to dismiss him in a phrase that varied nightly, according to the inspiration of the moment. This time he chose to give his phrase a political complexion. Thus, O Thrasonical coward, is your emptiness exposed. Because of your long length and the great sword you carry and the angle at which you cock your hat, People have gone in fear of you, have believed in you, have imagined you to be as terrible and as formidable as you insolently make yourself appear. But at the first touch of true spirit you crumple up, you tremble, you whine pitifully, and the great sword remains in your scabbard. You remind me of the privileged orders when confronted by the third estate. It was audacious of him, and he was prepared for anything, a laugh, applause, indignation, or altogether. But he was not prepared for what came. And it came so suddenly and spontaneously from the groundlings and the body of those in the amphitheatre that he was almost scared by it as a boy may be scared who has held a match to a sun-scorched hayrick. It was a hurricane of furious applause. Men leapt to their feet, sprang up onto the benches, waving their hats in the air, deafening him with the terrific uproar of their acclamations. And it rolled on and on nor ceased until the curtain fell. Scaramouche stood meditatively smiling with tight lips. At the last moment he had caught a glimpse of Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir's face, thrust farther forward than usual from the shadows of his box, and it was a face set in anger, with eyes on fire. Mon Dieu! laughed Rodemont, recovering from the real scare that had succeeded his histrionic terror. But you have a great trick of tickling them in the right place, Scaramouche. Scaramouche looked up at him and smiled. It can be useful upon occasion, said he, and went off to his dressing-room to change. But a reprimand awaited him. He was delayed at the theatre by matters concerned with the scenery of the new piece they were to mount upon the morrow. By the time he was rid of the business the rest of the company had long since left. He called a chair, and had himself carried back to the inn in solitary state. 
it was one of many minor luxuries his comparatively affluent present circumstances permitted. Coming into that upstairs room that was common to all the troop, he found M. Benet talking loudly and vehemently. He had caught sounds of his voice whilst yet upon the stairs. As he entered, Benet broke off short and wheeled to face him. "'You are here at last!' It was so odd a greeting that André Louis did no more than look his mild surprise. "'I await your explanations of the disgraceful scene that you provoked to-night.' "'Disgraceful? Is it disgraceful that the public should applaud me?' "'The public? The rabble, you mean!' Do you want to deprive us of the patronage of all gentlefolk by vulgar appeals to the low passions of the mob? André Louis stepped past M. Benet and forward to the table. He shrugged contemptuously. The man offended him, after all. You exaggerate, grossly, as usual. I do not exaggerate and I am the master in my own theatre. This is the Binet troupe, and it shall be conducted in the Binet way. Who are the gentlefolk, the loss of whose patronage to the Fado will be so poignantly felt? asked André Louis. You imply that there are none? See how wrong you are. After the play tonight, Monsieur le Marquis de la Tour d'Azir came to me, and spoke to me in the severest terms about your scandalous outburst. I was forced to apologize, and— The more fool you, said André Louis. A man who respected himself would have shown that gentleman the door. Monsieur Benet's face began to empurple. You call yourself the head of the Binet troupe. You boast that you will be master in your own theatre. And you stand like a lackey to take the orders of the first insolent fellow who comes to your green room to tell you that he does not like a line spoken by one of your company. I say again, that had you really respected yourself you would have turned him out. There was a murmur of approval from several members of the company who, having heard the arrogant tone assumed by the Marquis, were filled with resentment against the slur cast upon them all. And I say further, André Louis went on, that a man who respects himself on quite other grounds would have been only too glad to have seized this pretext to show M. de la Tour d'Azir the door. What do you mean by that? There was a rumble of thunder in the question. André Louis' eyes swept round the company assembled at the supper table. Where is Clément? he asked sharply. Leandre leapt up to answer him, white in the face, tense and quivering with excitement. She left the theatre in the Marquis de la Tour d'Azir's carriage immediately after the performance. We heard him offer to drive her to this inn. André Louis glanced at the timepiece on the overmantel. He seemed unnaturally calm. That would be an hour ago, rather more. And she has not yet arrived? His eyes sought M. Benet's. M. Benet's eyes eluded his glance. Again it was Leandre who answered him. Not yet. Ah! André Louis sat down and poured himself wine. There was an oppressive silence in the room. Leandre watched him expectantly, Columbine commiseratingly. Even M. Benet appeared to be waiting for a cue from Scaramouche. But Scaramouche disappointed him. "'Have you left me anything to eat?' he asked. Platters were pushed towards him. He helped himself calmly to food and ate in silence, apparently with a good appetite. 
M. Benet sat down, poured himself wine, and drank. Presently he attempted to make conversation with one and another. He was answered curtly, in monosyllables. M. Benet did not appear to be in favour with his troop that night. At long length came a rumble of wheels below and a rattle of halting hooves. Then voices, the high, trilling laugh of Climen floating upwards. André Louis went on eating unconcernedly. What an actor! said Harlequin under his breath to Polichinelle, and Polichinelle nodded gloomily. She came in, a leading lady taking the stage, head high, chin thrust forward, eyes dancing with laughter. She expressed triumph and arrogance. Her cheeks were flushed, and there was some disorder in the mass of nut-brown hair that crowned her head. In her left hand she carried an enormous bouquet of white camellias. On its middle finger a diamond of great price drew almost at once by its effulgence the eyes of all. Her father sprang to meet her with an unusual display of paternal tenderness. "'At last, my child!' He conducted her to the table. She sank into a chair a little wearily, a little nervelessly, but the smile did not leave her face, not even when she glanced across at Scaramouche. It was only Leandre, observing her closely with hungry, scowling stare, who detected something as of fear in the hazel eyes momentarily seen between the fluttering of her lids. André Louis, however, still went on eating stolidly, without so much as a look in her direction. Gradually the company came to realize that just as surely as a scene was brooding, just so surely would there be no scene, as long as they remained. It was Polichinelle, at last, who gave the signal by rising and withdrawing, and within two minutes none remained in the room but M. Benet, his daughter, and André Louis. And then, at last, André Louis set down knife and fork, washed his throat with a draught of burgundy, and sat back in his chair to consider Clemen. I trust, said he, that you had a pleasant ride, mademoiselle. Most pleasant, monsieur. Impudently she strove to emulate his coolness, but did not completely succeed. And not unprofitable, if I may judge that jewel at this distance. It should be worth at least a couple of hundred louis and that is a formidable sum even to so wealthy a nobleman as Monsieur de la Tour d'Azur. Would it be impertinent in one who has had some notion of becoming your husband to ask you, mademoiselle, what you have given him in return? Monsieur Benet uttered a gross laugh, a queer mixture of cynicism and contempt. I have given him nothing, said Clemene indignantly. Ah, then the jewel is in the nature of a payment in advance. My God, man, you are not decent, Monsieur Benet protested. Decent. André Louis's smoldering eyes turned to discharge upon Monsieur Benet such a fulmination of contempt that the old scoundrel shifted uncomfortably in his chair. Did you mention decency, Benet? Almost you make me lose my temper, which is a thing that I detest above all others. Slowly his gaze returned to Clemen, who
who sat with elbows on the table, her chin cupped in her palms, regarding him with something between scorn and defiance. Mademoiselle, he said slowly, I desire you purely in your own interests to consider whither you are going. I am well able to consider it for myself, and to decide without advice from you, monsieur." "'And now you've got your answer,' chuckled Benet. "'I hope you like it.' André-Louis had paled a little. There was incredulity in his great sombre eyes as they continued steadily to regard her. Of Monsieur Benet he took no notice. Surely, mademoiselle, you cannot mean that willingly, with open eyes and full understanding of what you do, you would exchange an honorable wifehood for, for the thing that such men as Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir may have in store for you. Monsieur Benet made a wide gesture and swung to his daughter. You hear him? The mealy-mouthed prude! Perhaps you'll believe at last that marriage with him would be the ruin of you. He would always be there, the inconvenient husband, to mar your every chance, my girl. She tossed her lovely head in agreement with her father. I begin to find him tiresome with his silly jealousies, she confessed. As a husband, I am afraid he would be impossible. André-Louis felt a constriction of the heart. But, always the actor, he showed nothing of it. He laughed a little, not very pleasantly, and rose. I bow to your choice, mademoiselle. I pray that you may not regret it. Regret it? cried Monsieur Benet. He was laughing, relieved to see his daughter at last rid of this suitor of whom he had never approved, if we accept those few hours when he really believed him to be an eccentric of distinction. And what shall she regret? That she accepted the protection of a nobleman so powerful and wealthy that is a mere trinket he gives her a jewel worth as much as an actress earns in a year at the Comédie Française. He got up and advanced towards André-Louis. His mood became conciliatory. Come, come, my friend. No rancor now. What the devil? You wouldn't stand in a girl's way? You can't really blame her for making this choice. Have you thought what it means to her? Have you thought that under the protection of such a gentleman there are no heights which she may not reach? Don't you see the wonderful luck of it? Surely if you're fond of her, particularly being of a jealous temperament, you wouldn't wish it otherwise. André-Louis looked at him in silence for a long moment. Then he laughed again. Oh, you are fantastic, he said. You are not real. He turned on his heel and strode to the door. The action, and more the contempt of his look, laugh, and words, stung M. Benet to passion, drove out the conciliatoriness of his mood. Fantastic, are we? he cried, turning to follow the departing Scaramouche with his little eyes that now were inexpressibly evil. Fantastic that we should prefer the powerful protection of this great nobleman to marriage with beggarly, nameless bastard. Oh, we are fantastic. André Louis turned his hand upon the door-handle. No, he said. I was mistaken. You are not fantastic. You are just vile. Both of you. 
and he went out. End of Book Two, Chapter Nine As read by Gordon Mackenzie January 2007This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading is by Gordon Mackenzie. Scaramouche, A Romance of the French Revolution by Raphael Sabatini Book Two, Chapter Ten Contrition Mademoiselle de Kercadio walked with her aunt in the bright morning sunshine of a Sunday in March, on the broad terrace of the Chateau de Sautron. For one of her natural sweetness of disposition, she had been oddly irritable of late, manifesting signs of a cynical worldliness, which convinced Madame de Sautron more than ever that her brother Quintin had scandalously conducted the child's education. She appeared to be instructed in all the things of which a girl is better ignorant, and ignorant of all the things that a girl should know. That, at least, was the point of view of Madame de Sautron. "'Tell me, madame,' quoth Aline, "'are all men beasts?' Unlike her brother, Madame la Comtesse was tall and majestically built. In the days before her marriage with Monsieur de Sautron, ill-natured folk described her as the only man in the family. She looked down now from her noble height upon her little niece with startled eyes. "'Really, Aline, you have a trick of asking the most disconcerting and improper questions.' "'Perhaps it is because I find life disconcerting and improper.' Life? A young girl should not discuss life. Why not? Since I am alive, you do not suggest that it is an impropriety to be alive. It is an impropriety for a young, unmarried girl to seek to know too much about life. As for your absurd question about men, when I remind you that man is the noblest work of God, perhaps you will consider yourself answered. Madame de Sautron did not invite a pursuance of the subject, but Mademoiselle de Kercadio's outrageous rearing had made her headstrong. That being so, said she, will you tell me why they find such an overwhelming attraction in the immodest of our sex. Madame stood still and raised shocked hands. Then she looked down her handsome, high-bridged nose. Sometimes, often, in fact, my dear Aline, you pass all understanding. I shall write Quintin that the sooner you are married, the better it will be for all. "'Uncle Quintin has left that matter to my own deciding,' Aline reminded her. "'That,' said the madam with complete conviction, "'is the last and most outrageous of his errors. "'Who ever heard of a girl being left to decide the matter of her own marriage? "'It is indelicate almost to expose her to thoughts of such things.' Madame de Sautron shuddered. Quintin is a boor. His conduct is unheard of. That Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir should parade himself before you so that you may make up your mind whether he is the proper man for you. Again she shuddered. It is of a grossness of... of prurience almost. Mon Dieu! When I married your uncle, 
All this was arranged between our parents. I first saw him when he came to sign the contract. I should have died of shame had it been otherwise. And that is how these affairs should be conducted. You are no doubt right, madame. But since that is not how my own case is being conducted, you will forgive me if I deal with it apart from others. M. de la Tour d'Azir desires to marry me. He has been permitted to pay his court. I should be glad to have him informed that he may cease to do so. Madame de Sautron stood still, petrified by amazement. Her long face turned white. She seemed to breathe with difficulty. "'But... but... what are you saying?' she gasped. Quietly, Aline repeated her statement. "'But this is outrageous. You cannot be permitted to play fast and loose with a gentleman of Monsieur le Marquis's quality. Why, it is little more than a week since you permitted him to be informed that you would become his wife.' "'I did so in a moment of rashness. Since then Monsieur le Marquis's own conduct has convinced me of my error.' "'But, mon Dieu!' cried the countess. "'Are you blind to the great honour that is being paid you? Monsieur le Marquis will make you the first lady in Brittany. Yet little fool that you are, and greater fool that Quintin is, you trifle with this extraordinary good fortune. Let me warn you,' she raised an admonitory forefinger, "'if you continue in this stupid humour. Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir may definitely withdraw his offer, and depart in justified mortification. That, madam, as I am endeavouring to convey to you, is what I most desire. Oh, you are mad! It may be, madam, that I am sane, in preferring to be guided by my instincts. It may be even that I am justified in resenting that the man who aspires to become my husband should at the same time be paying such assiduous homage to a wretched theatre girl at the Fado. Aline! Is it not true? Or perhaps you do not find it strange that Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir should so conduct himself at such a time? Aline! You are so extraordinary a mixture. At moments you shock me by the indecency of your expressions. At others you amaze me by the excess of your prudery. You have been brought up like a little bourgeoise, I think. Yes, that is it, a little bourgeoise. Quintin was always something of a shopkeeper at heart. I was asking your opinion on the conduct of Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir, madame not my own. But it is an indelicacy in you to observe such things. You should be ignorant of them, and I can't think who is so, so unfeeling as to inform you. But since you are informed, at least you should be modestly blind to things that take place outside the orbit of a properly conducted damsel. Will they still be outside my orbit when I am married? If you are wise, you should remain without knowledge of them. It, it deflowers your innocence. I would not for the world that Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir should know you so extraordinarily instructed. Had you been properly reared in a convent, this would never have happened to you. But you do not answer me, madam cried Aline in despair. It is not my chastity that is in question, but that of Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir. Chastity! Madame's lips trembled with horror. Horror overspread her face. Where ever did you learn that dreadful, that so improper word? And then Madame de Sautron did violence to her feelings. She realized 
that here great calm and prudence were required. "'My child, since you know so much that you ought not to know, there can be no harm in my adding that a gentleman must have these little distractions. But why, madame? Why is it so? Ah, oh, mon Dieu, you are asking me riddles of nature. It is so because it is so. Because men are like that. Because men are beasts, you mean, which is what I began by asking you. You are incorrigibly stupid, Aline. You mean that I do not see things as you do, madame. I am not over-expectant as you appear to think. Yet surely I have the right to wish that whilst Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir is wooing me, he shall not be wooing at the same time a drab of the theatre. I feel in this there is a subtle association of myself with that unspeakable creature which soils and insults me. The Marquis is a dullard whose wooing takes the form at best of stilted compliments, stupid and unoriginal. They gain nothing when they fall from lips still warm from the contamination of that woman's kisses. So utterly scandalized was Madame that for a moment she remained speechless. Then, Mon Dieu! she exclaimed. I should never have suspected you of so in delicate an imagination. I cannot help it, madame. Each time his lips touch my fingers I find myself thinking of the last object that they touched. I at once retire to wash my hands. Next time, madame, unless you are good enough to convey my message to him I shall call for water and wash them in his presence. But what am I to tell him? How, in what words, can I convey such a message?" Madame was aghast. Be frank with him, Madame. It is easiest in the end. Tell him that, however impure may have been his life in the past, however impure he intend that it shall be in the future, he must at least study purity whilst approaching with a view to marriage a virgin who is herself pure and without stain. Madame recoiled and put her hands to her ears, horror stamped on her handsome face, her massive bosom heaved. Oh, how can you? she panted. How can you use such terrible expressions? Where Ever have you learnt them? In church, said Aline. Ah, but in church many things are said that, that one would not dream of saying in the world. My dear child, how could I possibly say such things to Monsieur le Marquis? How could I possibly? Shall I say it? Aline! Well, there it is, said Aline. Something must be done to shelter me from insult. I am utterly disgusted with Monsieur le Marquis, a disgusting man. And however fine a thing it may be to become Marquise de la Tour d'Azir, why, frankly, I'd sooner marry a cobbler who practiced decency. Such was her vehemence and obvious determination that Madame de Sautron fetched herself out of her despair to attempt persuasion. Aline was her niece, and such a marriage in the family would be to the credit of the whole of it. At all costs, nothing must frustrate it. "'Listen, my dear,' she said. "'Let us reason. Monsieur le Marquis is away and will not be back until tomorrow.' true, and I know where he has gone, or at least whom he has gone with. Mon Dieu, 
and the drab has a father, and a lout of a fellow who intends to make her his wife, and neither of them chooses to do anything. I suppose they agree with you, madame, that a great gentleman must have his little distractions. Her contempt was as scorching as a thing of fire. However, madame, you were about to say that on the day after to-morrow you are returning to Gavriac. Monsieur de la Tour d'Azir will most likely follow at his leisure. You mean when his dirty candle is burnt out. Call it what you will. Madame, you see, despaired by now of controlling the impropriety of her niece's expressions. At Gavriac there will be no Mademoiselle Binet. This thing will be in the past. It is unfortunate that he should have met her at such a moment. The chit is very attractive, after all. You cannot deny that, and you must make allowances. Monsieur le Marquis formally proposed to me a week ago, partly to satisfy the wishes of the family, and partly she broke off, hesitating a moment, to resume on a note of dull pain, partly because it does not seem greatly to matter whom I marry, I gave him my consent. That consent for the reasons I have given you, madame, I desire now definitely to withdraw. Madame fell into agitation of the wildest. Aline, I should never forgive you. Your uncle Quintin would be in despair. You do not know what you are saying, what a wonderful thing you are refusing. Have you no sense of your position, of the station into which you were born? If I had not, madame, I should have made an end long since. If I have tolerated this suit for a single moment, it is because I realize the importance of a suitable marriage in the worldly sense. But I ask of marriage something more, and Uncle Quinton has placed the decision in my hands. God forgive him, said Madame, and then she hurried on. Leave this to me now, Aline. Be guided by me. Oh, be guided by me. Her tone was beseeching. I will take counsel with your Uncle Charles. But do not definitely decide until this unfortunate affair has blown over. Charles will know how to arrange it. Monsieur le Marquis shall do penance, child, since your tyranny demands it but not in sackcloth and ashes. You'll not ask so much." Aline shrugged. "'I ask nothing at all,' she said, which was neither assent nor dissent. So Madame de Sautron interviewed her husband, a slight middle-aged man, very aristocratic in appearance, and gifted with a certain shrewd sense. She took with him precisely the tone that Aline had taken with herself, and which in Aline she had found so disconcertingly indelicate. She even borrowed several of Aline's phrases. The result was that on the Monday afternoon, when at last M. de la Tour d'Azir's returning Berlin drove up to the chateau, he was met by M. le Comte de Sautron, who desired a word with him even before he changed. Je vais, you're a fool, was the excellent opening made by Monsieur le Comte. Charles, you give me no news, answered Monsieur le Marquis. Of what particular folly do you take the trouble to complain? He flung himself wearily upon a sofa, and his long, graceful body sprawling there, he looked up at his friend with a tired smile on that nobly handsome pale face that seemed to defy the onslaught of age. 
of your last, this Binet girl. That? Pooh! An incident. Hardly a folly. A folly at such a time, so Tron insisted. The Marquis looked a question. The Count answered it. Aline, said he, pregnantly. She knows. How she knows, I can't tell you. But she knows, and she is deeply offended. The smile perished on the Marquis's face. He gathered himself up. Offended, said he, and his voice was anxious. But yes, you know what she is. You know the ideal she has formed. It wounds her that at such a time, whilst you are here for the purpose of wooing her, you should at the same time be pursuing this affair with that chit of a Binet girl. How do you know? asked La Tour d'Azur. She has confided in her aunt, and the poor child seems to have some reason. She says that she will not tolerate that you should come to kiss her hand with lips that are still contaminated from— Oh, you understand. You appreciate the impression of such a thing upon a pure, sensitive girl such as Aline. She said, I had better tell you that the next time you kiss her hand she will call for water and wash it in your presence. The Marquis's face flamed scarlet. He rose. Knowing his violent, intolerant spirit, Monsieur de Sautron was prepared for an outburst. But no outburst came. The Marquis turned away from him, and paced slowly to the window, his head bowed, his hands behind his back. Halted there, he spoke without turning. His voice was at once scornful and wistful. You are right, Charles. I am a fool, a wicked fool. I have just enough sense left to perceive it. It is the way I have lived, I suppose. I have never known the need to deny myself anything I wanted. Then suddenly he swung around, and the outburst came. But my God! I want Aline, as I have never wanted anything yet. I think I should kill myself in rage if through my folly I should have lost her. He struck his brow with his hand. I am a beast, he said. I should have known that if that sweet saint got word of these petty devilries of mine, she would despise me. And I tell you, Charles, I'd go through fire to gain her respect. I hope it is regained on easier terms, said Charles and then to ease the situation, which began to irk him by its solemnity, he made a feeble joke. It is merely asked of you that you refrain from going through certain fires that are not accounted by Mademoiselle of too purifying a nature. As to that Benet girl, it is finished. Finished, said the Marquis. I congratulate you. When did you make that decision? This moment. I would to God I had made it twenty-four hours ago. As it is, he shrugged. Why, twenty-four hours of her have been enough for me as they would have been for any man. A mercenary, self-seeking little baggage with the soul of a trull. Bah! He shuddered in disgust of himself and her. "'Ah, that makes it easier for you,' said Monsieur de Sautron cynically. "'Don't say it, Charles. It is not so. Had you been less of a fool, you would have warned me sooner. I may prove to have warned you soon enough if you'll profit by the warning.' 
There is no penance that I will not do. I will prostrate myself at her feet. I will abase myself before her. I will make confession in the proper spirit of contrition and heaven helping me. I'll keep to my purpose of amendment for her sweet sake." He was tragically in earnest. To M. de Sautron, who had never seen him other than self-contained, supercilious, and mocking, this was an amazing revelation. He shrank from it almost. It gave him the feeling of prying, of peeping through a keyhole. He slapped his friend's shoulder. My dear Gervais, here is a magnificently romantic mood. Enough said. Keep to it, and I promise you that all will presently be well. I will be your ambassador, and you shall have no cause to complain. But may I not go to her myself? If you are wise, you will at once efface yourself. Write to her, if you will. Make your act of contrition by letter. I will explain why you have gone without seeing her. I will tell her that you did so upon my advice, and I will do it tactfully. I am a good diplomat, Gervais. Trust me." M. le Marquis raised his head, and showed a face that pain was searing. He held out his hand. "'Very well, Charles. Serve me in this, and count me your friend in all things." End of Book Two, Chapter Ten